Okay, we are rolling. Will sergeants please start their recordings? According to the computer, all set. Thank you. According to the cloud, all set. Thank you. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council FY22 preliminary budget hearing for the Committee on Public Safety. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification pur purposes? Once again, all panelists, please turn on their video for verification purposes. To minimize disruptions, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you'd like to submit testimony, please send via email to testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation, Chair Adams. We are ready to begin. Good morning. Thank you all for being here today. I'm Councilmember Adrian Adams, Chair of the Committee on Public Safety. Welcome to day one of the public safety hearing to discuss the city's police reform and reinvention collaborative draft plan and the preliminary budgets for the NYPD, CCRB, Mock J, and the Legal Aid Society. We'll continue with day two of the public safety budget hearing where we will hear from the DAs next Monday, March 22nd at 12 p.m. I must say we have a full agenda, so I wanna stop, start off by saying in advance that I really appreciate everyone's patience. I will try to be brief so we can get to testimony and questions. As noted, we are here today to talk about the city's police reform and reinvention collaborative draft plan and the preliminary budgets for the NYPD, CCRB, Mock J, and Legal Aid. This is not typical for the council. When it's budget season, we like to focus on just the budget, but we were really left with no choice here. If the council doesn't vote on a policing reform plan by April 1st, we stand to lose substantial amounts of state and federal pass-through aid. So there are massive budget implications if we don't get this done not just for the police, but for the entire city of New York. It didn't have to be this way though. We've been calling on the city to show us real progress for months now. The city has known about this deadline since June, but for months we've heard nothing. Then promises that something was coming soon, but we didn't actually see a first draft until March 5th. The latest part was just released on Friday. That makes it almost impossible for my council colleagues and the public to have any real time to prepare for today's hearing, but we're gonna do our best. We were supposed to get a draft plan in December. When that didn't happen, we held a hearing. We pushed the administration to move more quickly and to have a truly transparent collaborative process. Well, if you're following along, you know that it didn't happen. This plan feels like you're mailing it in, like you rushed to get it in under the gun without really taking any necessary time to give the proposals any real weight at all. Most of the plan is a list of vague goals that fr frankly has been talked about for years. The fact that we need to say it again shows us how extremely difficult it is to hold the NYPD accountable. I'm tired of plans that lack details, timeliness, oversight, and enforcement. And I will not, I repeat, I will not support a plan that's all talk. This was an incredible opportunity to bring real change to policing. And it's been a long time coming. Many of our communities have faced decades of disinvestment and discrimination. The police were a major part of that. For too many New Yorkers, the police were the face of injustice. While their budget rose year after year, we watched many parts of our social safety net get cut again and again. So we need to set things right. Changing police protocols will only get us so far if we don't adequately fund anti-poverty efforts and reduce the NYPD's footprint. I appreciate the new recommendations that focus on the decriminalization of poverty Ending the cycle of poverty might be the single most important thing we can do 
to make New York City a more fair place to live. To be perfectly honest with you, I was not that impressed with the first draft released by the administration. I did not see the voice of, of impacted communities. I did not see a commitment to tackle the underlying issues that led to New York City having the largest police force in the entire country. What I did see though, was a large focus on the police force itself, rather than a system that leaves too many men who live in black and brown communities feeling hopeless. That leaves women in abusive situations with few places to turn. And that leaves communities feeling divided because they're trying to confront dual crises, the effects of decades of over-policing and a historic increase in shootings. No one should ever be forced to choose between safety and respect. We didn't get to this place overnight. Many of our communities have faced decades of disinvestment, of discrimination, without so much as a second glance. The police were a major part of that. For far too many New Yorkers, they were the face of injustice. The task here isn't just to reform the police. It's to address racial bias and disproportionate policing, and to address the needs of our vulnerable communities in need. So I am more hopeful after seeing this new draft, the draft that actually should have been presented first. I wanna thank the, tr the three advisors to the mayor that pushed for many of these updates, Jennifer Jones Austin, Arva Rice, and Wes Moore. I have the utmost respect for their work. And I know that they have put a tremendous amount of time and effort into this work. I don't want to see that good work go to waste. To really move the needle here, we need to put in resources. I cannot support a plan that's all talk. I want to see communities that have suffered from systemic racism and police brutality actually lifted up. I want budget justice in New York City, but this isn't just about money. I want to see that this administration is going to put in the work and give us a real path forward so we actually achieve something. I want to hear what metrics we'll use to assess the efficacy of each of these proposals. How will we know that they're working? I want to hear timelines and implementation. I want to know how we're going to incorporate impacted communities in the planning stages. Because if we don't properly follow through here, this plan isn't worth the paper it's written on. So again, I wanna thank everyone who is here today to offer testimony on these imperative goals. Now I turn it back into the hand of our moderator. Thank you, Chair. I'm Daniel Addis, Counsel of the Public Safety Committee at the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. Members of the administration who are testifying will not be muted during the Q&A portion of the administration testimony. Uh, I will be, uh, with one exception, the, the uh, individuals in the PC conference room will all be unmuted as well as the first deputy mayor. We will mute the remainder of uh, the administration witnesses. I'll ask uh, the police commissioner if you could indicate when you um, pass the mic to one of your colleagues, if you could indicate their names so that we can unmute them. Uh, this hearing will be divided into five sections. First, we will hear from the NYPD and the mayor's office, followed by the CCRB at noon, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice at 1230, uh, Legal Aid and indig Indigent Defense at one o'clock, and members of the public at two o'clock. The first panelist to, be give, to give testimony will be the first Deputy Mayor and representatives of the New York City Police Department. I will call on you shortly for the oath, then again when it is time to begin your testimony. Uh, during the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer questions. All hearing participants should uh, submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov if you not, have not already done so. The deadline for written testimony is 72 hours after the hearing. The committee chair has also asked me to note for the public that we will be reviewing written testimony, which is also part of the record in case you need to leave before you are called upon to testify. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath. 
uh, to all members of the administration who will be offering testimony or will be available uh, for questions, please raise your right hands. I will begin with the first deputy mayor, then turn to the PC conference room, and then turn to the remainder of the, the uh, NYPD officials. Um, I will read the oath and call on, on each of you for a response. Uh, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Uh, first deputy mayor, Dean Fulahan. Um, can we unmute uh, the first deputy mayor? Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Thank you. Yes, and I do. Thank you. And we'll turn to uh, the PC conference room. Uh, Commissioner Dermot Shea. I believe we need to. There we I go. I do. Yes. Thank you. Uh, first deputy commissioner, Benjamin Tucker. I do. Uh, Deputy Commissioner for Management and Budget, Christine Ryan. Thank you. Chief of Department, Rodney Harrison. I do. Deputy Commissioner for Strategic Initiatives, Danielle Pemberton. Thank you. Assistant Deputy Commissioner for Legal Matters, Oleg Chernovsky. I do. Assistant Chief, Matthew Pontillo. Deputy Commissioner of Legal Matters, Ernie Hart. Thank you. Okay, and Chief of Patrol, uh, Juanita Holmes. I do. Uh, Elizabeth Dates, Executive Director of Strategic Initiatives. I do. Kim Royster, Chief of Transportation. I do. David Barrere, Chief of Housing. I do. Tanya Meisenholder, Deputy Commissioner of Equity and Inclusion. I do. Jeffrey Madry, Chief of Community Affairs. I do. Chauncey Parker, Deputy Commissioner of Community Partnerships. I do. Michael LePetri, Chief of Crime Control Strategies. I do. Kathleen O'Reilly, Chief of Transit. I do. Teresa Tobin, Chief of Inter Interagency Operations. I do. Martin Morales, Chief of Personnel. Did you hear me? I do. John Miller, Deputy Commissioner of Public Information and Intelligence and Counterterrorism. Deputy Commissioner Miller? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, Kenneth Corey, Chief of Training. I do. Raymond Spinella, Chief of Operations. I do. Amy Litwin, uh, Deputy Commissioner, Department Advocate. I do. Matthew Frazier, Deputy Commissioner of Information Technology.
Do we have Deputy Commissioner Frazier? Okay, if we have to turn to Deputy Commissioner Frazier, we'll, we'll um, swear him in when we um, have him back. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, now I will invite First Deputy Mayor Dean Fulahan to begin your testimony. Try again, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Adams, members of the Public Safety Committee and other council members joining us this morning. Um, I'm joined by Police Commissioner Dermot Shea and the MIPD leadership, as you've just heard. Uh, as well, uh, joining me here, are Chelsea Davis, uh, the Chief Strategy Officer for my office and Marco Soler, Acting Director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me today to discuss this critical topic. Uh, I am here to speak about the New York City Police Reform and Reinvention Collaborative Draft Plan. The de Blasio administration made the plan available for public review in two parts after really months of engagement. It was, the first part was released on March 5th and March 12th was the second. The plan was created with input of New Yorkers, a long list, and I do think it's important that we go through that list. CBOs, advocates, clergy, racial justice advocates, cure violence providers, youth groups, youth voices, ethnic and religious organizations, business improvement districts, small business owners, nonprofits, LGBT, QIA plus community leaders, the deaf and hard of hearing community, people with disabilities, tenants associations, shelter-based and affordable housing communities and providers, people involved in the justice system, crime victims, policy experts, prosecutors, oversight bodies, elected officials, academic leaders, and many more. Most important, we heard from New Yorkers from across the city but especially from communities that have suffered the most from our history of racialized policing. I want to take this opportunity to thank all New Yorkers and communities across the city who bravely came forward to give honest and often painful testimony. And I want to join our chair in thanking our community co-sponsors, Jennifer Jones Austin, President and CEO of the Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies. Wes Moore, CEO of Robinhood, and Arvo Rice, President and CEO of New York's Urban League. These three New Yorkers and their staffs provided critical support during the creation of this draft plan. They offered powerful insight that informed every part of the plan. The result is much stronger because of it. I am grateful for their time, their effort, and their insight. And I believe they have submitted uh, a joint statement and testimony into the record in support of the plan this morning. I want to thank the members of the City Council for your part in bringing this process to where it is today. For the thoughtful discussions we've had and for the work we will do together moving forward. I want to thank the NYPD Commissioner, Dermot Shea, and the entire NYPD leadership for their extensive work during this process. Finally, I'd like to thank my staff for constantly moving us forward. Before I get into the details of the plan, I want to say this is, this is a beginning. There is no plan, no single administration that can fully repair the damage caused by over. We cannot erase the trauma experienced by victims of police violence and those who love them. We cannot bring back Anthony Baez or Amadou Diallo. We cannot bring back Usman Zongo or Sean Bell. We cannot bring back Romarley Graham or Patrick Dorismond. We cannot bring back Eric Gardner and too many more. 
We cannot bring back George Floyd or Breonna Taylor. We can acknowledge our past and take a new path to combat this legacy of injustice. Together, the two parts of our New York City Police Reform and Reinvention Collaborative Plan offer a way forward. Our goal is clear. We envision an NYPD that is a national example of fair, just, transparent, and accountable policing. Regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, religion, immigration, or socioeconomic status. Our plan includes more than 60 concrete recommendations to help us achieve our vision. These recommendations are built on the feedback and lived experience of New Yorkers from all walks of life. Now, I would like to briefly walk you through the five main goals of the plan. I want to stress these weren't created in a vacuum. They are interconnected pieces of an overall path forward. First, recognition and continued examination of the historical and modern day racializing policing of New York City. Two, transparent, transparency and accountability to the people of New York City. Three, community representation and partnership. Four, the decriminalization of poverty. And five, a diverse, resilient and supported NYPD. Now I want to offer a bit more detail to how we achieve these goals. Recognition and continual examination of historical and modern day racialized policing in New York City. To address the harm done by racialized policing, we must first publicly acknowledge the department's troubled history and its current challenges. Then we must urgently move forward with the reform detailed in these reports. The city commits to acknowledging, addressing and repairing past and present injustices and the trauma caused by racialized policing. The NYPD will participate in a comprehensive and independent review to identify persistent structures of racism. The NYPD will require supervisors to monitor officers' activity for signs of bias-based policing and take immediate measures. The city will eliminate The city will eliminate the use of unnecessary force by changing culture adding racial bias training for NYPD leadership and in instituting restorative justice. We will work in partnership with affected communities to repair relationships and build trust. We will include neighborhood coordination officers in the process and require that all officers have sufficient training to be active bystanders and prevent this time. I'm, I'm sorry, um, first deputy, uh, Lynn, I, we cannot hear you.
Folks, we apologize for the delay. We are experiencing some uh, audio issues with the first deputy mayor. If you could just give us a moment. Thank you. Mr. First Deputy Mayor, we still can't hear you. I think um, Commissioner Shea, if you're able to begin your testimony, perhaps we can have you read your statement while um, we sort out the technical issues on the other end. There you go. Thank you so much. So I'd like to start, good morning, everyone. Before I begin my prepared testimony, I'd like to echo Dean Foulihan's thanks to Wes, Arva, and Jennifer for their, their support of the process and for their willingness to take us at our word and work with us over the last several months. They've been invaluable partners and we continue to uh, look forward to their continued work with us as we tackle these difficult issues. So thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning before the Committee on Public Safety and to discuss the mayor's preliminary budget for the 2022 fiscal year. This, in my opinion, is a historic moment in time, unprecedented in fact. While the NYPD continues to evolve and carry out reforms started seven years ago, we are coming off a recent citywide listening tour, more than 100 meetings with our community partners, during which we heard directly from the people we serve. They spoke their truth, and we absorbed a broad range of criticism, praise, and ideas for the future. We heard about accountability, and frankly, lack thereof, transparency, diversity, trust, fairness, and the basic respect shown by police officers, often lacking in some communities. We heard about some, how some officers approach people on the street and how New Yorkers want far less of the aggressive policing they experienced in days gone by, sometimes in the not too distant past. These lengthy discussions have proven invaluable to us because we believe that if we are not evolving, we are simply not moving forward. And all of it factored into the city's reform plan, which was released last week by the mayor's office. Simultaneously, we were taking large steps, a discipline matrix, our memorandum of understanding with the Civilian Complaint Review Board, a discipline database that went live online within a couple of days of a court decision that allowed us to legally release the information. We made great strides in the diverse composition of our department, particularly at the executive level. We also trained tens of thousands of officers in implicit bias, the escalation techniques, and much more. Around the five boroughs, what we also heard was that New Yorkers are deeply concerned about increasing violence. They spoke of hope, but also expressed anxiety about their own safety and that of their loved ones and neighbors. We heard moving stories from parents who lost their children to gun violence on our streets. Heartbreaking stories, unconscionable. Advocates talked of concerns about over-policing in some communities, while many residents of those same communities sometimes voiced concerns about under-policing. We heard it all. The bottom line, people want to be safe and they want to feel safe, but they expect and demand and deserve to be treated with dignity and respect in every encounter with their police. I understand all these concerns. We engage with our community partners to walk with us on this path to change because we realize it's not just enough to consider how we see ourselves, but also how others see us. What we found is that New Yorkers want to help their police find a way forward together to make tomorrow a better time and place for all of us. And I would offer that the future of New York City is already here. Although it is not a light switch that can simply be flipped, the efforts to affect change are well underway. 
I recently referenced as much at an event hosted by the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce and the City College of New York. I told them that we at the NYPD recognize and apologize for past wrongs committed by us or our law enforcement predecessors here in New York City. And that we are pushing ahead, arms linked with our partners to foster a fairer and more just tomorrow. As I told that largely virtual audience last month, we have inherited the burden of our collective history. And our challenge now is to ensure that we will not participate in or tolerate any further inequality or injustice. Turning to the preliminary budget and its impact on the NYPD in the coming year, the NYPD's fiscal year 2022 expense budget is $5.4 billion, the vast majority of which, 93%, is allocated for personnel costs. The remaining 7% is dedicated to non-personnel costs, including technology that provides officers with immediate access to critical safety equipment, tools, and applications. As you know, last year's adopted budget saw significant operating reductions of 417 million, including a recruit class cancellation that diminished our uniform workforce by over a thousand officers, a uniform overtime decrease, a civilian overtime decrease, the cutting of 100 civilian positions, a delay in police cadet hiring, and other non-personnel reductions. The NYPD's capital budget was also reduced by 537 million. Eliminated was funding for a new 116th precinct and its station house and construction of a much needed consolidated property clerks warehouse that would improve evidence and property storage. Indeed, we are here today to talk about the budget, but we do not have three months until the end of June to make these important, tough decisions. We have to make these decisions today, now, so that we do not see another crime victim added to a horrific tally. The NYPD is a police department watching its manpower reduce for the first time in decades. Yes, overall crime is down, but we are seeing violent crime rising to levels not seen in many, many years. In 2020, murders were up by 40%. Shootings were up by nearly 100%. Numbers are cold calculations, but each number represents a victim and victims have names. And we remember when the gun violence began to climb last summer. A one-year-old, Devel Gardner Jr., shot dead in a playground before his family could ever know his potential. In the Bronx, Brandon Henrik's family knew all about his potential by the time he was 17 years old, when he was cut down. He had a college basketball scholarship. He had a bright future ahead. In October, Bertha Aragia was with her two children when she heard a noise and went to her third floor window in Queens. She was shot in the head and died. On Halloween, an eight-year-old girl in a costume shot while walking with her father. Thank God she lived. And just this past week, last Friday, Gedalia Valinas killed by a stray bullet during gunfire exchange between gang members. She was out to get milk for her two children, 37 years of age. Brian Sainan was shot in a drive-by shooting on Saturday, hours later in Brooklyn. Two others were wounded, but Brian died. He was 17 years of age. And that same morning, five other people were shot in a crowded nightclub. And that was all just this weekend. Almost none of those I mentioned was the intended victim of gunfire. They were people caught in the crossfire. And equally startling is that 97% of our shooting victims are people of color, which is why we heard in communities of color asking for more police and more visibility. It is clear that opportunity and equality are tied directly to safe streets and safe neighborhoods. In fact, everything we strive for as a society is built upon a foundation of public safety. It is imperative that parents feel comfortable, whether they're shopping down the block 
or bringing their children to the local playground. Anything less is wholly unacceptable. Some people said cynically that crime was going up because police were slowing down in the face of relentless criticism. We heard that last year, that it was a morale problem. Well, that does not square against the fact that New York City police officers made more gun arrests in the first two months of this year than they did during the same period in any of the last 25 years. Meanwhile, 41 of our officers were shot at last year. Seven of them were hit, struck and injured. And so far this year, in just over two months, 17 officers have been shot at and three struck, two just last week. That one fact tells us two things, that our police are fully engaged and that far too many people are carrying guns on our streets. I am not one who believes that we must choose between dynamic police reform and enforcement. I believe we can, and more importantly, we must choose both. I have also learned that it cannot be accomplished in two separate conversations. It must be one. To ensure reform in public safety, we cannot be divided. We need to operate as a team. We need the community. We need the district attorneys. We need the courts. We need the advocates, but we also need the city council. We need our state legislators. And we need to have hard, honest discussions about how to protect New York City without finger pointing and divisiveness. Despite the headwinds, when you look at what has been accomplished throughout neighborhood policing in this city, through precision policing, through fresh or reinforced partnerships in our communities, we have accomplished a great deal. Still, utilizing our crime fighting philosophy, we can get better. And I believe we will get better. We know we can do this because of the relationships that we have all across this great city. But make no mistake, when we say public safety is a shared responsibility, we mean it. We need help, financial, emotional, and legislative. And we must discuss the tools our officers need to combat the surge in gun violence and other crimes. Resources that not only keep our officers safe while performing their sworn duties, but also help them keep safe all the people we serve. After all, victims are what this is all about. Helping victims find justice and preventing additional victims. Across the NYPD, we will continue to leverage every tool available to us to keep New York City safe, including the use of new and innovative technology. We are keenly focused on such advances and how they can be applied to fighting crime, creating safer and more efficient ways for police officers to do their jobs. And contributing to the important work of building trust and strengthening relationships across the city. That goes for the entire public safety spectrum from, from traditional crime to terrorism, to the seedbed activities that can draw young people down paths of criminality. This is our mission and we owe it to every New Yorker, nothing but our best efforts. There is no cookie cutter answer to anything in our line of work, but our renewed focus on our city's young people, slowed last year, unfortunately, in part by the COVID-19 epidemic, is part of our evolution now as a police department and as a community. The approach we take must always be about all of us working together to reduce crime and violence. I can tell you that the police and the public turning professional relationships into true partnerships is already fundamentally changing law enforcement. And New York City is quite frankly, a model for the rest of the nation. I thank you for the opportunity to testify today and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Commissioner Shea. We will now return to the first deputy mayor. I believe we resolved those issues and you can pick up where you left off. All right, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, well, I went to a different location. Uh, Chair Adams, members, uh, my apologies. Thank you, Commissioner Shea for jumping in. I'll, I'll start by saying I look forward to that point in time 
uh, when we don't have to do it this way, hopefully soon, and we can actually uh, be in council chambers and, and doing it together. Uh, so I do apologize for our technical difficulties. Um, I believe you were hearing uh, most of what I had said. Um, so unless someone tells me that's not correct, I'll pick up uh, on the goals, uh, the five goals and the plan. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Five, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just making sure you can hear me. <laughs> I'll pick up on the five goals and the two parts of our New York City Police Reform and Reinvention Collaborative Plan. Uh, our goal is clear, and I apologize if you heard some of this, but our goal is clear. We envision an NYPD, as the commissioner just said, that is a national example of fair, just, transparent, and accountable policing regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, religion, immigration, or socioeconomic status. Our plan includes more than 60 concrete recommendations to help us achieve that vision. These recommendations are built on the feedback and lived experience of New Yorkers from all walks of life. Now I'd like to briefly walk you through the five main goals of the plan. I want to stress these weren't created in a vacuum. They are interconnected pieces of an overall path forward. They are first, recognition and continual examination of historical and modern day racialized policing in New York City. Two, transparency and accountability to the people of New York City. Three, community representation and partnership. Four, the decriminalization of poverty, five, a diverse, resilient, and supported NYPD. Now I wanna offer just a bit more detail on how we achieve each goal. Recognition and continual examination of historical and modern day racialized policing in New York City. To address the harm done by racialized policing, we must first publicly acknowledge the department's troubled history and its current challenges and the commissioner has done that in the opening letter of the second part of this draft. Then we must urgently move forward with the reforms detailed in this report. The city commits to acknowledging, addressing and repairing past and present injustices and the trauma caused by racialized policing. The NYPD will participate in a comprehensive and independent review to identify structures of racism. The NYPD will also require supervisors to monitor officer activity for signs of bias-based policing and take immediate measures. The city will eliminate the use of unnecessary force by changing culture, adding racially biased training for NYPD leadership and instituting restorative justice. We will work in partnership with affected communities to repair relationships and build trust. We will include neighborhood coordination officers in the process and require that all officers have sufficient training to be active bystanders and prevent misconduct. Two, transparent, transparency and accountability to the people of New York City. To earn and keep the public trust, we must hold officers accountable in a consistent, transparent and fair manner. The first, NYPD disciplinary system penalty guidelines, what we commonly refer to as the discipline matrix, gives us a clear, consistent, and fair way to assess discipline. The city will closely monitor its implementation. The CCRB and NYPD have embraced the discipline matrix, have signed a written agreement to fully implement it. Beyond the matrix, for the most egregious cases, the city should also be able to impose suspensions without pay for more than 30 days while investigation proceeds. We will work with the state to change that law. But accountability also requires a full command of the facts. We will now systematically include an officer's complaint and disciplinary history in the promotion process. We will also expand our early intervention program to identify officers who are at risk and get them the help before harm occurs. Strong oversight is also necessary to ensure trust. 
That's why we announced the largest expansion of the scope and powers of CCRB since it was established in 1993. Under the David Dickens plan, we will consolidate the powers of the Department of Investigation Office of Inspector General for the NYPD, the Commission to Combat Police Corruption, and put both of these under the structure of CCRB. These three offices will be more effective working together in this one structure. Transparency requires the public have information about NYPD policies and information. To that end, the city will issue a memorial, a memorial executive order establishing a citywide policy on fair and responsible use of biometric technology, which will cover all agencies, including the NYPD. Three, community representation and partnership. Creating meaningful partnerships at the neighborhood level must be at the center of NYPD's mission and ingrained in everything the department does. We will strengthen community input and cooperation in violence prevention and response, in recruiting, hiring, retention, and promotion, and in working with agencies to improve public spaces. We will ensure that whenever an officer starts in a new precinct, they will establish a relationship in surrounding neighborhoods. We will empower community members to help select their precinct committee. We are also expanding precinct commander advisory councils. So the community has a formalized way to discuss outreach, engagement, and resource development with precinct leadership. The MYPD will consistently solicit real-time feedback from the community about, about positive and negative experiences to ensure the public gets the best possible service. We will also take important steps to improve relationships with immigrant communities and work with people with disabilities to expand partnership and services. Four, the decriminalization of poverty. Police are often the first public servants to address complex social, emotional, and behavioral issues. This pattern is particularly true in low income and communities of color. This creates a poverty to prison pipeline. The city will systematically examine and end policies that over-police lower income residents and communities of color. When possible, will health professionals respond to mental health crisis. We will use civilian agencies to address quality of life issues. We have moved enforcement of street vending regulations to the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. We are shifting primary responsibility for homeless outreach to the Department of Homeless Service. We are moving school safety agents to the Department of Education. We will also do a better job helping victims of crime. We will provide special training to officers who deal with victims of domestic, gender-based, and family violence, and ensure victims receive access to critical resources. We will develop new policies and approaches to sex trafficking that do not entangle victims in the criminal justice system. Fifth, a diverse, resilient, and supported NYPD. We are committed to creating the most diverse and resilient law enforcement agency in the nation. We owe our officers the best training equipment and resources. We owe them a department that continues to improve its culture, a department that prioritizes officers' health and well being, a department that offers a clear, consistent pathway to rewarding careers and promotions. We will recruit and promote officers so that NYPD leadership reflects the communities it serves and the values of our city. We will make residency in the five boroughs a more significant factor in hiring. We must reform the promotion process to improve transparency and fairness and build a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive department. And the city is committed to providing officers with the necessary support they need to be successful. As part of supporting professional development and improve careers at all levels, we are developing training to help officers manage better. We will also expand the NYPD's critical incident stress management program to help build a culture that supports seeking help and addressing trauma. 
To conclude, we have laid out concrete, detailed, and ambitious agenda to tackle the legacy of racialized policing head on, increase transparency and accountability, increase community representation, partnership, decriminalize poverty, and create a diverse and resilient police department. This, this plan builds upon seven years of reforming policing in New York City. We have achieved a great deal, but recognize we have to go much farther. These are big goals, but they are achievable and necessary goals. As the legacy we are confronting is deep and our urgency is high. Yet we approach this task with confidence. We know from experience that New Yorkers and their police department are capable of changing history. I want to thank the speaker, the chair, the members of the committee for inviting me to testify and the commissioner. <clears throat> we want to continue the conversation with the council on these proposals and your legislation as we move along in this reform process. Thank you again, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. I will now turn it over to questions from the chair. Um, if we can have the first deputy mayor and the police commissioner conference room remain unmuted. Um, and to each of you, if you need a, a, one of your colleagues to answer a question, please just refer to that specific colleague and we'll, we'll unmute them. Um, a reminder to Chair Adams, you will be in control of muting and unmuting yourself during this period. And thank you, everyone. Chair Adams, you may begin. Thank you very much, Council, and thank you for your testimony, uh, everyone. I'd also uh, like to say uh, another thank you to all of uh, NYPD personnel who are here um, with your presence and with your testimony this morning. We appreciate you being here for this really, really important hearing. Commissioner Che, it's good to see you today. And um, just want to... Um, just relay that we appreciate your apology um, overall. Um, the reality is that the average New Yorker, though, isn't watching these hearings, right? They don't read a 187 page report. So, how do we actually get the message to regular people? How do we translate the talk so that there is an impact that people actually feel on the ground? Yeah, Chair Adams, I think, you know, when you talk about policing, certainly this last year, and it's not just confined to New York City, it's across the country. You often start and end talking about trust. And um, I, I know that to my right is Ben Tucker, and we talk about this all the time. And, and, and it drives really all the policy decisions that we make from training, from hiring, from how we continue training when officers are out of the academy, um, how we police this city. And when you talk about neighborhood policing and, and devoting resources to the, the, to the youth and the youth coordination officers with the work I've done with Chauncey Parker. So I agree with you. Um, I thought it was important to say for a lot of different reasons, but I also think words have to be backed up by actions. And my commitment is to stand behind my words and in everything that we do with this agency. Um, I think the men and women of this police department are some of the best that New York City has to offer. Um, but it's my job and Ben's job beside me to lead them and guide them and, and to make sure that they turn those words into credible, realized actions. And people need to, to your point, they need to feel it every day with every encounter. So, you know, I, I'll stop, but I could talk about our customer service plan. I could talk about the accountability, how we police with build the block meetings. It, it runs throughout everything literally that we're trying to do. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I'm just going to add, uh, the, the majority of my questions are going to be for the first deputy mayor. So I wanted to make sure that, that I get my questions for you. I just have another one because you and I have spoken about this in the past and we've spoken about the, the different ways of operation in the precincts across the city. Um, the precincts across the city to my estimation have different brains, if you will, across the board. And there really is no one uniform way of operating across those brains. 
Um, we've had, for example, uh, recently in one of my precincts, a no-knock. Um, and uh, uh, one of my uh, constituents' uh, homes was turned upside down, nothing found, no-knock warrant. The officers uh, actually covered their badges, so she didn't know who was who, what was what. Um, we actually still have uh, verbiage coming out of out of precincts across this city. If there's a problem, call your council member. Well, your council member is not law enforcement. That is still a resonating theme throughout precincts across this city. Most recently, as last week, you know, in one of mine again. So uh, again, how do we? How how am I supposed to convince my constituents? How am I supposed to convince them that? These aren't just words as far as reform. How am I supposed to convince them when they see day after day uh, instances where, where they are still treated the same? They are still being disrespected. They are still being dishonored. Their words aren't valued, and it seems that their lives are not valued. How are we to convince them that this is not more talk and rhetoric? Yeah, that, that's a great, great point, Chair Adams. And uh, there's a lot there to unpack. Um, I think I think it's you know the work that we all are committed to doing. Um, you, you're right, and what I you know as you're talking, I think you know one bad incident sets us back, and there's no doubt that that's the truth. And whether it happens in Minneapolis or whether it happens in an apartment, as you said, I don't know the details of what you're referring to, but that incident in Queens, I don't know the details, and I and I'd love to, and I'm sure you'll we'll follow up, but. If, if what you describe is right, that story will be told a hundred times. And that's the message we're trying to tell our cops that they represent a brand and don't be remembered for your worst day. You know, how do you want to be remembered 10 years from now? Because believe me, and, and I know you know this, you know, that's the conversation we have to the, the cops that are youngest in the academy or, or tenured officers that, you know, you have millions of encounters and, that one bad one, you don't want to be remembered for that way. I think when you talk about the scope of the NYPD, a large agency, I think that's our strength and our weakness. The strength is that, you know, we, we, we get a lot of uh, different talented people that do amazing things across the city. I know you know a lot of them in terms of the work we do with outreach and community affairs and neighborhood policing. But but the weakness is, is, is one represents all too. And uh, that's something that we have to constantly uh, fight back. I'm not gonna pass it. I, I'd love to, to Juanita Holmes, because you know, as chief of patrol, I know she's thinking right now and has a lot to say. She's probably chomping on the bit, but on the topic of no knock, you know, this topic is being examined across the country right now with the the tragic incident with Breonna Taylor. What I will say on that is please, to anyone considering legislation, invite us to the table before decisions are made. Because we, we also have to think of the safety of officers going through the door on very dangerous circumstances. I know that a lot of police departments chair across the country right now are looking at their policies and modifying policies. I'm happy to say that a lot of the things that they're coming to, we've had in place for a number of years. We have a very high centralized process that feeds through our intelligence bureau with very high to the chief level levels where before a warrant is executed, it is reviewed. Is the information credible? Is it fresh? What, what, what is the purpose of going through that door? Do we have a no-knock capacity? Because many warrants do not. And, and I think that we're in a, a much better place than most police departments across the country in terms of our policies and practices in this area. So what, what all, all that said, what is actually the plan to implement the plan and who's going to be in charge of making sure that you follow through? Um, uh, are we working on any potential budget updates to reflect any of the proposals at all, um, I, who, who is going to be in charge of making sure that the plan is followed through? Are you, you're referring to the reform plan? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna pass it to Dean in one second, but let me just say, um, 
you know, it was it was myself that reached out to Jennifer, Wes, and Arva um, and had a conversation. I, I want to say it was back in September or October. I don't remember exactly when. And the conversation basically, I did not know. I, I had spoken to Wes uh, at some interactions uh, unrelated to reform prior, once or twice. I don't know that I had ever really spoken to Wes uh, excuse me, to Jennifer or Arva before that. So I was calling them up really cold. And what I asked them to do, and they took a leap of faith, was to trust me, number one, and to come in on the ground floor of an opportunity to change policy. Um, I would not always agree with them, I told them, but I, I, I expected differing opinions and give and take. I, I like to think that, you know, your reputation is everything you have, that if they were polled right now, they'd say I was fair and, uh, you know, I, they would they would agree with I, I upheld so far what we, we have set out to do. But it's a process. And, and I know that Ben next to me is also thinking about the work that he's done over the last seven years in everything from training to the risk management bureau to implementing body cameras some of it forced on us the monitor some of it forced on us much of it not forced on us and we have been on a path to lead this police department to continue to be the best in the country and to be the most innovative and to keep crime down but to be fair so whether it's neighborhood policing whether it's the discipline matrix whether it's you know with the recent mou signed with fred davy the chair of the ccrb in law, it's mandated that when I differ from Fred, it's reported. I said, that's not good enough. I'm going to also tell the public when I differ from Fred. So I think I've demonstrated um, on multiple occasions, you know, uh, will it, the willingness to take bold steps, but compromising that balance, not compromising public safety, but also doing it the right way getting rid of anti-crime in response to many, many multiple complaints from the community. Um, I thought we could do things differently. I think I was proven right in that we're still getting far too many guns off the street. But at the same time, our civilian complaints have gone down. So I think there's a lot of positive there. And it's hard to say, again, back to that trust word. People, we need to earn it. And that's the bottom line. Commissioner, I'm just going to jump in because you, you just made me think of something. When you spoke of CCRB, yeah. Chair, Chair Davey, yes. uh, recognize the fact that um, there is some discrepancy there between, between CCRB's decision and you are overriding CCRB's decision some of the time. What are some of those deciding factors? Because from, from my vantage point, there should indeed have been disciplinary measures taken and followed through when it comes to several, several opinions that were overridden that I actually give validity to coming out of CCRB. So can you tell us what your, what your motivating factors are for yep. discussing the views and the opinions uh, of CCRB when you do? You know, when I said that, Chair Adams, I said, here comes that question. And I, and I did it purposefully because I think that that- You got me. I, that article in, in uh, you know, I, I forget what paper it was in, caused a lot of harm. It, it really did. And I don't think it was fair. So I will tell you that um, most of that article focused on pre-discipline matrix. That's the first point to recognize that I think is really important. And pre-MOU signed with CCRB. I think, and I, and I will not speak for Fred, but I think that all of us have the general opinion now that whether it's... Uh, uh, police officer accused, whether it's person that makes a complaint, whether it's the CCRB investigating, or whether it's me that's ultimate disciplinarian, we're working off the same playbook and we never had a playbook before. I think that's a huge step forward. Remember that we're now posting these decisions with the repeal of 50A. So th the evidence is going to be right there a year from now, two years from now to look and say, how is whoever the police commissioner is, how are they doing? I also want to point out that there was an article in the paper yesterday that also may come up where it said there's still some discrepancies. It's interesting that when they talked about me, they said he lowered the decision, I think, five times, but raised it four times. There is that's 
I don't know that that's terrible. Um, each case is scrutinized incredibly. What led to most of the discrepancies in that 70% number was it left out the fact, Chair, that when a case goes to CCRB, this is one of the biggest points, and I'll end here, and it's investigated, and CCRB says, we are substantiating this, and it gets turned over then to the NYPD for discipline or a trial. The trial still has to take place. And sometimes the trial was innocent. Clearly, there's going to be a discrepancy in the penalty then, because they were asking for X, but the person was found innocent after trial. That factored into that, and that was not made clear in the article. Sometimes they're going to be found guilty, but it's partially guilty. So if you're accused of four things, and the penalty for the four things is, let's say, 20 vacation days, but then the trial happens and you're only guilty of one of the four, that's going to change. There are multiple factors like this. I do not believe that that was a fair and impartial description of this discipline process. Chair Adams, may I jump in? Yes, certainly. So thank you. Let's, let's step back for a minute. And, and, I, and thank you, Dermot. And I think let, let's step back for both CCRB and the MYP. This was a two-year process. This took, this took a lot of effort. And by the way, it was very public. The, the original disciplinary matrix was put out for public review. And the final disciplinary matrix, much stronger, much more encompassing. It was put out in, in the middle of January. There was an MOU, binding agreement between the commissioner and, and, the, and the head of CCRB and a statement at that moment that we will follow this, except in very rare and unusual cases, but, but in the vast majority of cases, both committed that this would be the guidelines for the first time in New York City history. 60 pages of recommendations, detail on discipline. Here's the standard discipline. Here's the aggravated discipline for, for additional problems. And here are mitigating factors. And it goes list by list by list. And it's important actually for New Yorkers to do that. And the three co-sponsors participated. Uh, Jennifer Jones Austin, uh, Westmore and Arbor Rice participated. We all did. CCRB was very active in this decision process. It's the reason that we all took pride in finally putting this forward. This is actually how discipline goes forward. It is fair to communities. It is fair to neighborhoods. It, it, is, it is fair to officers. So they understand exactly what they're doing as they move forward. So, so I, I do think, yes, we need to talk about the past, yet, and clearly we do. We need to understand where the problems were, where discrepancies occurred, where incidents occurred that shouldn't have happened, where discipline occurred that we would not agree with. But we also need to say, okay, here's how we're moving forward. And this was a fundamental change. Thank you. I, Thank I just you. thought we needed to put that in context. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I also want to say that I noticed that neither part of the plan addresses the issue of the police commissioner's discretion over final discipline. Um, and it's something that we've heard a lot about from advocates and from my colleagues, uh, Majority Leader Cumbo has a resolution. We heard calling for the CCRB to have final authority. Now, I don't know how we restore confidence if we continue to see situations like what happened with Tony Wells. I spoke about her uh, in my past two hearings where officers can completely neglect their duties, allow an innocent person to die and walk away with a slap on the wrist. It's just a gut punch to the families of the victims and it compounds their tragedy. So Commissioner Shea or First Deputy Mayor Fulahan, do you have any response to these concerns? And what do you say to Elizabeth Rivera, who is probably watching this, that's Tony's mother. What do we say to the family of Delron Smalls? Um, Officer Isaacs is still being paid, uh, still on budget. The, the, I, the issues that we're talking about today are budgeted issues. These officers are still being paid. So what do we, what do we say? Uh, about this, uh, what do we say about this? So, 
So I'm going to, I'll jump in and then I'm quite sure the commissioner will want to. And, and I also want, I don't want to forget your question about who is responsible, uh, which, which you started with the, with the commissioner on. So I'll, I'll end with that, but, but let's go back to this point. I want to emphasize again mm -hmm. that this document is, is how we move forward. We yeah. do have d additional discipline measures. We're asking for your support in additional unpaid, uh, unpaid suspension for officers who commit egregious acts. Uh, I think we all can rightfully determine who that is. We need state law to make those changes. We're operating under the state law restrictions and we're asking for modifications, both on, uh, on the amount of time unpaid suspension occurs and in egregious cases on, uh, on pension forfeiture. So, but I'm going to go back to this. You should judge. Yeah, I'll, I, I, will, I will disagree with the commissioner on one thing uh, because I know he agrees with me on this. The disciplinary matrix and how we are following it. And I know Fred Davey agrees with this. We're going to be doing constantly. It, it's not going to be six months from now. It's not going to be a year from now. We're going to be doing this every single week. We're going to be doing this every single month. You should do it with us. If there are deviations, we should all understand what those were. We should question them. We should, we should have a clear understanding. But I'm gonna again say that I don't believe that's what we're gonna see. I think we're gonna see the product of two years of really thoughtful work saying here is discipline, here is the adjudicative process, and here is the result. And I think you're gonna see that consistently. On responsibility, I do wanna say, we're, look, we're all responsible. Um, we're gonna work with you. Uh, we take responsibility. Um, we're going to spend as much time as we need to work with you. I'm happy to have conversations with you and your fellow members on an ongoing basis. And of course, absolutely, this needs to be reflected in the executive budget process. Look, we're, we're, in a, we're all very fortunate to now have the stimulus bill that we had all waited over a year for. We all thought this would have happened last spring. Didn't happen. Finally, with a with with our president and the change in the Senate, we're able to have a stimulus bill to allow us to address the the problems that became accentuated in the pandemic and that we know we need to address. So, with a sense of urgency, of course, we're going to talk to you in the executive budget and not wait. And we're happy to start that process. Definitely, there's funding that needs to be accomplished to effectuate these 60 reforms and the many more reforms that you, I know you want to talk to us about. I, I would really hear a response to what we say to those families um, who are still impacted, um, where officers are still being paid for misdeeds. Yeah, Chair Adams, I, I would just add in, um, because, you know, when, when you talk about some of these tragic circumstances and, and, and you review them and you try, to, you try to find out, you know, what, what happened and how do you get better and how do you make sure these incidents like this don't happen again? That, that's the goal here. I think it comes down to what, what um, and I would agree with everything that Dean said in terms of having a solid system uh, and looking to always constantly improve it if there are if there are issues with it that are identified that are not um, you know in line with our current way of thinking. This discipline matrix has gone under um, some changes. It went out for public comments. This is the real I would categorize it as the starting point, but it's not going to be a static document. Um, and and we're being transparent about it. If we change it, we're going to tell people that we're changing it and why. If we differ from it, and I agree with Dean, that there should not really be occurrences. Um, but if there is, then, then we will be public about that to the public and to both CCRB. And I think that's fair to all involved parties. Um, regarding the incident that you, you mentioned, two incidents, uh, Madam Chair, the first, if, I, if I'm thinking of the same one, it's the incident in, in Brooklyn a couple of years ago. Terrible incident where, uh, from my recollection, officers responded. There was a woman that lost her life in a building. Um, I think that was, uh, I thought that was uncovered actually by the NYPD. I don't know if it was a CCRB related incident um, that was covered under the matrix and they took a penalty 
for it and, and no penalty is gonna bring back that young woman. I mean, that's just the sad truth. Um, we look at all the factors of every individual case. What did the officers know at the time? Um, and, and I wish I could say something that was more, but I, you know, I am incredibly sorry that anyone loses their life in New York City, including that young woman. Um, the Delron Smalls one, I'm gonna be a little more careful because that will ultimately come to me, Madam Chair, for ultimate decision-making. What I will say about that incident is this. There was a terrible situation where a man lost his life. No one is disputing that. An officer was charged criminally and prosecuted and found not guilty in a court of law. Due process is important here. Um, Fred Davey came to me and made me aware recently in the last couple months of his intention to go forward with a civilian complaint prosecution regarding that case. This is after the officer had been found not guilty in a criminal court of law. The current process is that I could have stopped that from happening and I did not stop that from happening. So it will go through this process with the Civilian Complaint Review Board and there will be a trial within the police department and ultimately it will come to me and I'm not making any prejudgments regarding anything additional with it. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. I think we're gonna leave it there. The, the, the stories are still very, very fresh yes. uh, in a lot of our minds. Um, the, the, the Tony Wells case, the officers, basically, it seems they were cold and sat in their police, uh, in their patrol cars, and what happened to her happened to her. Uh, we will wait, and we are still standing with both of those families for justice on both of those cases. Um, for Deputy Commissioner, the mayor's plan promises full transparency in NYPD discipline, but the website the NYPD launched this week is limited to guilty findings from formal charges. Will the mayor and the NYPD commit to making all NYPD disciplinary charges public, including settlements, command discipline, and other charges resolved short of a guilty finding at trial? Can you hear me again? I'm sorry, I was I muted, so you. I couldn't jump in yeah. before. Uh, we can hear I, you. I, I, thank you. Um, Gosh, I really can't wait till we can actually be in the same room. Um, I want to go back a minute and then and then address this question, and then the commissioner obviously will jump in. I I want to. You, you asked what are what assurances you were talking about families, but what assurances are we giving residents? Look, we we are putting together. This is the most historic change since the creation of CCR. We are expanding its scope. We are expanding its power. We are, last year we increased its authority. This year we are saying that they will do bias related crimes. We are going to the state to give them ability to do sealed records. We are allowing them to do their own investigations. They are going also through the patrol guide. It is a very different oversight entity. And as part of that, while we've increased the CCR budget by 40% since uh, together since the beginning of this administration, it's clear that we're gonna have to give them the resources and quickly so that they can address accusations and cases and do them quickly and responsibly. So that is also part of the answer that we're gonna do together with you. And yeah. go ahead, Dermot. Well, I, I would just say, uh, Madam Chair, regarding the, the dashboard, we had that dashboard built uh, for some time, um, constantly making uh, thoughts to it. A lot of thought went into what we published. Uh, I'm awfully proud. Well, it wasn't me that did it, but I have Matt Frazier, our commissioner of ITB, in the room with me and others. Um, it's probably a, a, uh, a dashboard that will serve as a template for the whole country and law enforcement. And that's not to say we're content with everything. I think we can make changes, but we put a lot of thought into striking that balance of information, what information uh, should we put on it that the public has a right to know, what information and privacy for the officers too went into it, frankly. 
So what we came up with was the uh, substantiated cases, as you know, um, respecting the due process piece of this, that could I have made a decision to put up uh, cases where a complaint is made and the officer is found innocent or not guilty of it? I could have, but I, I didn't want to be in a position where we're giving uh, less due rights and process to officers than we do to other people charged with offenses throughout the criminal justice system. I think I struck the right balance, but I respect the right that others have uh, a difference of opinion. We also, I would say, took a step, which I think is important here, that we link this website. So when you go onto our dashboard, we link directly to other places where you can find additional information if, if that is your prerogative. So regarding uh, trial decisions, we link right to the CCRB. The CCRB puts different information than we do up. Um, so it's not as if we're hiding it, but I do, I am gonna do what I think is, is right. And whether it's um, trial decisions, we had lengthy discussions um, speaking to many members of the NYPD, I think we put an awful lot of information here, and I think we took a bold step and a pretty significant step in terms of transparency. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And, and again, CCRB is, is putting online, and, and CCRB are the complaints that come from our residents, and they're the more serious, and they are putting everything online, and it is there right now. So there's a great deal of information that we're putting forward and we're going to constantly be reevaluating and talking to you about what improvements you think we need to make. Thank you. In talking, you know, just extending this conversation a little bit more, a lot of the plan seems to be an expansion of projects that you're already doing. Other than cure violence, which of course we fully support, and there is a strong evidentiary basis for, do you have any evidence base to support the conclusion that the expansion of these programs will have a positive impact? Many of these programs, um, the inc including precinct commander advisory councils, which you've mentioned, People's Police Academy, the ComStat customer service pilot in East Harlem and in my district in South Jamaica, and pop up with a cop with projects that presumably came along with some project assessment, yet none of that has been released. Have you asked Mock J to evaluate any of these programs? And how do you expect council to endorse a police plan without any evidentiary basis for the assumption that these programs actually do have value? Look, we're, and, and, and the commissioner will jump in also and, and uh, Chelsea, uh, Chelsea Davis on my staff, you should jump in and the acting director of MockJ is also on. So look, before I hand it over, look, we, I said, I didn't, I didn't emphasize it, but I did say at the end in the conclusion that we're building on seven years of success that we take pride in, but we know we have much farther to go. And I'm not using that to minimize any of our urgent needs and any of the problems that we have to confront. So we have, we are building on, that's correct. We are building on those, but we are also being more tr transformative. We really do believe every one of those five categories has, has recommendations that, that we do believe are more community engagement. We're taking it as an article of faith and we need to now show that that's happening. With, we need to look at the next precinct commander with you and the selection process and the community engagement. We, we understand that this is, an, when I said week by week on the discipline and making sure it was happening properly, we mean those things. So yes, we need to see if the proposals we're putting forward are, are working, are effective. We believe they have been in the past. We believe doubling down on them, putting more resources on them, exactly what you said about cure violence, where we see, um, where we see, have seen positive gains, including MAP at NYCHA. We need, to, we need to move forward with those. And we're willing to do that with you. And we're willing to talk to you about what kind of metrics would you like to see? What kind of, what do you need from us? To, to help you be part of that process and to convince you we're moving in the right direction. Chelsea, do you want to say anything before I pass the commissioner? 
We're going to get uh, Miss Davis unmuted. I just have to administer the oath if she's going to. Would you please? Thank you. Uh, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and answer all questions to the best, honestly and to the best of your ability? Yes, I do. You may proceed. Great. Thank you. Um, I'll just add, add a couple of things. Um, there are certainly aspects of this plan that are um, expansions like uh, doubling the Cure of Islands workforce. Um, there are certainly new pilot programs that are included. A lot of those are focused on institutionalizing community engagement um, in ways that we haven't done before. Um, and that's at the local level, at the precinct level, and also in collaboration with leadership at the police department to make sure that there's community input in, in actual decision-making um, and finding new ways that, that communities can collaborate with the police to define public safety for themselves. Um, there's also expansions in the role, of course, of, of CCRB, but also some really new foundational changes um, included in, in the Dinkins plan. So, so there is certainly a mix of, of expansion of pilots and of some big foundational changes, because we know that there's no single initiative that, that's going to cause the kind of change that we need. Okay, thank you. Um, it, it, again, sticking with this plan a, a little bit, before I let my colleagues in here, I know that they wanna get in here and uh, we do have a long day. Um, how can you expect to gather and incorporate public and community feedback on a plan that you only started to release a week ago that has to be passed by the council by the end of this month? These documents are hundreds of pages long hundreds of pages long, and you actually expect members of the public to read it, digest it, and comment on them for their comments to be read, digested, and incorporated into a revised plan in just over two weeks, just trying to understand the thought process. So respectfully, Chair, I, the process begins much, much sooner than that. The process now has been engaged for months. Um, over 85 community meetings, countless conversations uh, within the NYPD, within affected communities. Uh, the engagement of the three co-sponsors who bring with them a wealth of experience and a wealth of participation. We actually do believe that, that it, it's not, this is just part of that continuum. It's just one, it's just one stop that that what we have agreed to and been working on through the, through the summer, through the fall, the discipline, I'm gonna keep going back to it because as Chelsea said, it's a foundational change. The expansion of the, uh, of, and the, the adoption of the discipline matrix, the MOU enforcing of it, the expansion of, C the incredible expansion of CCRB and their powers, all those things came out in January. The anti-violence, working on new ways to do anti-violence and the more than uh, doubling of cure violence, something that we've already increased by I think 60% already. The, all those things are, are, have been part of a process. We're not stopping here. We have, you've been holding hearings that have been thoughtful and have moved us. These reports are part of that process. We're gonna keep working with you Beyond this, we're working with you now on, a, on your legislation. We're going to work with you in the executive budget to make all of these things a reality and to keep going. Yes, we want constant public input. We want the criticism and we're committed to constantly keeping change. But we do believe this is the product of public input. How many comments have you gotten on the website? On, on the current piece, uh, Ch Chelsea or Marcos, I need somebody to, and on the NYPD one, I would need somebody to, to jump in and help. Since the release of, let's say, since the release of part two, we're looking for the public to be interactive here. How many comments have you gotten on the release of part two? If we don't have that immediately, we'll make sure to get that point. Okay. All right, so we'll follow up with that. Have you met with any groups or stakeholders after the uh, release of the first draft? I beg your pardon, I didn't, I'm sorry. Have you met with any groups or stakeholders after the release of the first draft? I, I'm quite sure that there are many people on this call who can jump in and, and speak to the number of engagements they've had. 
since the release of the first draft. Obviously, yeah. I've had numerous conversations uh, with Jennifer Jones Austin, uh, 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 Westmore, and Arva Rice, but I'll allow others to jump in on it. We have been been partnering with the Community Affairs Unit and, and still working with the PD to have more meetings. We can get you a detailed list of the ones that we've had since March 5th, um, but they've certainly been, they've certainly been um, ongoing and we've had many different kinds of forums. So um, as you're aware, uh, the engagement kicked off with the nine um, town hall listening sessions um, that were facilitated by the, the co-sponsors and NYPD. Um, and I can go through um, in detail the different um, kinds of meetings that we have that make up those um, approximately 85 meetings that the first deputy mayor. Yeah, we've, we've gone over that in the, in the previous hearings. I've, I was actually involved in a couple of them. Um, they were actually, a couple of them were troubling to me, quite frankly. I think we've spoken about that um, in previous hearings. I, I just wanted to know as far as um, the, the last release was concerned, how much interaction has gone on um, you know, since the last release, was anything incorporated um, as a result of any responses uh, with the second piece? And then I'll go on, to, I'll let council take over and get my colleagues in here. Um, I don't have the exact number of public comments that we've received so far since March 5th on the first draft or, or since March 12th on the second part, but we will get that number to you, to you right away, um, as well as the list of meetings that we have had since. Um, we are certainly reading through those comments um, and making revisions based on them. Um, we've certainly been hearing, um, I think the feedback has been really consistent to what we heard in all of the meetings. People are really focused on, um, on accountability, on making sure that there are implementation plans, um, on improving training, um, and on making sure that the reforms of the discipline system are, are put in place. But we'll come back with the exact number of comments in the meetings that we've had since the fifth. Thank you. Right. And, and we have been obviously talking to care violence providers. We've been talking as the recommendations have come out to try to make sure and to move forward on the implementation. But look, part of this is your hearing and to get more and more information out. And the best place to hear reactions is, of course, from uh, one of the one of the better places is council members. So we appreciate your time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to you for questions uh, from my colleagues. Thank you, Chair. I will now call on council members in the order they've used the Zoom raise hand function. If you would like to ask a question you've not used it yet, use the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now. Council members, you will have a total of five minutes to ask your question and receive an answer from the panelists. And given our uh, PAC schedule today, I know the chair will be holding you to that uh, clock. Um, sergeant in arms will keep uh, will let you know when your time is up. Once I've called on you, please wait until the sergeant has announced it. Uh, you may begin before asking your questions. I'll just uh, read the first few council members. Um, we have council member Holden, council member Lander, uh, the public advocate, and council member Cabrera, followed by several others. We will now turn to council member council member Holden. Time starts now. Thank you, Commissioner Shea, for your testimony. And it was so important that you mentioned shooting victims in your testimony. Um, looking at the impact of $1 billion cut to the NYPD budget, most notably the increase in shootings and its impact on certain communities. Because of uh, personnel cuts, are we experiencing a drop in arrest across the board? And the second part of my question, and given our so-called tough gun laws, can you give us a breakdown of after NYPD makes an, a gun arrest, what percentage of those arrested are incarcerated? Thank you. Am I live? Yes, I am. Thank you, uh, Councilman. Um, you know, early early on in COVID, when 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 the financial crisis was hitting New York City, uh, I think all city agencies realized what was coming. Um, to a degree, certainly a $1 billion cut um, causes to have to be very um, innovative in terms of uh, continuing to provide the quality of service that New York City residents demand and deserve. Did it have an impact? Certainly it had an impact, uh, particularly as we moved into the summer months last year. You know, we had a pretty significant uh, cut to the, the overtime budget, which, which 
translates into tours, which translates into cops on the street in those neighborhoods that were getting hit pretty hard by uh, that summer violence. And, you know, I think we all know what has happened um, in terms of a 100% increase in shootings last year. We're at a 40% increase now. Um, it ties directly to your second question, which I'm going to turn it over to Chief Mike LaPetri, who I know is on this call. But uh, your phrasing of the, we, we do, we have the toughest gun laws in the country. But what is most important for everyone on this hearing to know is that that does not necessarily translate into um, tough in terms of getting these dangerous people with guns multiple times off the streets. Mike LaPetri? Good morning. When we look at gun arrests last year, we saw approximately a 30% increase. When we look at that population, approximately only 12% are actually incarcerated today. Um, we also look at the overall bail set last year for gun arrests. We were at the lowest percentage that we've ever seen, and we were at the highest percentage that we ever seen as far as released on their own recognizance. As far as people who got rearrested with an open gun arrest last year, we were also at the highest percentage that we've seen. That also continues this year with, a, with, a also, with an increase from last year. When we look at gun arrests with, pri with prior gun convictions last year, we were also at the highest percentage that we've ever seen. That this year has also increased. The one thing that has increased this year is the incarceration rate for gun arrests. We, we, are, we are presently at about a 17% uh, percentage for incarceration this year with a 12% last year. So, so if um, we have tough gun laws, but if just a very small percentage are actually doing time, what's going on here? So, you, you know, again, when we look at it, uh, when they are getting a bail, they, they have to get the least restrictive manner of that bail. So even this year with the increase in bail being set, those individuals are still getting out because of a, of a lower bail or a non-monetary release or a supervised release. And, and that falls from the new legislation uh, from 2020. So it's, it kind of looks like that the NYPD is doing their job, but the rest of us are not. Um, and if, we, if we're serious about protecting the public, Let's start putting individuals who commit multiple felonies and, and um, shots fired and, and, and are arrested for, for either having a gun or shooting a gun. There should be mandatory, like the law says, mandatory jail time. I'm, I'm going to come to the defense of the NYPD, which I have a pleasure to do. Um, that what's happened, this what we're seeing happened around the country. This was not unique to New York City. And we are seeing a, a large number of gun arrests in ways we have not seen before. We know there's much more work to be done. The NYPD is out there doing, doing that work. We know, we know, for example, with the court systems, we're hearing this from the district attorneys, the court system needs to reopen. The mayor's been saying this weekly um, on his press conferences that we need the court system up and running. We need grand juries back. We need safe. We want to make sure they get vaccinated. There are many ways that we know that we need to address this and we need your help in addressing that. And the way to do it is to get the system back moving. Part of the recovery process is how we're going to do this. But we have, uh, but uh, Deputy Commissioner, we, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Deputy Mayor, we have some of the toughest gun laws in the country. That's what we're told. Um, so you're saying the courts are not open. That's why we're not, you know, enforcing our tough gun laws. I'm saying that there are many factors that happened across the country that we all know that occurred during this pandemic. We now need and all of our efforts should be at recovery. And that's what we're going to be doing. And that includes the entire criminal justice system being up and running. All right, Chair, I, and, and the other piece that I want to say, because we've mentioned this, there are community solutions that need to be part of this. 
which is also part of the anti-gun anti violence package. And we're not going to forget that. Part of the whole presentation by both the commissioner and my comments is about how we're going to engage, how we're going to have community participate and build even more community trust, build neighborhood policing to an even higher level. Yeah, we still have a lot of innocent citizens out there getting shot. Um, just happening to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. We need more than just talk. Um, uh, we need we need action. And it sounds like the NYPD, like I said, doing their job, but it's not the rest of us that are that are that are enforcing these gun laws. We need that to be enforced. If we have tough gun laws, let's enforce them and, and stop letting people out of jail to do it again. Simple. Commissioner, and I'm just going to jump here, and I apologize. I didn't want to do this and step on my colleagues' questioning. But I, but I, I really do have to say this. Are we going to acknowledge another piece of the summer violence, which most of us should know, was a post-budget NYPD slowdown? Are we going to acknowledge that today? Are we going to admit that? Uh, I'm just asking a question. To me, it was very obvious. It was spoken of and uh, mentioned in the ranks, along with the beginning of the, quote, call your council member tagline in our precinct. Are we going to acknowledge that? Chair, Chair, I hope, and I think you do know that I have great respect for you, but I, I could not disagree more with that statement. Um, you know, let's look back to last May and June. We all remember what was going on. You had 20% of the NYPD out with COVID. You had um, the protests, which were raging throughout New York City, which was pulling mass amounts of resources. At the same time, you had the budget pass, which slashed the budget by 60% on the overtime, which led to real significant problems with attrition. And at the same time as all of that was going, the cops never, never, never stopped working. They were getting shot at during that period. They were making gun arrests during that period. Um, there was no slowdown. Commissioner, with all due respect, we are going to agree to disagree. The rank told me something totally different. Council? So I, I, I'm gonna jump in on both of you respectfully. Look, we, we, the past year have, has, has been incredibly difficult in so many ways. Uh, there were budget actions that were taken that I will say I believe were responsible and thoughtful. And many of those were about moving, moving priorities and moving where it is so the NYPD could be more focused. That's one of the goals of these reports that's articulated in this report. But this is really about how are we going to move forward and how are we going to address our multiple problems as we're on this road to recovery. Um, Next up will be council member Lander, followed by the public advocate. I'm Starch now. Council member, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Yes. Thank you, Chair Adams. I appreciate what you said in your opening. Uh, this is not a serious effort to transform public safety in New York City and confront the harms of discriminatory policing. And I'm having the feeling of what Yogi Berra called deja vu all over again. Uh, last year, or the mayor's preliminary budget this year for FY22 proposes to increase the NYPD budget by $196 million, even as it cuts CUNY, youth services, neighborhood arts and culture and sanitation. And when the NYPD is already one out of every six employees. So I'm gonna focus my questions today on what happened with the current year's budget, FY21, because we can't move forward with meaningful transparency if we aren't honest about what's in the budget and what is really happening. And you can follow along with a spreadsheet I've put online at bit.ly slash NYPD FY21 budget uh, or on my Twitter. So last year, as part of the budget that the mayor and council adopted, City Hall told us that this year's budget would reduce the NYPD budget by a billion dollars. And many of you may remember this chart that uh, I got from the speaker's office, but uh, I assume came from City Hall. 
Um, the mayor, the NYPD, the speaker told us that this year's budget would reduce the NYPD budget by a billion dollars. Um, Councilmember Holden repeated that number just now, and Commissioner, you then repeated it back to him. But advocates and budget analysts knew then it wasn't true. And Commissioner Shea, I think I heard you say in your testimony today that the budget contained $417 million in reductions, uh, about $420 million if we count the DHS ships as well as cuts. So did I hear that correctly, that the cut was $417 million in the budget and not a billion? Yes, you did. And I can have my budget director follow up with you in a second. Great. So, but even that number, the 417 million significantly overstates the actual reduction in NYPD spending because commissioner, as you said, the purported NYPD savings relied heavily on a $354 million cut to overtime, which budget watchdogs from the IBO to the Citizens Budget Commission knew was overblown. And we've learned that you've already spent the full amount budgeted for overtime in just the first seven months of the year. And if we project forward based on actual spending to date, you'll overspend the overtime budget by $180 million. What that means in total is that the reduction of the NYPD budget was only $240 million. In other words, we're spending $760 million more on policing than the mayor, the NYPD, and the speaker told the public and the media last June. It's impossible to believe plans for reform when we just aren't telling the truth about what's really happening. So um, I wanna ask about one data point that's not reflected in this chart. Um, Commissioner or Deputy Mayor, can you tell me the amount that New York City spent on court settlements for charges of abusive policing last year? Uh, we'll get that for you. I have a rough idea, but let's not guess. We'll get that for you. But but I want to take the opportunity. The FY20 to the record. The FY20 number, Deputy Mayor, which I think you know because it was in the materials you gave us, was two hundred and forty million dollars. The full amount, the full two hundred and forty million of what was actually reduced in this year's budget. That's what we spent in FY20 on settlements. Two hundred and forty million dollars. So. That's what's really happening this year. We did not meaningfully reduce the NYPD budget and we did not tell the truth about it. Oh, I, you now, know I don't agree. I, I wanna get my questions in. I'm, with respect, I'd like to get my questions in about this coming year's budget because we could disagree about what's in last year's budget. I'm just giving the public the numbers you've given us. But now we're proposing to increase policing next year by another 196 million while cutting sanitation, parks and youth programs. And I'm worried that's not even the full increase. So I just have two questions about next year's budget. First, is there a plan to hire 475 new school safety agents? At the hearing on school safety, the most honest comment felt like the admission by a DOE senior staffer that we're planning for that. Can you commit that that's not happening? Well, the statement by that person, which was immediately corrected by deputy chancellor was inaccurate. Can you commit that the NYPD is not going to no, hire? No, what we said was it was a, it was something that was not in the preliminary budget and it was being evaluated and would be evaluated but and no you, decision so, had been made. But let's so go back to the have. adoptive budget. You said it might be in the executive budget. We don't know yet. Many things may be in the executive budget or okay. it may not be. Okay, so you won't commit not to hire 475 new school safety agents. I, I won't commit to hire. 475 new school agents. Okay, my last- No, no, question. let's go back to the, let's go back to the adoptive budget. I have one more, I just, one we more really important question. Have an agreement. We actually did have an agreement. I'm expired. And there was, there was a, there was, at no point in time did anyone say, there's a billion dollar expense cut in the adoptive, but it's just not true. You know okay. that on that I sheet, there's going to be, there's look going to be, that you knew that a significant portion of this was capped. You knew that a significant portion of it was shifting school safety agents over a two year period. That was the agreement. We shifted all the responsibilities and those things are happening. Yes, the overtime budget, yes, the overtime budget is a significant reduction. It is 40% below where it was over the past five years and significantly both below you that. Told us it was going to be $354 million of cut and it's only going to be $154 there, there, million. There were, cut. There $180 million more is being spent. And I just, I would invite people to go to the, to check out my chart because it's been really hard to get real good information. But like all I did 
was take this chart that City Hall and the Speaker gave the council and gave the budget. Uh, if people will go to the bit.ly I gave before, will go to my Twitter, you'll see just what's in here, what we were told by the administration. You'll see what was actually in the budget and you'll see what's really happening. There is a $154 million cut if you project forward from the actuals on overtime, but that is $180 million less than was in the budget. So my last question is this though, because I do just wanna ask quickly, um, you're bringing us this reform plan today. Have you projected what it would increase the NYPD budget by? How much more in police spending uh, would we, should we expect that you're going to bring us in the executive budget or in the future to implement this so-called reform plan? Look, as I, as I answer to the chair, we need to work together on deciding what the priorities are here. The biggest increases in here are actually going to be at CCRB, and that's pretty apparent. If there are resources that we need as part of that oversight, we'll obviously have that conversation with you as the budget continues. So just to wrap up. I'm sorry, we... I'm sorry council member, we have to stick to the clock. We're, we're well over. Um, thank you very much for your questions. We'll turn to the public advocate now, followed by council member Cabrera. Time starts now. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Um, Terea Starnes and Jeffrey Whitehead. Uh, those are two people I went to high school with who were shot and killed while I was in high school. I still remember discussing uh, how Terea's bullet hit one of her teeth and ricocheted to her brain. And I remember when they announced uh, Jeffrey Whitehead had accidentally shot himself with a gun he was playing with. The first gun I saw actually was in a Brooklyn Tech high school. At the same time, uh, I remember being harassed by police. I remember being arrested, waiting for a train to go to Wright Playland. I also significantly remember because we had a mixture of folks, the way the officers treated myself and others of Dr. Hugh and our white students. I remember as I began to go to school, Dominique Sylvester, I didn't know him, but one of the rooms in Brooklyn Tech was named after him because he was shot and killed. And I didn't realize how young he was until I went back as an adult and saw him. And I remember thinking then I, that when I grow up, I wanna try to do something to change this because it doesn't make sense to have so much policing in communities and still gun violence. So, Councilmember Holden, I just want to say I do not need more people to tell me that the problem here is that we're not being arrested enough and we're not being incarcerated enough. Please stop doing it. I understand fully that law enforcement has a role to play, and I appreciate that from them. When there are bullets flying and we ask them to run into the bullets to protect, I appreciate that. And I'm saddened when I hear that they're shot and harmed. But I hope from the beginning that this discussion will be about reforming and reimagining public safety, not just the emphasis on reforming police. I've come to the conclusion that that is where we've been wrong for so many years. The Minneapolis Police Department had most of the reforms that we would want to see before George Floyd was killed. I remember Alex, who didn't want to give up his chain in the 90s and was killed for it. The people who are dying and their mothers who are mourning look like me and mine. I appreciate the work of Wes Moore, Alva Rice, Jennifer Jones Austin, I always have, but there were many people I believe intentionally left off of this discussion who have been working on these issues for a very long time. Chair Adams, I very much appreciate your opening statements and how you're conducting this meeting. Dean, Deputy Mayor, I appreciate you saying that this is a beginning. I've been doing this for about 11 years now, and so there's been a lot of beginnings. And what frustrates me is not this plan, because the basis of the plan actually is pretty good. But it would have been awesome if this came seven or eight years ago, so we can be much further in figuring out the plan in its entirety. And that's so much of the frustration. 
I appreciate the advanced peace model that I was happy to stand with the mayor on. But there's so many people who are dying. <laughs> Our communities are sandwiched between gun violence and over-policing. And if they did ask about the over-policing, they'll get under-policing. Commissioner, I appreciate the apology that you gave because it was meaningful. And you said that communities are asking for more police, and I often believe that. The problem I have is the fervor and the energy when that is said is not heard when they are begging for mold and rats not to be in their apartments and for doors that lock and cameras so that mothers and grandmothers aren't murdered. And when they're asking for health, and when we look at the lines of who is lined up for food, you can't tell if it's a food line or a vaccine line or, or, or to get a testing line. And being told that has nothing to do with public safety. So please, the question is what makes a community safe? And where are those resources as we are trying to increase the NYPD 10 at 6% and decreasing DYCD 10%. What message is that sending? Pat Lynch is using the blood of black people and the pain of mothers to tell us that all we need is additional police. Although I went to a, 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 a scene where there was a mass shooting, but there was a police officer on the a corner when it happened, there was a police car a shooting of a young man in Queens with a police officer almost 10 yards away. So the question is, what else is needed and how we're funding those things? We have a great opportunity right now. Tens of thousands of New York City people have died from coronavirus. More on the state level. If we cannot use this opportunity to not go back to normal, to put down a system that really works, at least in memory of people that we've lost for across the board, that is the only silver line that we have. Let's use this opportunity wisely. From Corona to gun violence, people are dying and they're black and brown and it hurts. <laughs> Remember this through high school to right now. And if policing and incarceration could have worked, it would have already. We are apologizing 30 years later for what we did to communities 30 years ago. Let's not do that again. The knee jerk reaction doesn't work. There are risks to the plans we are putting forward. But what we're doing now has risks as well. We have said that gun arrests are up. We have said incarceration is up. So what else are we doing? We know there are diminished returns to simply putting police on the ground. We know that. So I don't have any questions. I'm just pleading with all of us to move from out of our corners and really redefine this thing because the nation watches what New York City is doing. And we all have our parts to play. And I really mean that. But communities are hurting and they're looking for answers. So they'll grab whatever is there. Let's give them more than what we've given them from the past 30 years. Please. I've been to funerals for police officers, for civilians. They look remarkably the same in pain. Thank you. Thank you. I, I will just echo thank you I, I there obviously is nothing that we're going to disagree with in that statement and we just need to continue as you did yesterday with the mayor um to address these challenges to implement this plan but recognize that we need to go through and we need to do it immediately next up uh, will be council member brannon followed by Councilmember Cabrera and Councilmember Rosenthal. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council. Um, I, I'll be very brief because I know there's a lot of my colleagues who want to ask questions. I wanted to get an idea of the, the cuts that were made last year, how that impacted 
the um, the NCO program, the neighborhood policing program, which w w seemed to be a pretty popular program, um, but wanted to get a, a sort of granular idea of how the cuts that we made affected that. Yep, I'm going to turn it to uh, a new chief of department to be, Chief Rodney Harrison, and then uh, Christine, you can follow up on the budget side. So uh, thank you for that question, uh, Councilman. And uh, I had an opportunity being part of the police department, being the chief of patrol, as well as the chief of detectives. And uh, I was here when we created neighborhood police and working with Chief Monahan. And I saw some great success uh, throughout the city uh, regarding building relationships, uh, working hand in hand with the community that we're here to serve and make sure that's that's uh, very important. And uh, public safety was being addressed. And, uh, you know, one of the things that's uh, maybe being missed here is the importance of public safety. And that's what neighborhood policing was all about. Then during the uh, 2020 campaign where we kind of got hit with this pandemic, uh, we saw some of the struggles with neighborhood policing and we had to uh, kind of fall back regarding how we Hello. police the city in 2019 with the strengths of neighborhood policing and working with the community. And as a chief of detectives, some of the struggles that we observed were people were reluctant to come forward. They were scared to talk to us. They were scared to go forward with a lot of the investigations that um, we probably would have solved in 2019. So um, one of the things you saw was a lot of violence occurring. Some of my clearances were struggled uh, and those numbers dipped. And neighborhood policing really is a pillar within the NYPD because we can't do our job if we don't have the, the residents of this great city on our side. And in order for us to keep the city safe, it starts with relationships. It starts with dialogue. It, gets with, it starts with knowing one another, uh, knowing your local law enforcement officers and your commanding officers and working with all the residents that, uh, that touch the different communities um, that we're here to protect. So yeah, we saw some struggles in, in 2020 when it came to neighborhood policing 2021 we're going to make sure we rebuild it uh, make it stronger get back to our build a block meetings um, i have a great executive staff in juanita holmes and uh, dave barrier and kathy o'reilly that have neighborhood policing in their bureau and uh, we're going to get it back up and running and we're going to make sure that uh, there's a, a strength in relationships that uh, we kind of lost in uh, during the pandemic And building on what the chief said, I think what's paramount to remember is that to enable the neighborhood to happen, uh, the department was provided with additional headcount and with resources for civilianization. Uh, while we've really worked with regard to the reduction in the budget, which with a combination of the expense resources directly to our budget and the $537 million capital cut, uh, was a billion dollars directly to our budget. And then additionally, as the deputy mayor mentioned, uh, additional transfers that are anticipated to happen. Uh, we have been working to, to try to reduce overtime, but that impacts the resources we have to do everything. Uh, we have shifted resources, we've modified work schedules, and we're proactively managing overtime, but a cut of 59%, coupled with the impact of the reduction in our headcount has been challenging. And as was indicated, we are exceeding the budget um, and we'll have to continue to spend overtime on anti-crime purposes. Uh, this is appropriate and necessary for investigations. It's necessary for operational OT, including overtime to ensure the provision of uninterrupted emergency services. When we started the year, essentially our budget did not include resources for crime reduction and enhanced resources for housing and transit. 
Uh, so while we've been working and, and benefited from the fact of uh, the unintended consequence of the COVID having reduced events, which have reduced, has reduced overtime in that area, those events will return. And we see a sustained reduction in our overtime budget with the cut in fiscal year 21. So while the budget does grow between the current year and next year, we have to take into account that we will have uh, events returning and we do need to have the resources so that commanding officers can fill gaps that they have as a result of not having the same level of resources they previously had. And ultimately the goal is to maintain public safety and the provision of core public services that tie very much into being able to continue the foundational um, improvements and efforts that have been made for community policing and elsewhere in the department. And I'm just going to add that the goal here is to enhance, and Chief Harrison said, the goal is to enhance neighborhood policing. And I know the police commissioner will say it repeatedly, constantly, customer service, all these initiatives, everything we're talking about is to enhance that. It's about community relations. Can't say it better than the chief. So just really quick. So are we, I mean, it's, it sounds like we're talking like the NCO program was sort of put on pause, is that, I mean, or, or were they just sort of dispatched elsewhere or? So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll take that question. And it's not on pause, but unfortunately there was some setbacks, uh, once again, because of social distancing and being able to get out there and uh, work hand in hand is, is, uh, was a little bit of a struggle. Uh, some of the setbacks regarding uh, financial concerns that uh, the NYPD had to face. Um, that also uh, kind of hurt us as well because of uh, attrition and some other things where uh, we lost a lot of uh, uniform members of the service uh, due, to, due to retirement. But once again, it's just, I want to reassure you that we're going to uh, make sure going forward that the neighborhood policing philosophy is a team effort. It's going to be something that we're going to make sure that all residents of the city know who the neighborhood coordination officer is. Uh, I uh, bring issues or concerns to their attention and make sure we're working together to address them. And that's one of the things that I'm really looking forward to uh, taking on this new endeavor as the uh, chief of department. Right, Thank you. This, this is about enhancing neighborhood policing and how we move forward. And it's throughout, the community engagement is throughout this plan. It's throughout all the public discussions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. We'll now turn to Council Member Cabrera, followed by Council Member Rosenthal, and then Council Member Barron. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your leadership, uh, Commissioner, uh, First Deputy Mayor, uh, and uh, everyone here present today. I One of my proudest moment in the council was working alongside with council member, back then council member and now public advocate, Germani Williams in the Cure Violence Program. The reason I mention it is because as we looked at the numbers, we had the lowest numbers in terms of crime as of February of last year. And a large, part of that I attributed to the Cure Violence Program. And, and I'm preparing that context to ask you, uh, First Deputy Mayor, uh, to see and explore the possibility of doubling uh, the funding for Cure Violence Program. We know they work. Uh, what we're finding in our district, right here in the Bronx and Brooklyn and so forth, is that though they're making a huge impact uh, their range due to the lack of funding. And we're grateful for the funding that they have, but it's just simply not enough for the bandwidth that they need. They, need. they take care of 10 blocks, but the reality is they're, they're doing more, much more than those 10 blocks. But we have gaps in the districts. And, and I know we started uh, this week with the VANS uh, program. Very glad that we got that going. But what if we can imagine uh, doubling the amount of the funding for Cure Violence Program? And what would that look like? I, I truly believe that we will see 
we will see the numbers uh, drastically change. We know it works. To, as a matter of fact, it's the most successful cure violence program in all the nation, hands down. And so we have something that is working. Why not expand it? I think, and at the end of the day, the amount of funding that they need to be able to expand it. And when I mean expansion, I'm talking about doubling it. I know we're talking about 27, 28, maybe $30 million more. But when you see the level of impact and what we're expanding so many other things in the city, I think that we will get a great return. So I'm just curious as to your thoughts about uh, the possibility of doubling uh, the funding from the Cure Violence Program. Look, my, my thoughts are it has been very successful. Um, it's, it, it, we need to, we are expanding, we're doubling, we committed to a doubling of the workforce. There's already, and you certainly have participated in this, a significant increase from where it was in 2013, barely existed. Uh, to where we are now, and we look, and and it's part of this community relations. It's part of restorative justice, which again is throughout the pages and pages of the plan. Are we opening to further doing that? Well, yes, we did it yesterday with the mayor and the public advocate announcing an expansion and a different model, but basically very similar to Cure Violence, which I know is actually going to be in one of, in your community. One of your neighborhoods will actually be, be the beneficiary of a new and innovative approach to Cure Violence, taking it to a different level to see how we, to, to see if we can even be more successful. So are we willing to have this conversation with you? Yeah, I'm happy to start this right after there. And I want to thank you, uh, and I want to thank the administration, the public advocate, uh, and the speaker. Uh, and indeed, uh, in the 46th precinct, uh, we're going to have the program. I salute you for it. Uh, I'm just my level of eagerness and uh, optimism uh, regarding the fact that it works so well uh, that I think is little money. Uh, compared to the, the results that we would get. So appreciate uh, your consideration. Uh, we started with 6 million back uh, some years ago and uh, we have greatly increased it, uh, but uh, looking forward to uh, the expansion of it uh, and getting a tremendous return, which at the end of the day, the return is save lives and to see our young people uh, having a pathway uh, to success. Thank you so much. And I think I'll be the first one to finish on time, Madam Chair. Well, and, and I'm just going to add, and you're hearing it from the Commissioner, I think you're hearing it from all of us responding, and you heard it in my opening remarks, all of this, we are, we recognize the urgency, and how much we have to accomplish and how quickly we have to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councilmember Rosenthal, followed by Councilmember Barron and Councilmember Miller. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Adams, for your extraordinary opening statement. Um, your pain is, is felt and clear and the same uh, to public advocate Jamani Williams. Your pain is palpable and uh, it, I hope, I hope the people who need to hear it and feel it really did. Um, I have a couple of questions. The first is, um, you know, as we talk about police reform, I'm wondering if this extends to the um, sexual uh, violence division, um, the sex crimes unit. And, you know, I'm wondering if your Commissioner Shea um, and, and Deputy Mayor Fulahan interested in really addressing the issues that were raised in the DOI report from 2018. Um, we did pass some legislation uh, encouraging you to, to follow those recommendations, but we've not seen the trauma-informed training that has to happen. For example, we've not seen the increase in the number of detectives um, and I raise it because this morning I did do 
the uh, I did join the mayor uh, in his advisory about the DV, the NYPD and the DV programs, but I saw the words trauma informed education over and over again, and I'm hard pressed to believe that those words reflect how the advocates describe trauma informed, which is like a 10 day training that involves trust building and you know walking a day in the shoes of uh of survivors um so so there's a lot packed in there um also since then we've been waiting i don't know where we are on trying to get to best practices for the special victims division um we were gonna hire a consultant i i, I think uh one of the advocates was able to sort of set that up and, and it was pursued. I don't know if that's going on. I don't know if perhaps the administration, Deputy Mayor Foulihan, you'd be willing to take on this expense of doing a real best practices analysis of the NYPD SVD. There's a shop um, at the Research Triangle in North Carolina that does this work it is their expertise. And um, perhaps we can use this moment in time to actually do that work. Um, the second comment, and this is a little bit of a throwaway because I really wanna hear the answer uh, to the special victims division issues. Um, you know, in, in uh, your budget director, who I think is amazing and have very deep respect for, was talking about the necessity of overtime and um, you know, juggling sort of how do you manage, you know, dealing with crime and 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 reducing overtime. I just want you to know that in my district, I have the Colum the Columbus statue in, in the Columbus Circle. And at every moment of the day, because I've gone by at different times of day. There's a police car with two officers sitting in the circle um, with its whoops whoops going on. And I, every time I see it, I get just a tiny bit uh, of a pit in my stomach that this is how we're spending overtime money. And it's this money that could be going to cure violence programs, restorative justice, all these other things we're talking about. And to hear you say like, oh, we just can't cut back on that overtime. Like, um, I urge you to go back and do a detailed analysis of where you're spending the overtime now and whether or not there aren't some areas that you could uh, cut back on. So those are my two questions. Thank you very much. Ron, you want to jump in, special victims? No, listen, and uh, listen, Chief Harrison is terrific. And he came in, he's brought uh, issues to the advocates, to myself. We've tried to follow up. Look, his heart is in the right place. I'm not talking about Chief Harrison. He's terrific. I think he's trying to do uh, what needs to be done. But, but Commissioner Shea, this really rests at your feet. We started talking about this in 2018, and I've not heard you say that you believe uh, in the uh, problems that were raised in the DOI report, and I've not seen your commitment to doing these three things about training and um, staffing levels, um, case management. You know, really, I'm sorry, sir, um, but, and I know you have a lot on your plate, but we've met just too many times for you not to know the answers to these questions. And if you'd like the answers to the questions, they'll be provided right now. Rodney? Councilwoman, uh, thank you once again. Uh, it's always a, a good to see you. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with you since I've taken over the Chief of Detectives. Regarding uh, your concern about the uh, trauma-informed uh, sexual assault training, just to let you know, we're not using FETI anymore. I'm sure you're very familiar with that. The last training that we had regarding that was in March of 2020. And uh, right now we have 217 of our 256 investigators trained. Um, right training now we're in the- what? 
I mean, one of the bills asked you, the NYPD, to lay out exactly what the training would entail. And you're supposed to issue an annual report on that. I haven't seen what the training, I mean, maybe I missed the report, but last time I checked. So, so I'm so sorry out. to go back and forth with you and you know how much respect I have for you, Commissioner Harrison, it's not about you. I think that it's Commissioner Shea who makes the final decisions about how detective, um, moving people to first class detective, how that runs, you know? And we've talked about this ad nauseum and I'm not gonna continue, but you know, we all know that homicide is the cool unit. So everyone gets promoted to detective there. Why would anyone want to join SVD? We've lost first uh, level detectives there. There's been no increase. So I, I don't know. I, um, it's hard. It's hard to hear this again. It's hard to hear the same old answers again. We've just been in too many meetings for there to be the same answers. I don't know. Uh, First Deputy Mayor Foulihan, do you have any thoughts about this? I think you and I met about the DOI report. Look, um, and no disrespect. I mean, seriously, Chief Harrison, I admire you to the moon and back. Thank you. Thank you. C Councilwoman, if I could just real quickly just jump in before you uh, pass it over to the First Deputy Mayor. If you just take a look at every single uh, time there was a promotion, and I really uh, took pride in this. Somebody from special victims, be it a lieutenant, be it a sergeant, be it an investigator, was on that list. Uh, sometimes it was two investigators. So we really have uh, jumped leap years regarding the importance of uh, making uh, special victims one of the pristine investigative units within the Detective Bureau. We That's have the awesome. Best How many first grade detectives are there right now? Last yeah. time I checked, there were three. But right now it's it, it's um, it is at I have it at four right now, which is still a number that we need to uh, improve on, you know. And I've shared some of the concerns about uh, people coming into special victims. It's it's not work for everybody. It's a very difficult job of investigating some of these uh, crimes, um, sex crimes, or even child abuse crimes. So. Um, the, the most important thing, Councilwoman, is we want the right people conducting these investigations. We don't want to just grab people and put them in there. We want to make sure yeah. that people- I, I know, violent. this has been your work <laughs> for seven years I've been there, and I know this is your job. So of course you want to get the right people. And look, I, I, deterred the, I defer to the um, advocates to say what the qualifications of those right people are. So, right, of course, that's their job, that's your job. Mm -hmm. I understand that. Uh, Chair Adams, I, I mean, if I don't want to use up too much time if we're not going to get new answers. Um, yeah, oh. I appreciate that, Councilmember Rosenthal. And we are being asked to adhere strictly to the clock. So, I'm going to thank you for your question. But and let, uh, me, let me jump in. If I may jump in and I'll do it quickly, um, we care deeply. You're, you're clearly hearing that you participated with the mayor on, on victims assistance this morning. Um, that in the report, I can hand it over to Chelsea to do more. But look, you're asking additional questions, and we're and I I'm sincere in this. We're happy to sit down with the commissioner, have a conversation. If, if you think there's something we're missing in best practices, I know the department, I know the commissioner, I know the chief, they're always going to be open and having that conversation. If there's something we can do, we'll do it. Hey, Dean. Yeah, Dean, I could just jump in and answer a couple of the questions too. I mean, regarding uh, SVD reports, we comply with the law, so they're posted online. I encourage not just <laughs> Councilwoman <laughs> Rosenthal, but anyone that's interested, you can read them. Uh, they're regarding mediocre the sexual at best, oh. sir. They're mediocre at best. Yes, they comply with the strict definition of the law, but does it move the ball forward? No. I'm sorry, I wasn't done, Councilwoman. I'm sorry. Sure, uh, RT, regarding RTI, the sexual assault review that was recommended by the advocates, 
you know, I got to give Rodney credit. I got to give Mike King credit uh, and everyone, the whole team at uh, Special Victims. They are uh, really, you know, incredibly dedicated to the survivors of these uh, complaints that they get. Uh, they took the step to have the uh, RTI do the review. It is already underway and it, we expect it to be completed by this fall. And I think Rodney spoke of the, uh, you know, Dean, the dedication uh, regarding the promotion. Special Victims uh, is strongly advocated for by Rodney. Those, all those uh, recommendations come directly to me and we have made sure that they um, have received uh, more than their fair share of promotions as we spread them throughout this agency. But thank you for your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm sorry, Councilmember, we have to move on. Um, Councilmember Barron, you're up next, followed by Councilmember Miller and Councilmember Reynoso. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. I have to make sure that I go and find your opening remarks because all of my colleagues have cited that. So I have to go back. I wasn't here for all of the hearing, but I'm glad that I have this opportunity now. We have to recognize that the history of this country, and yes, I'm going back into the past, although people seem to not wanna address things in the past and just wanna move forward. But the history of this country is such that they stole the land from the Native, Native Americans and imprisoned and captured and kidnapped Africans and brought them here and used their unpaid labor to get to the point where we are now without any compensation. The police department in its foundation was established to maintain that system that used the unpaid labor and in fact captured those who were running from enslavement because they wanted to maintain the economic system of this country. They began to then criminalize certain acts that had before been misdemeanors, such as if you stole a pig after slavery ended, you were now incarcerated. Before, if you had stolen a pig because you needed to provide for your family, you would be given a fine. So with this, with this move towards establishing the NYPD, acts that had been for, before been misdemeanors were now criminalized. Why does crime happen? Crime happens for many reasons. Some of it are people who have mental health issues. Others are people who are in poverty and don't have the ability to get those other uh, resources through so-called legal means. And then there's also, of course, the issue that the system has not provided basic needs to people in our country. The police department now is engaged in this uh, policy of getting this reform package, the reform program to respond to the executive order. And I do believe that much of what is being given to us is simply to respond to that executive order and not anything on which we can rely. Well, Councilwoman, why would you say that? Let's go back to the record. The police department on record has repeatedly lied to this body about practices that they say that were implemented in their policies that were being enacted. I go back to the case of them telling us, oh, we're not putting two rookies together. Uh, we're always gonna make sure we have an experienced partner on that team. I don't know how many other people remember it. I remember it. And subsequent to that was when we found out that was not happening with the death of Akai Gurley by the officer who was not following policy, not following training. So this message of we're going to improve our training and we're going to make sure they follow policy has not been demonstrated in the past to be something that we can rely on the NYPD to do. Uh, I believe that the actions in this plan are politically uh, motivated to be able to just say that this is what we're going to do. The meetings that were held in the community were not welcoming to those persons and organizations that were critical of the NYPD. And I got that from organizations that told me they were unwelcomed in those gatherings. And we also wanna recognize that um, there's not been an ability for people to really demonstrate fully what they would want to see. I, in my comments to the body, to the group that came to talk to me said, we will not get any place as long as we now have a commissioner who said 
when he was, yes, and I'm going to say it again, you always say, oh, I knew you were going to ask me that, yes. When Commissioner Shea was the uh, chief of crime control, quote, I do not believe that NYPD officers treat black communities any differently than they treat white communities, end quote. Now, recently I hear he's had an epiphany and yes, there have been differences and this plan is gonna make sure that as we move forward, we have a better interaction. So my first question, and I see I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna hold off on that question and simply say that as we move forward to create a new model for providing safe communities, it needs to involve those community-based organizations that have, been, that have an established record of being effective in getting results in their community. We need to put resources and finances into the mental health issues that community members face and provide the social services that people need so that they can move beyond this subsistence level that of living fun. to be able, thank you, to be able to uh, provide themselves with jobs that are reasonable. And what we need is an elected civilian review board, not one where the members are appointed by the mayor, appointed by the police department and by the city council. Uh, so if the commissioner would like to explain his epiphany, I would appreciate that. And I support the comments of my colleague, Brad Lander, when he talked about the fact that there was no reduction in the head cut, the head count, of the NYPD, and yet you are still asking for more money. Thank you. I'll jump in. I, I would like to say, and we've known each other a long time, that- Yes, that, from Albany, yes, where much of the same things happened, yes. But but we, what we, have, what we have put forward in these plans is about trans, serious and transformative change. And we're happy to, we're happy to just defend, I'll be quick. We're happy to work with you, any of you, and we recognize it's just one point on this. And, and I will say the commissioner, and it's worth reading, the letter that begins the second report is a clear apology. So it is clearly in there, and that's the statement by the commissioner on behalf of the whole department that we all are accepting the very goals that we talk about, the decriminalization of poverty, the ending of racializing police, every single one, of these, of, of the goals that we're articulating, the forms that we're committing to, and the future work we're, the immediate future work we're willing to do with you, our recognition of that history, our, our complete recognition. We know we haven't gone far enough. We're willing to work with you to go to go to that, to go that extra distance. Thank you. Mr. Shea, Commissioner Shea, would you like to explain your epiphany of when you realized that there was a difference between the way black and white communities were treated? When did you come to this realization? Yeah, Councilwoman Barron, thank you. And, and just really two or three points, and I'll save that for last because I think it's most important. You made the statement about um, certain people being excluded from the process and from the meetings. If that I happened, said they felt unwelcome. I didn't say they oh, were excluded. Oh, I, I, okay. That, that's, uh, and you're right. And, and that was certainly not our goal. Regarding the quote and the epiphany, I, I didn't have an epiphany. Um, you know, I'll go back to the quote when you didn't like my comment probably three or four years ago. I stand by the comment. The question you, you asked me at the time, and I don't remember the exact, and I'm sure you have it, was that the police department of the NYPD is a racist police department that goes out there. I don't agree with That's that. That's not now. my question. That was not my question. Go back and read the record. Yeah, I, I don't agree with that point uh, now either. Um, but that's not to say that the police department um, or law enforcement in general doesn't have to own its mistakes. It's not an epiphany, uh, but I thought it was important that, you know, there's a lot of different sides. And I'll go back to Jamani Williams' statements earlier, and I give him credit, and, and I agree with everything he said, um, you know, from the heart, speaking about tough things that have to be done. And that goes for everyone on this call. And I, and I don't think it does anyone justice or helps the balance of where we have to go to continue in our historical positions of let's let's be on opposite sides. I think we need more to the middle councilwoman, and that includes me, in terms of um, hearing people, listening to people, making sure that I do the best job as police commissioner for the city of New York. 
but never uh, last week, last year, or today did I have to, um, you know, have an epiphany about the role that law enforcement has played. And it is a complicated role with people of color. And, uh, you know, I think my words stand for what I have said on that um, several times now. Thank you, Mr. Thank Bruce. you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Commissioner. We'll now turn to Council Member Miller, followed by Council Member Reynoso and Council Member Rodriguez. Time starts now. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much, Madam Chair, for your leadership here uh, this morning and, and what you've demonstrated uh, during your time as, as Chair of Public Safety. Uh, Commissioner and First Deputy, thank you for being here uh, to you and the rest of the team. Um, a lot of this, this morning's conversation has, has been uh, um, su surrounded around the area of reforms. And, 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 and I would submit that for my seven plus years in this council that we have, uh, I've spent on this committee and with my colleagues, not just on the committee, but throughout the council, spent significant time around police reform uh, and, and different uh, initiatives uh, that would address uh, policing in, in, in the city of New York, particularly around communities of color. So I would submit that we uh, remain uh, committed uh, uh, to those issues and, and that we want to see those issues move forward. Now, while uh, as, as Councilman Barron articulated that the, the rush is based upon uh, the, the governor's mandate to have something by the 1st of April, mm -hmm. um, certainly that's not something um, that, that, that's realistic considering that all of the things that we've talked about over the past years um, uh, incrementally are happening, but at the same time uh, continue not to be addressed. Also mentioned uh, the lack of engagement and where those who participated in this process came from within those uh, communities. And, and, and sometimes uh, you know, we have to step outside of our comfort zone and hear from those who aren't necessarily speaking the truths that, that we want to hear. And that is something that I experienced in that. And so I say all that portion to say that I do not want to get away from what has led us here and, and the things that we've talked about in the department particularly as it relates to the budget, the civilianization uh, or, or the lack thereof and, and, and how uh, that narrative of the budget has now got co-opted and, and, and does not, is not necessarily coming from those who are most impacted by right. uh, uh, law enforcement. Right. And, and, and perpetuated these injustices on those communities. Right. And, and, we, and, and then we're just looking at the, the low hanging fruit and having conversations about and, and, and criminalizing school safety agents, which are black and brown women who sometimes are the only semblance of our community that these children see day in and day out or traffic enforcement. That is part of the tra transparency or lack thereof that, that the, the NYPD has, has put on us to say that we are this majority black and brown force and, and you take away the traffic agents and you take away the school safety agents and they continue to be white males, right? And, and, and so let's be real about who we really are. Let's continue to be engaged because there are things that work, but there are also things that don't work. Let's talk about how do we deliver services in an equitable and efficient way. That's what we want. But most importantly, we want to be treated with dignity and respect. We don't want all of these new nuances based on something that happened last year when folks of, of, of color have been treated disproportionately in a negative way for, for generations, right? And, and, and we know what that is. But at the same time, um, you know, we're, we're jumping to these, these, these new nuances and, and, and not addressing civilization that we talked about for, forever, right? And that continues to happen. Um, and then just some of the things, uh, uh, and I don't want to get about, away from just the quality of life and the dignity and respect, right? We, we pass laws uh, uh, here, uh, overnight trucking and, and truck enforcement, and, and we got more trucks all over the city, which not only is it quality of life, 
but you can't send your children to school because the only places they get to park is in front of parks and trucks, right? And you go past and you got 10 and 20 tractor trailers lined up and they can snatch a child or a woman or a male from between there. It's not just, uh, you know, that they're, they're messing up the environment, but it's, 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 it's unsafe and, and no, nothing's being done about it. And there's so many different nuances that happen about quality of life and about policing that aren't being addressed here today that as we talk about a budget, how do we address those things? How do we address the fact that I know you said that we didn't have a tow truck or we didn't have somewhere to put them, but it continues to happen. Is that addressed in this year's budget? We talked about, we, we announced with the mayor late, last, late last spring about uh, expanding cure violence, particularly to South Jamaica and the 103rd precinct, which com continues to be at an all time high in gun violence, guess what? It has not happened. So the rhetoric about what we're going to do have not been put into action. Does this budget reflect action or does this budget reflect more rhetoric about what we can do? So I, I'll jump in and the commissioner may wanna add some things. Look, I, let's stick with your very last point on uh, cure violence we're talking about right now doing a really significant expansion. Let's have a conversation with you and make sure your community, your neighborhoods are getting the right kind of service they need. We're committed to doing it. If, if it's not happening, I, I give you my assurance and we'll, right after the hearing, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that we look at that and, and see that you're getting, you're getting the kind of intervention you need there. The whole plan, the whole plan, and I, I don't mean, I apologize if I'm repeating it, but all of this are about serious reforms to address the problems you're talking about. Hey, Dean, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, if, if I may, uh, 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 Madam Chair. Surveillance is a big issue when it comes to our community. And I know before uh, a commission to share, we were talking about surveillance and, 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 and the last chair, was, it was a big issue. Um, could we talk about that and the budget and, 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 and in terms of domestic terrorism, particularly as it relates to white supremacy? Uh, uh, it, it, what does the budget look like? What is happening there? Because I don't. This is a conversation that we generally have. What and what policing looks like? Can we have that conversation? Because there are a lot of folks yes. in communities of color that are very much concerned about that yes. inequity as well. Yes. Yes, we'll have that conversation. But, well, that's I expect to hear from uh, police. Uh, but I, 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 um, I'll allow the commission. I don't want to leave that out. But I have something to do with the budget, so I can say that yes, we will do that. Okay, great. And 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 uh, I, I I I see all the chiefs there, and and uh, don't want to just uh, dismiss the work that they're doing. Yeoman's work. Uh, they've been very attentive, very much so. Uh, and 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 I and and I look forward to continuing to work with them uh, and and being engaged. And I think that's what we want. We want to be engaged, but we want to be treated with dignity and respect, and and not lose sight of all the things that work, all the things that we worked on and have the narrative be changed. And if we could commit to that, continue to commit to that and not the manifesto of call your counsel, because uh, because that is it and, and get down to real work, um, th th then I'm, I'm satisfied. Commissioner Shea, did you want to add something? Yeah, I would just add, thank, uh, Councilman Miller, thank you, you know, for your support. And you've been a big supporter and, uh, uh, thank you for that. Regarding your earlier statements on uh, school safety and traffic, traffic uh, agents, and then the larger diversity issue, that's something that we heard throughout New York City when we did the, the different listening sessions. I would just say that, uh, you know, I really support, I really uh, thank you for the support of the school safety agents. I think they're the fabric of their societies. I think they do a phenomenal work. And I think they were cast in an unfair light, I, I, my opinion. Um, you know, when, when, we, when we speak of being a majority minority police department now, um, that does not include those numbers. Um, at the police officer rank, we are now uh, more than 50%. I believe it's 56%. You know, Ben next to me here, um, 
regarding uh, people of color. Um, certainly at some positions, when you talk of traffic agents and school safety agents, that is excluded in those numbers. And when you categorize civilians across the department, um, those numbers go up significantly. Um, ben, you have anything you want to add, add to that? Well, I, I just, uh, I'll just back up, you know, jump in on what you, what you said, uh, Councilman Miller, you and hey, I, ben, how are you, sir? all right, good to, good to see you. Thank you for your, for your support, as the commissioner said. But also, you know, you and I have had this conversation a number of uh, both online at council meetings, but also offline. Um, and I have to tell you, and I think you know this, uh, that that our commitment to to, you know, providing fair and equitable police services, you know, across the board, and certainly uh, that that includes communities of color is unconditional. And yeah, we have challenges and certainly with the crime um, um, existing in, in many of those uh, communities of color, uh, that, that certainly exacerbates the, the, the challenge that we have. Uh, but we are, you know, the shootings and, and, and so forth, as was mentioned earlier, when it comes to uh, our commitment there, it is, it is again, unconditional. Uh, and, and, and we've proven that in the amount of guns that we've taken, taken off the streets. Uh, at the same time, you know, that means, you know, what we see is that there are just an enormous amount of guns still out there. And that, that, uh, that is a real challenge for us. And certainly in the budget context, uh, it's been spoken about already, so I won't belabor it, but, but certainly uh, any cuts that we've, that we've sustained have had an impact on our ability to really uh, uh, cover. Uh, and we've had to move resources around. So it has impacted our neighborhood policing uh, commitment and philosophy in the way in which we do what we do. So, uh, but, um, you know, we, as part of, and the final thing I'll say is when, when you talk about the, the reform effort, it is building on, it really is building on uh, the progress that you, I think, are aware of that's been made in this agency over the last seven and a half years or so. Um, and, and this process is, is cumulative. Uh, and I think uh, some of the changes that have occurred so far have given us a, a solid foundation upon which to build going forward. Uh, and, and some of these issues are, you know, uh, at certainly beyond the scope of NYPD in particular and have more to do with, I think, the larger uh, issues around systemic challenges that we all know exist, and you mentioned some of those already uh, as well, in terms of housing, in terms of public health, in terms of a variety of issues, uh, mental illness, and so forth, that other me uh, members of the council have mentioned and referenced as well. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah, I want to I want to add uh, echo the comments of the the commissioner and the deputy commissioner on school safety agents. I just wanna make it very clear the respect we have for them. The new chancellor uh, has, already, has already begun the conversations um, about the transition. We're gonna work very carefully with the NYPD, the Department of Education. We're gonna involve the union. We're gonna make sure that the transition is done as a way that these employees are appropriately and properly respected. That's a commitment on the whole administration. Thank you. Thank you. We will now turn to Council Member Reynoso, followed by Council Members Rodriguez and Council Member Deutsch. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, for uh, the great work that you're doing in this hearing. Uh, I guess for me, uh, it's pretty straightforward. I just want to make sure the, the public knows that the safest, the safest neighborhoods in New York City are the ones with the least amount of cops, but they have the most secure housing, they have the most secure education, the most secure jobs, the most secure health care. There are all these other resources that are plentiful in neighborhoods that are safe, um, that are not in ours. What we do have is over-policing or more cops. Uh, if cops were to drive crime down, uh, then you would assume or uh, suspect that they would be in these uh, low crime neighborhoods, but they're not um, because cops don't necessarily stop crime. And we've seen that with uh, just two recent shootings in Brooklyn where cops were uh, stones throw away from incidents um, and the incidents still happen. So they don't necessarily stop crime. They might respond to them, but they don't necessarily stop them. Uh, but I guess the core issue here is that, remember, the safest communities are the ones that have all these other resources, not policing, and that we start thinking about 
what we want our communities to look like, whether we want a high quality education for our children, access to real jobs, union jobs um, in our neighborhoods, uh, whether our housing is dilapidated or dignified in any way. Those are the conversations that we should be having, not talking about needing more police to address these issues that are more that are rooted um, in poverty and that are the real cause of, of crime, which is poverty ultimately. Um, I actually think that we're just buying time until we get a new mayor and um, at some point a new commissioner as well. I just don't think that this police department in the seven and a half years that I've been a council member has been serious about reforms. There are things that they've done that are just unacceptable. Um, so at this time, you know, I'm not going to um, just m move with the theater and ask questions that I know for sure that they'll answer well because they're prepared, but don't really execute um, and don't affect change in my neighborhood or affect change in your neighborhood. Um, but I will ask about something that I think is meaningful. Uh, and, and it's about schools and metal detectors. Our schools are more a reflection of a prison or jail system than it is uh, institutional, uh, like educational institutions. And I wanna ask how many schools are currently have metal detectors uh, in our city. Where are those schools located and where are the metal detectors located? And what are the resources that are put forth by the NYPD to not only maintain the metal detectors, but also man those metal detectors with more school safety agents? Um, and I guess those are my questions. Okay, Chief, uh, Chief Obey, is Chief Obey on? I'm sorry, Commissioner, uh, who would you like us to unmute? I, I don't know if she is on. She may not be uh, Chief Obey. And if not, we'll have to get back to you, the councilman with specifics on uh, the number of schools, the number of metal detectors. You know, it's greatly diminished. I apologize. And I know it's set forth in policy agreements with the Board of Ed, but I, I don't, Lola may not be on right now. I don't believe that we have uh, her on the list. Councilman, we'll have to get back to you with those specifics. And that would be manned by uh, school safety agents and not police officers. Right, right. But, but uh, school safety agents wear the uniforms of police officers. So it's just yeah. the, the perception of a, of a system that is not necessarily, you know, uh, encouraging of education but um uh yeah. I, so I agree I, guess, I agree to that and I, and I wish we were in a world where we didn't need metal detectors at all I think we all want that where kids could walk into school have a safe environment I think that's been behind the push to to limit them to when it's absolutely necessary I know Ben is yeah. Ben has a lot more expertise on this issue than I do um but we also have to make sure that we have a safe environment for the kids. That's paramount too. And I know that that's what uh, everyone wants, whether it's uh, you, whether it's with the teachers, whether it's certainly the parents. So we try, we've done a lot of good, I, I would say, uh, in recent years in, in reforming policies regarding schools to have a much, much softer touch um, to, to reforming policies of minimizing when uh, arrests so the police get involved at all to eliminating uh, to minimizing you know uh, traditional handcuffs so there's a lot of reforms that have been done in and around the schools uh, and, and you know we look forward we can follow up with you with Chief Obey um, you know for any other suggestions that you yeah have. just yeah and I appreciate that Commissioner I just um you know for the budget purposes and given the amount of attention that's being put on school safety agents and just policing, policing in school. I wish you would have been prepared for that. But I guess for my colleagues, we have these conversations in budget negotiating. And this is, uh, and the, the, what I see from elected officials on this call right now is a very different um, reality than what we have in budget negotiating. I just want folks to really focus. Vida hai, papi. Vida hai. <laughs> I really want folks to pay attention um, to what we're talking about when it comes to the resources that we actually need um, in our neighborhood. So thank you so much for, yeah. for this opportunity, I, uh, uh, Chair. I wanna, I wanna jump in and just uh, echo what the commissioner said. Uh, the, the footprint of the NYPD is very different 
We made dramatic changes over the past few years on what happens in the school, the role of the school safety <laughs> agent, the amount of suspension significantly down, <laughs> alternative <laughs> placements significantly right. down. What I, what I really think would be helpful is, is as we're doing this process of how we transform and deal with school safety agents with the new chancellor, I think it would be worthwhile having a meeting with you and actually sitting down and having the new chancellor have this conversation. Thank you, council member. We'll turn now to council member Rodriguez followed by council members Deutsch and Gibson. Time starts now. Thank you. First of all, I can say that as someone that in 1987 or 88 was arrested by the NYPD I 21st in San Nicolas Avenue after taking political science 101 and exercising my constitutional right. When I was told to move from being there giving a flyer. And I say, why should I move? And I was told, because I said so by the NYPD members of NYPD, I say, say, but I have my right. And the answer was, you don't have any right if Dominicans. I can tell you that in many occasions, I, the interaction that I have with the NYPD for many years was, you know, very bad. And I can say it's not serving in previous and current administration. And as a father of two daughters, I also can say that even though there's a lot much more work that has to be done, I also understand that under this current administration, the effort to train and retain and retrain the members, the NYPD is real by this mayor. I hope that we will continue to see more changes. And I do believe that also we need to build a balance on building, investing more on prevention to be sure that the men and women, the NYPD, they are not there to work in the underserved community with so many challenges that we have. And instead of you know going there, and yes, enforcing, I feel that it is our responsibility as a city to invest on prevention at the same time that we make the men and women, the NYPD accountable for continue improving the relationship between the police and the community. I also believe that we as a city have the responsibility to continue also funding the NYPD so that they can have the resources necessary to do the job. But I feel that all those questions related to a over budget over time in other area is legitimate question that we need to address. And I have a question, a few questions, one is, uh, on a topic of ICE, in, in my district, in Taylor Avenue, ICE went and knocked the door and there was someone with a jacket, the NYPD. I checked with the local inspector to be sure if the NYPD was or not. But the answer was no, that the NYPD was not there. However, there was someone with the NYPD jacket together as part of ICE. Has the NYPD right put something in writing denouncing ICE if it's true that the NYPD is not collaborating with ICE. Councilman. Hey, um, if you don't mind, Commissioner, if you give me like a one minute so that I need time to answer the other question. Yeah, do you want to ask the other one now and then I'll just address both? That, that's fine, yeah. So my, my, my second part is about I'm proud to see, you know, more uh, in this case Afro-American uh, leaders in the in the top leadership of the NYPD, and I know that Detective, that Chief Department uh, Harris Harrison, in the first deputy, they I know many I have many friends of mine, Dominican and Latinos, and even with you, Commission, I know that you have a very close relationship with many Latino brothers and sisters, but I do have issues. We lost Chief Pichando. However, I don't think that we have one Dominican right now with one star at the NYPD. I don't think that we have the Latino diversity in the leadership of the NYPD. I'm proud to see so many men and women inside the NYPD coming from you know, the Latinos community as the black community 
what are the steps that you are taking to be sure that there's more? I would like to see few Dominicans, few Latino, in this case, being this local, how can we have your support and the support of the first step or in the other to be sure that during this couple of months, we can see few Dominicans also being promoters as a one or two star. Yeah, I, I'll address that one first. Um, that Dan Pichardo guy really uh, left me high and dry. He was a good friend of mine. I, I love Fausto. Um, it's very important, Councilman. It really is. We heard this also over and over in the city. Uh, you know, the, 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 the good thing is that we have a, a very deep bench here and a lot of great, real strong, talented men and women um, of many ethnicities to pick from. But we heard from communities all over New York City that it's, it's real important for, for kids and people to have role models and they, and they want to have a connection with people that look and, and sound like them. Um, I could tell you that it, diversity at every rank of the department is very important to me. I could tell you that uh, we have promotions coming up this Thursday and we, you know, one of the promotions will be uh, promoted to Chief Ramundo Mundo, um, you know, but many others, uh, you know, and, and when we make those difficult decisions of who to promote, um, diversity is a key point of what I look at uh, to make sure that the re uh, representation of all levels of the department sideways and top to bottom is well represented um commissioner so i think i think i think that we're doing good in the low entry our issue is leadership i was looking at the at the hurricane of the nypd there's no and again we in, you inherit you know what you have right now and what we have seen is and i give a lot of credit credit you know i think that the first lady has been playing an important role to be sure that there's more brothers and sisters from the American community in top leadership position. But when Angelo Falcon said that New York City had 10,000 leadership position through agency and only 200 are Latinos, when Dominicans make one, almost 1 million for the 8.6, I think that there's a lot of people waiting to be promoting the detective. It's not only about it's a top, it's a, it's a difficult job. It's also about, I don't want to see anyone from the Irish, the Italian, the other ethnic group to lose a spot. But I feel that we need to understand, we have failed for so many decades. And I think again, to address the improvement of relationship between the police and the community is not only on having people at the top. I think a lot has to do to Agreed. continue with the work that the Mayor de Blasio, that I support his initiative to train and retrain the NYPD and I have seen the results in our community, but much more has been done. So, you know, I think that I hope in the next couple of months, you and the team that you have with you right now also understand that. I say, if yes, imagine right now that this hearing will be happening only without Afro-American or white testifying. Yes, think about how the Latino who made the 29% of New York City, the second larger group, it doesn't have anyone sitting with you right now at the top leadership of the NYPD. So it's a matter of time when people frustrate and say, our number is there. Why we are not in the top leadership position in the NYPD as all the agency when it can be the second larger group in New York City? Yeah, I, I, think, you're, I think you're right. I, and I do have uh, members of Latino uh, ancestry on this call. I could go to Chief Marty Morales, who's the Chief of Personnel, who's not next to me, but he's he's on. Uh, Eddie Delatore is still work with the department and others. You know that the there's like five there's, there's like five Latino in the NYPD heritage. Yeah. That's only like five that you can see right now. I, I'm agreeing with you. I'm not dis I'm not disagreeing. Um, you know that's why it was so important, and I was so so proud to appoint. Uh, Chief Phil Rivera is the highest ranking uniform member of Manhattan North to lead that entire borough. Um, so, but I agree with you. We have a lot more work to do. You are right. You are right. We need, we need, we need again, we need your support. Yep. My two daughters knowing that they've been born and raised knowing that they are black, they're Latinas, they are American. So I identify and I know that the, the chief of the department, both of the, 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 the chief that you have right there, the deputy, 
you know, I know that I can represent, they can represent my Latino community too. But I believe it is our responsibility as a city to bring a diversity in leadership. But again, I just want to be clear that in 21, New Yorkers want to see improvement of the NYPD. New Yorkers want for the NYPD to control the cost. But I also, New Yorkers believe that the NYPD needs to get all the resources you need to keep us safe. Yeah, I, I want to just also- Dean, can I just, Dean, can I just jump in? Because I didn't want to miss the first question uh, um, yeah. on the ICE issue. Listen, that's the, uh, Councilman, that's the strength of our country, really. We have very strict protocols regarding immigration, regarding not talking to people about their immigration status. I'm a first generation. Both my parents were born in Ireland and emigrated to this country. We take it very seriously. ICE is not going to be wearing NYPD raid jackets under any circumstances. We've heard this from time to time. Um, I like to you know, categorize, but I will follow up that it's a mistake and it's not true. But uh, Oleg, I have legal here that could just touch on that to really strengthen that response. But we take that extremely seriously. Commissioner, I'm gonna jump in and say that we believe you. Uh, we need to end, uh, end uh, the, the questioning by my colleague, Council Member Rodriguez, and I thank him so much. We're gonna move on okay. to, I believe, Council Member Gibson. Right. I, I, I'm just going to quickly, and I'll echo that. We have made it very clear to ICE that that's not a happen in case it ever does. So I, I just want to assure that. And, and I, I need to at least say that the plan talks about, talks about not just recruitment and, and even more intensive recruitment and not only giving additional points uh, uh, for entry, into recruitment to diversify the, the NYPD, but it also talks at the leadership rank. So we're all recognizing that and we're all committed. Councilmember Gibson. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chair Adams, uh, for leading a great hearing today. I continue to lift you and your family up in my prayers, my sister. And I want to thank uh, our first deputy mayor, Dean Foulahan, as well as Commissioner Shea and all of the executive members of the department. Uh, all of my colleagues and those who are watching, uh, been a very long hearing and I do appreciate all of the work that is being done and having this very spirited conversation. Um, I too wanna continue to lift up the families that we have just worked with who have mourned the losses of their children. Uh, in my own district back on June 29th, we lost 17 year old Brandon Hendricks who was a high school graduate on his way to college with a scholarship and he was gunned down in our community. And then July 5th, I had a father, 29 year old Anthony Robinson, who was walking down the street with his six year old daughter in broad daylight on a Sunday evening, gunned down in front of his child. The trauma that these families experience is permanent and the pain that they will live with is also permanent. So I appreciate the efforts and the acknowledgement of the deep rooted history that communities of color have experienced with policing in New York City. Yes, we have to recognize the problems and the issues as we proceed, but it's really important to acknowledge what has happened in the past. Um, I launched Operation Save Our Sons and Sisters, Operation SOS last summer, Commissioner, and I'm grateful that Chief Madry and Community Affairs joined us because we were really experiencing a high level of crime in my district alone. And we had peace rallies and marches, we had youth summits, and we engaged our CBOs, the anti-crisis management system, and all of our organizations, including the mayor's office to prevent gun violence. So with all of that being said, um, I thank Chair Adams for recognizing that in the Dinkins plan, there are a lot of pages, a lot of information that we're asking the public as well as council members to review in a matter of a few weeks before we have to vote on this. So I'm greatly concerned about that and certainly recognize the work of Jennifer Jones Austin and Arbor Rice and Wes Moore, but I do believe we have to do a lot more. Mm -hmm. I wanna ask a couple of questions. If I can get an update on civilianization and where we are. Uh, when I chaired the committee, we started at 200 
We went to 416 positions. And I know there are more positions that are currently held by uniformed officers that can be done by civilian members of the service. I also wanted to ask about the summer season. Uh, we have the ability to add more to summer youth um, and making sure we have a comprehensive youth program. So I wanted to understand probably from Chauncey Parker about efforts on the Youth Academy Saturday Night Lights, opening some of our community centers and our underutilized uh, parks and spaces in some of our school buildings. Can we get a commitment from the department to work with the council on having a robust summer youth program? I also wanted to ask about the Brownsville Safety Alliance. This was an initiative that was started by the CEO of the 73, Terrell Anderson, where you combine CBOs and city agencies collaborating to reimagine what public safety is all about. Um, I want your feedback on that. Is that a model that we could look at in other parts of the city? Because uh, certainly in the Bronx, we certainly could use that. And then the final question I have uh, relates to the <laughs> capital plan. Could you provide us with an update on some of the capital in the Bronx, namely the 4-0 precinct and Rodman Snack? Are there any updates on that? Um, and then um, just continue working with all of you and making sure that we can have these conversations very honestly and very deliberately about the work ahead, but also the challenges that we have. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Councilwoman uh, Gibson. Thanks for your support always. A lot of questions there. So Chauncey, you're first. Chauncey, if you could just keep it quick in your reply, then we'll go to Juanita. Juanita, you'll be second on the Brownsville piece, same thing. And then I'm gonna go to Marty Morales, and then last, Christine on the civilianization, Marty and Christine. So Chauncey, you're up, you got a minute. Yes, Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Gibson. Um, when I started here um, almost over a year ago, the Commissioner said the most important thing to focus on is what we can do for kids. And as a police department and committed 300 YCOs or youth coordination officers, a lot of what you're going to see this summer, you've been a major part of from the very beginning. For example, Saturday Night Lights, under the leadership of the mayor, will now expand to 100 sites. As you remember, hashtag 100 gyms, 100 um, programs beginning this summer will be available. There are currently 20. Um, there are going to be 100 across the city. Second, um, we've been working with our federal law enforcement partners at the request of Commissioner Shea to find new resources. And they've been able to dedicate asset forfeiture um, under Chief Barrer, where 15 basketball courts in public housing, including Castle oh, Hill, that are broken down, are going to be transformed into mint condition basketball courts. We're working on doing the same with soccer pitches across the city. So you're going to see, as you've asked us to do from, from our, all of our discussions, is you're going to see activities with Chief, Chief Madry, Chief Barrer, Chief Holmes across the city for kids this summer. Thanks, Chauncey. Juanita, 7-3. Hi, how are you? And, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for your question. Uh, so as far as the 7-3 precinct model, yes, that's been titled Community Solutions. That's a community solution approach that's been pushed out citywide. As far as your district, I know in the 4-0 precinct, we have Robert Galatelli, who put together a significant uh, a plan to address a location 139, and I believe between Brook and Alexander. That's been very problematic to the community. It involves the community. You have violent interrupters, uh, SOS. You have guns down, life up. You have the Bronx DA's office he's working with, local officials, Councilwoman Diana Ayala, as well as community partners, Gabe uh, De Asus, the community uh, president, uh, council president, and a lot of other organizations. And that's been pushed out citywide um, um, Councilwoman Gibson. It's something that I thought worked very well. It's something that we need. But, you know, when you talk about public safety, it is definitely a team effort. We speak a lot about our neighborhood policing teams, right? I don't like the neighborhood policing officer because it's a constant, constant fight uh, as far as the team's efforts out there. And I think a lot of people forget about that we have sectors, steady sectors on every tour. Uh, throughout the police, uh, throughout the city agency. That's also equally responsible for meeting members in the community and addressing their concerns. So I like the model in the 4-0. I like the one in the 101 precinct, but I can assure you to bring a lot of city agency partners to the table, as well as elected officials, clergy, and then naturally uh, the police department. Sitting down, looking at the problems, identifying top community concerns, prioritizing them, 
then identifying a community solution team. And after that team is identified, they devise a uh, plan of action and they deploy. And they're constantly coming back to the table with biweekly meetings just to address the concerns, see if it's working, uh, does it have to be tweaked, does it require civil litigation, or does it ultimately graduate to some criminal sanctions? But I think that soft approach starting at the bottom level with the community-based organizations and moving forward and gradually building is the key answer. Hey, Marty Morales, if you could just talk real quick on numbers of civilians and then Christine, you'll finish up. And I just got to give a plug to Chief Morales because him and his team this year, um, I don't know if everyone on the council knows this, but has been instrumental in vaccinating not only members of the NYPD, but members of New York City across the city, including in public housing. So Marty, to your and team, to you and your team, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Can you guys hear me? Yep. yep. All right, good. So Councilwoman uh, Gibson, to your question on uh, civilization, uh, since fiscal year 17, we have um, civilized 415 positions. That includes 95 evidence and property control specialists. 100 service auto workers, 100 criminal analysts, 120 police administrative aides. We also conduct uh, quarterly surveys to see if we could identify other positions. We currently identify 368 additional positions, but they have not been filled, uh, funded at this time. Christine? Yeah, you know, I'll just add to that that uh, you know, we we do we are committed to civilianization and moving it forward. As the chief just said, we don't have the funding or the headcount. Uh, for that additional 368 and, you know, understanding the city's fiscal situation, uh, we have in fact uh, ha had our uh, fiscal year 21 civilian budget cut by 700 positions. So, you know, we are trying to balance everything here. Uh, ultimately, we would like to move forward with those additional positions. Uh, council member, you also asked about two capital projects. Uh, the 40th precinct, uh, we anticipate uh, construction will be completed in November of 2022. Uh, there were some delays on capital projects tied to the pause related to COVID, but thankfully everything is moving forward. So we're on target for the November 20, uh, 2022 uh, construction completion there. And for Rodman's Neck, um, uh, the final design scope is uh, being uh, finalized with DDC, and we anticipate construction completion in the winter of 2027. And if, if I could just uh, go, actually, um say more to what Chauncey said about, uh, about youth and your question on youth and, and how it is many agencies that are gonna be involved and we wanna work with you. As you know, the mayor and our new chancellor announced that uh, PSAL will continue through the summer. So we're gonna have uh, sports through the summer and we're clearly working with DY, uh, DYCD and DOE on a more expansive uh, program for enrichment this coming summer that we clearly want to work with. Thank you. We'll turn now to council members Deutsch, followed by Levin and Powers. Time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon uh, to, the, to the entire panel. Um, so I, this is to the first deputy mayor. So um, with a lot less of a ridership in our transit system, we have seen an increase of horrific crimes occurring in our transit system. Uh, riders are getting killed, raped, assaulted. We have also seen an influx of people on our transit system with mental health issues. Since last year's budget discussion hearing, the administration and elected officials have been talking about replacing police officers with mental health professionals. Aside from just talking, what conversations had the administration had with elected officials to implement this plan? And what has the administration actually done? That's two questions. And if this administration has not done enough, then why aren't we seeing um, mental health professionals on our entire transit system? And on another question, I just want to take a different topic because I only have five minutes. In addition, we have seen a continued increase of street homelessness. What is the feedback that this administration is receiving from breaking ground as to why street homeless individuals refuse to go into shelter? 
Uh, okay, there's a lot there. Let's start with transit. And at, when I conclude, I'm gonna ask the commissioner to jump in on uh, the actual crime in the transit system. Um, well, I, I, I'm not, I'm not you know, my question is not about the actual crime right now. My actual, my question is for uh, those it crimes. Implied, it implied, it implied something about crime. Okay, so, so those crimes that are being uh, done by people with mental health issues, that's so, what I'm talking so about. So to right answer, now. but to answer your question, we did increase and we do have much more outreach on mental health teams. So I will give you the from last year's budget, exactly what it is and what was funded. In addition, though, I think one of the things you're referring to, which is in the plan and in the report, was the response at 911 and how we were going to respond and have more crisis intervention with mental health. That pilot, which involves FDMY and EMTs and health and hospitals, is happening right now. We've negotiated successfully with the unions on how to move forward with that pilot. We're doing that right now. We need to be very careful that 911 calls are answered appropriately and we're doing the a proper amount of response. So we're actually moving on that right now. We're also moving on 311 to be available in, in our transit system. Uh, that was not the case and we're quickly advancing that. So we are addressing these issues. Does more need to be done? Yes. Does more need to be in the executive budget? Absolutely. And that's going to be a conversation we're going to have with you to be able to expand the crisis intervention. Um, so we could, all, we could all agree that whatever the administration is doing, more needs to be done. Well, let, uh, but, but also, and, and the commissioner should speak to this, uh, there, was, there was a significant amount of increase of NYPD presence in our transit system. I, I'm not it's talking, uh, with all due respect, uh, First Deputy Commission, I'm not talking about the NYPD now. I want to know that if I go on the two train right now, you, or the number five train. You were talking train, about crime. You were talking about crime. I, I'm train. talking about, I'm talking, uh, my question is, I'm talking about crime that is happening from individuals who have a mental illness. Now, why is it that if I'm walking, uh, if, if I go on a two train now or the five train, um, I don't see people out there who are mental health professionals walking around and being proactive and not waiting for an incident to happen. Look, we, we respond to incidents. We are increasing outreach. We are increasing mental health teams. We are also using the NYPD. All of these things come together. But, but and uh, ho homeless, um, uh, first of all, the NYPD was taken away from... Um, from, from being out there and uh, the street that's, homeless. That's, that's not, that's not. The, we're, we're moving the prime, it, we moved it away. The prime responsibility was moved to the Department of Homeless Services, but the NYPD obviously still has a role and they still, they still perform that. I, I, I have to say, um, I'm very dissatisfied by having a conversation every single year and we had a number of conversations um, at hearings, and that's why these hearings are kind of frustrated. Well, because we, you're, you're asking for an update, so let me get you an update. No, we no, will, yeah, we will get you the, an update the, of the what update, happened in no, last the, year's budget. The update, uh, with all due respect, the update to me is, is, is nothing. There's nothing going on. But that's um, not we, sh we should be, we should have, people should see, and there should be things on social media. I haven't seen one. Uh, I haven't seen anyone putting anything on social media saying, oh, look, I am on the train and I see a mental health professional being proactive, speaking to someone on the transit system who has a mental illness. All I am seeing is uh, tweets and, and, and uh, on social media showing people with a mental illness. Our transit system should be flooded with mental health professionals taking care of those people on our transit system, as well as on our streets who have a mental health issue. I drove yesterday from my house, eight blocks. I saw two people on the street who obviously were talking to themselves and almost nearly got hit by a car. There should be people flooding our streets who are mental health professionals. Not enough is being done. With a very large budget for mental health, that we should see people out on the streets. Again, I know no administration that's put more activity 
into addressing mental health issues any, anywhere in the country and is leading the way on this. And I will get you the numbers of the intervention that does not stop the role of the NYPD, which is going to be continuing. Do we have more to do yet? Yeah, we recognize that. And we're going to continue to do that. And the crisis intervention is a way to do that. Thank you, Council Member. Okay, no, I still have I still have the second part of my questions to answer. Uh, what feedback? I asked this question before. Uh, what what are the, what is what feedback is this administration receiving from breaking ground as to why street homeless individuals refuse to go into shelter? Again. Now, when we're, now, with all the rest, I just want to tell the city council, um, whoever's, monitor, whoever's uh, the chair, I just want to ask the chair that having five minutes on such important topics, and when we don't discuss this, you know, throughout the year with very limited con con having conversations about this, I'd like to ask I, for a few I, more minutes. I think I, I, I will, I, I think the right way to do this, and I know you're going to have a hearing with the DSS commissioner, is the right way to have this conversation of exactly how homeless services and what the numbers are on homeless services. I already had over two dozen conversations. I and think it you're hasn't also gone anywhere. have a public hearing on this and it's the appropriate place and we'll make sure that they're prepared to answer this. Okay, so, so if you could just answer me the question on what feedback um, has this administration received from breaking ground as why to a street homeless refuses to go into shelters. I, I'm gonna let the expert on this and the commissioner, the commissioner of homeless services, I'm gonna let Steve Banks answer this. There's going to be, you can do that at the public hearing. It's the appropriate so, place. So uh, commissioner, you're you don't not get asking about what the levels are of, of uh, individuals in our shelters. You're not asking about how many people have gone from the subways into no. the shelters. No. Those kinds of things we can do. The kind of question you're answering, I really do believe is appropriate for the DSS commission. He has the expertise on that. I'm not going to try to speculate on this. You are, you are the first. Sure that you are the you are the first deputy mayor. Uh, but so I also I'm sure know. You get I also know where my knowledge is, and where on a specific question about what is motivating individuals, I'm going to turn to the expertise. Same way I turn. Can, can to the you can you just give me can you just give me can you just give me three reasons? I, I'm oh. not. Can okay. you give me one? I'm not giving you a reason, so, but I am going to. I am going to. No. I am going to connect you with Steve Banks, and he'll give you those. He'll no. Give so as so as the first deputy mayor, you cannot give me one reason of why a street homeless individual refuses to go into one but, of the shelters. We have we have increased shelter capacity. I'm not talking about the shelter capacity. Why? Why I, does I, a street? Again. That's, again. Again, one reason. Give me one reason. I'm going to suggest, and I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to hook you up with the commission. Thank you. I have a, I'm sorry, Council Member. We have to move on. We have. We are already an hour behind schedule. We have a couple more Council Members to get to. Um, Council Member Levin, followed by Council Member Powers. Time starts now. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, first question is for First Deputy Mayor Fullahan. Um, uh, Deputy Mayor... Uh, in 2019, when we went through the borough-based jail process, um, the administration made uh, commitments to me that it memorialized in the um, uh, in the points of agreement in the Brooklyn section. These are um, uh, commitments uh, for restorative justice programming. Um, these were, were budgetary commitments. Um, they have yet to be um, uh, fulfilled. So uh, obviously last year was a rough year. Um, and so I was willing to kind of grant an extension um, being that this is my last year in the council and these were commitments made to me as part of this uh, negotiation, um, I expect uh, that, that, uh, that all of those commitments will be fulfilled in the FY22 adopted budget um, uh, this, this June. So can I get your commitment that that will happen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, Commissioner Shea, uh, I wanted to ask about um, the overtime budget. <clears throat> So are we on are we uh, on track to be in line with the with the agreement on the on the um, on the OT budget, the agreements that we made in the adoption of the FY21 budget, or are we um, are we over? Then you want to jump in? We'll give you the exact numbers. Yeah, we are okay. uh, we are exceeding the budget uh, year to date. We've spent 222 million in city funds and $242 million in all funds. Uh, and that is uh, our city funded budget is 209 million. So we have exceeded that. 
again, given the current conditions and, and levels of violence and the cut to our headcount um, and the need to just continue to provide investigations, resources, and allow our commanders sure. to have the flexibilities to do what they uh, need to do. Can you just happen. make sure you have how much it's down? Uh, yeah, so, but that is, uh, thank you, Commissioner, uh, that is a 43% year over year expenditure reduction. Um, okay, but you're, yeah. but, but you're already past the, uh, the, the 209, so you're at 240, yes. 240 something. Okay, can we get a breakdown, 222, sorry. Can we get a breakdown, because there's different types of OT, can we get a breakdown of operational OT by, uh, by rank, as well as investigative OT code eight by rank? Um, and, and whether or not um, the, uh, the uh, officers are, that, that are receiving that OT, um, uh, what, what percentage are uh, in either on the streets or in precincts uh, and what percentage are at 1PP? I realize you might not have that for you, with you right now, but I would like to be able to get um, that information for the uh, executive budget hearing. I, I don't have that information with me. Uh, right, 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 I, right, right. No, I, I realize that I would like to get it um, for the executive budget hearing. So the, the May budget hearing. So in between now and, and May, I would like to know that breakdown by rank and whether or not cops are in the field in precincts or in, um, uh, in at 1PP, specifically for, for investigative OT, code eight and operational OT. Um, can, can you commit to providing that in uh, for the executive budget hearing? Yeah, we'll, yeah, we're, 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 yes, yeah. we can get you that information. Okay, okay, great. Um, and then um, uh, I imagine my time is running out. Um, Commissioner, I, I wanted to get your reaction to the article uh, by Greg Smith in the city yesterday on um, detailing uh, 43 instances when um, uh, yourself as commissioner or your predecessor, uh, Commissioner O'Neill, uh, in the last four years overturned um, or, or uh, diverged from uh, administrative, uh, NYPD administra administrative trial judges' determination on disciplinary cases, including five cases in which a, um, a, 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 a guilty determination was actually overturned by, by yourself or, or your predecessor, Commissioner O'Neill? Yeah, I, I don't have any specifics regarding the article. I, I spoke to what something I saw um, earlier where for myself, it was quoting and again, Councilman, I, I don't know the data behind it, but I think it quoted for me four uh, where I upped it and five where I moved it down. If that's accurate, I'm not significantly surprised by that. Um, we, we review every single case that comes across my desk as the police commissioner. I'm not intimately familiar with the prior cases of years ago for other police commissioners. And we weigh all the facts and circumstances, including the details, the disciplinary history. Now we take into account the matrix and we make a decision. Were, were there any cases under your commissionership that where you uh, overturned a guilty determination by uh, an administrative trial judge uh, at the NYPD, I, I think I can. I think I mentioned one earlier. There was a, a case mentioned in the paper recently of a lieutenant, um, and it was alleged that he used improper uh, force in pushing someone. It, it it made it seem like he was pushing someone into traffic. I reviewed. It was all captured on videotape. I reviewed the entire incident myself. And I thought the decision was 100% uh, inappropriate. So I overturned it. I, I, has do expired. Wanna, I do want to just go back and, and point out that, that and, and the commissioner said this when it was asked earlier, that this was before we concluded the two year process of developing the discipline matrix. You know this, you know, they're now 60 pages with clear guidelines, clear, Here's, here's the penalty, here's where here's the accusation, here's the finding, here's the penalty, here's the mitigating factors or the aggravating factors. And we now have an MOU that makes that effectively binding. There can be exceptions, which then the commissioner must be very clear about, but both the commissioner and the head of CCRB, both have made it very clear 
that they intend to follow, that the, the intent of the MOU was to follow that disciplinary matrix. So we do not expect going forward uh, after all the work that's been put into this by CCRB, by the NYPD, by public comment, we do not expect to see that happening again in the future. Okay, hey, Council, uh, Councilman, Councilman Levin, I'll just follow up and say, um, you know, regarding that particular case, I, don't, I think it was an old case, but I've committed with the new matrix, as the first deputy commissioner said, that I expect to follow the matrix. I think all parties do. And, it, and if that's not the case, it'll be in writing to CCRB. And I took it as an additional step, as I said before, that I think it's important for the public to know that. So I will inform the public exactly why, if it ever happens, why I disagree. But, and to that specific case, maybe I'll do it with that case, even though it's retroactively, because I think the public will 100% agree with me. Um, okay, I mean, there's a large diversionary rate from uh, from 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 the uh, administrative judges and the CCRB, a seventy one percent diversion. Well, I, I, I I addressed that earlier. I don't know if you weren't on the call, but every time that gets repeated, it erodes trust in New York City. And I think it's important for people to know that there you have to be behind those numbers. And when people go to trial and are found not guilty, that's going to affect that rate. So the article was a little bit uh, could have been clearer. Let's say it that way. Okay, we can keep talking. Um, just w one last thing about the OT numbers. If we could also provide, um, if, if it's able to, if you're able to get this about uh, how the number of years uh, to retirement um, that that those OT numbers were um, that are, are are claimed. But um, however you're able to to determine that, well, I, that would be I don't understand that question. What was that question? Uh, it's 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 fine. We could I could I could talk uh, offline with um with with your staff to to get That's the details full. on that. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Very good. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Levin and Councilmember Powers. Time starts now. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for uh, being here today, and all my colleagues for their questions. Um, I we, we've talked we've talked a lot about gun violence here in the city and the rising numbers around gun violence in the, over the last calendar year and. Uh, and uh, what is a no notable uh, both nationwide and local increase, uh, local uh, surge in gun violence. C can you talk to us about what you believe are the drivers in gun violence right now in the city of New York? We've heard a lot of public statements and as a chair of the criminal justice committee, we've discussed this in my committee as well. Can you tell us what you believe are the drivers of that increase in gun violence in the past, uh, in the past year? Yeah, and I would say that, you know, there's been other times in history. I mean, certainly the first deputy mayor is right. There's been a number of cities across the U.S. that have experienced in this last year. This is extremely complicated. And I'm not saying that to um, dismiss the question, but it, it has become at this point extremely complicated with all the factors that are behind the, the rising gun violence. The first deputy mayor, you know, we, we've had other times in our history where other cities were seeing significant spikes and we were not. Uh, I'll add that to it too. We know how to keep crime down in New York City. We know how to investigate crimes. We know how to deploy. That's not to say that we, we can't learn and always look to do things better and do it with the softest touch too. Um, this last year has pr presented unprecedented challenges to name a few. The courts have been shut down. Uh, remember when we said that last late last spring and, and they came back, well, no, they're not really, but here we are and we're still shut down, you know, to some degree. We have, you can get your nails done, you can go to a movie now in New York City, but we still don't have fully operational courts and we need everyone to start speaking up about that and demand that it's not the case uh, because literally lives are depending on it at this point. We need accountability when people commit crimes and accountability does not have to equal people going to jail. But there needs to be some sense of when you do something wrong, whatever it is, there's a spectrum. You're going to be held accountable. Maybe it's you have to apologize. Maybe you get put on probation. Maybe you are incarcerated. But right now, believe me, there is a feeling among the criminal element, that very small element, that there is no repercussions for committing crimes. So courts is a big piece of what we're seeing. Chief LaPetri mentioned earlier about the gun arrests and, and the bail situation. You know, it, it is extremely complicated, but we need to get to a place 
where when, when we have repeat people committing crimes or doing bad things, that judges have an ability to say, you know what, that person can't victimize people anymore. You can go on to resources another, is another issue. So, I mean, I could go on to this topic yes. for a, quite a long time. You're probably tired of me talking already. This is my time here. Look, I think that the drivers are hard to figure out in, in a pandemic and they're needing, we're seeing them across the board. And I don't believe, I, I know I, I, it's hard to attribute any sort of specific law change in here in New York state to gun shootings in Milwaukee or any other you know, city in America. I think there's a, something going on, but when we talk about arrest rates, what are arrest rates right now compared to normal times, if we want to call them that, when it comes to uh, folks who have committed a crime using a gun? Sure, and I'll turn that to the, are you chief of detectives or chief of department? But I will also say, Councilman, that uh, our shooting, rest, uh, shooting rates were up significantly last year before Lord. anyone had before we're, anyone we're, had heard about COVID. I, I, I agree with you on that. I, the shootings were, were starting to go up, but, um, but I was going to ask, are they up or down? Let's just ask, let's just add, how much are they up or down, the arrests for gun violence? So uh, last year we, we struggled with uh, arrest uh, when it came to shooting incidents. And I actually want to kind of touch on your first question regarding what are the motivations. Uh, one of the things that we saw uh, last year in 2020 was a lot of gang motivated shootings uh, that with a combination of uh, unlicensed uh, locations, having events where disputes were um, stirred up that stir that turned into violence, as well as narcotics enterprise shooting incidents uh, was also a struggle in 2020. Um, and regarding the clearance and regarding these shootings, yes, the, we were down, we were about uh, 32 percent in contrast to the prior year of uh, 2019, the, the percentage was uh, about 40, 42 to 45 percent. And I've, I've said this quite often in the past, my investigators are the best in the world. But these cases are a lot more difficult to solve due to the fact that people were trying to fired. People who try to capitalize off of wearing their these face masks to commit their crimes. And because um our victims could not identify who our perpetrators were. Uh, our police officers would tr look at video and capture the incident and still couldn't uh, identify who our uh, individuals or subjects uh, that committed the crime. And the reluctancy of witnesses coming forward yeah. uh, really made it very difficult for us to uh, solve some Can of these I cases. Jump on that? Yeah. Now, Councilman, I would pose to you, what would you tell a witness? When we bring them in and they identify the shooter, what would you tell them when we when you, when the truth is we cannot protect their identity? Because that's what they're going to be told by the prosecutor. What do you mean by but not protect their identity? Exactly that. No, they're going to be told, they're going to be told by the prosecutor that the person is going to be released or put back onto the street, or they're going to say they're going to potentially try to redact their identity, but they can't promise it. And this is the hard conversations that are happening the last year, every day across New York City. And, and I'll tell you what happens next. The witness stands up and too often, afraid for themselves and afraid for their family, will make a decision to walk out of that room. But I guess, look, I'm not, I'm not making any allegations against the police department here. I'm asking questions because there's a noticeable increase. Well, I'm telling you, though, I'm telling you, we need your help. Yeah, and we I need everyone in New York's help to, to, to correct this. Look, gun and violence. We're, and and let, me, let me jump in, if I may. We're, we're also, we recognize, and the anti-violence package recognizes that there are more elements to this. We, I mean, we, the commissioner started it by recognizing what's going on in the, pa the past year in the country. Um, it's part of the reason that we're doing the, uh, the restorative justice, the significant expansion in cure violence. This is multifaceted and we're gonna have to do that. And obviously the NYPD takes, a, takes the central role, but there are others that we're gonna have to play in this. And, and I don't dismiss all the other community relations and all the other reforms that we've been talking about here today. Yeah, look, I, I, I guess I guess I'm just going to back once again. My, my the whole entire intention of the question is that if we can, as elected officials or leaders, be able to help you fix a problem about gun violence in the city, unless we have a clear understanding of it. I think that 
some of the explanations given are helpful to us to better understand what the issues are. I think we also recognize there is a nationwide pandemic that is causing some uh, 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 friction in, in, in what's going on all across the country. I'm because I think it's a really serious issue in our city right now, and I, and I think we should be we should be talking about it and figuring out ways to address it so that yeah. New Yorkers can feel safe and people want to return back to New York City. But also doing that in a way that actually looks at what is happening in a in a sober way. Um, yeah. we, we all agree with you on that. You're right. Yep. Okay. All right. And we'd love we'd love to engage uh, any way possible. You know, uh, it, literally in any way possible. Uh, members of our team, uh, members of the community, uh, members, you know, uh, on the, um, the council, because I think it's good, and clergy as well, and it's gonna take all of us. Uh, I think as Chauncey would say, locking arms. Okay, thank you for that. My last question is, I just, and I, my time is- I'm sorry, council member, we are, we are well, well behind schedule, okay. um, and, and we're well behind this right. clock. Right. Thank you guys, thank we you. We have one more council member who's raised uh, his hand, council member Yeager. Um, and then we will move on to the CCRB. Time starts now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, I, first of all, before we, before we start, uh, the public advocate, before he, uh, before he became public advocate, represented the district right next door to the district I represent. We shared a large border. Uh, he and I both know the neighborhood very well. Um, five days ago on Avenue M and East 19th Street, a young man named Keon was shot and killed at 12.30 in the morning. It was about 200 feet from my front door. Uh, it's, like I said, it's a neighborhood that Jamani knows well. It's a neighborhood that I know well. Um, the idea that, and I'm not saying that Jamani has promulgated this idea, but the idea by some members that you have to look a certain way in order to, uh, to be horrified by gun violence, uh, that is, that, that are taking the lives of people who don't look like me and don't look like you, Commissioner, is offensive. And uh, there, are, there are members of this council and there are people who we're going to hear from later who think that if you look like me and you look like you, uh, you you're not offended by gun violence. Um, and it's disgusting, it's not true. It, it's taking lives of our fellow New Yorkers and I know that you're horrified by it and I know that I'm horrified by it. Uh, I got my start in government uh, serving uh, as a young council aide in the district that uh, public advocate Williams represented uh, in the council, uh, two members before him. I know the neighborhood well, I know the district well, and uh, gun violence has absolutely increased. It's not a secret and it's not something that the administration or the department is denying. So with that backdrop, uh, I wanna ask a little bit about some of the cuts because this is after all a budget hearing, not a policy hearing. Um, uh, it's been suggested that perhaps a billion dollars was not cut from the police department, that it's, uh, that it's smoke and mirrors, if you will. Um, by my calculation, when you add the uh, operating expense and the capital expense that you've discussed, it's over a billion dollars. So talking about that specifically, I'd like to ask if you believe that the number of personnel on the street right now has been diminished by the nature of the cuts that the department has endured during the course of this year. I'm assuming that's to me. Uh, yeah, there's no question, Councilman. There's no question that uh, we're at a reduced number of officers, uh, detectives, civilians uh, at this point than last year. Christine and Rodney can talk to you about some of the impacts, but um, we, we, um, our job as managers is to manage the resources that we have. Um, this process is, is important. It's a, important for every, all the council um, from the chair on down and, and um, others that will come afterwards to set the parameters and make very tough decisions. But the short answer is there's no question that ha it has had an impact on the ability to fight crime. Uh, Christine? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just add, you're correct uh, that the combination of the operating and the capital were real cuts to our budget um, that uh, reached the billion dollar threshold. And on the head count, you know, just a reminder that the, the uniform head count cut of 1163 uh, impacts the current fiscal year and continues beyond that. It's a, it's a baseline reduction, uh, but we're actually down more than 1700 uh, officers from where we were at this point last year. Uh, and then we also have um, 1800 members of service who are part of our current actual head count, but they're in the academy. 
so they're not field effective. So you know, we're we're working to maximize the resources, maximize the resources we have. But you know, there are there are challenges uh, that we're all facing, and you know, we really want to work to maximize uh, the resources we have and the resources we're able to uh, to utilize to to do the work that the department does in 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 trying to keep the city safe. So on the other side. Yeah, just if I could just state real quickly. Sure, thank you, Chief. Yep, uh, you know, a couple of statements been made regarding um, we're over policing. Um, the one thing that I will have to advise everybody that's in, 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 in that's able to listen to my voice is, you know, putting cops in the right places to uh, deter retaliation is extremely important to, to public safety. You know, having officers out there uh, addressing uh, some of the violence that could come back um, helps. It, it, it really has. And once again, is this, I've been doing this for almost 29 years now. Um, Over-policing is not something that we do. It's called protective policing. We want to make sure that we protect all New Yorkers and all the different communities uh, throughout the city. So just, just everybody, please keep that in mind. Uh, we're a professional law enforcement uh, agency. We're arguably one of the greatest police departments in the world. Um, I think we know what we're doing. Thank you, Chief. And uh, I just want to cover. I just want to correct the record. We are the best police department in the world. I know that, Commissioner. Uh, I know my my clock has expired. I'm I'm going to just briefly say one more thing because um, I really don't have the opportunity to ask more questions. But I will say that um, uh, when I when I leave my home uh, and walk to synagogue uh, for the last five days, I pass the place on the sidewalk where there is still uh, blood on the cement uh, from the young man who was shot and killed at 12.30 in the morning on a block I know well in a neighborhood that I grew up in. Uh, and his name is Keon. And there is not a single member of the department here today at this, test, at this hearing that doesn't feel the pain of that murder victim and every other murder victim. And the idea that we ought to keep on taking away resources from the police department and expecting the police department to save the lives of people named Keon and like Keon, because it has to be said by somebody who looks like me that those are the folks who are getting killed. People who look like Keon are getting killed. And it is our job, all of us collectively, to stand up and to give the resources to the police department to save their lives and to help them. And we have to do that. Um, I have heard members here today, and this will be my closing thought, Madam Chair, I've heard members today um, who were the biggest proponents of cutting the police department, uh, uh, quabbling with, uh, with, your with uh, members of your department, Commissioner, over whether or not three or four detectives in a particular bureau is sufficient. They're the ones who didn't want us to have, they wanted us to fire cops. And they're quabbling with you over whether or not we have enough cops. In the last hearing with regard to the transportation uh, issues, the department, uh, uh, the, the traffic um, inspection uh, uh, investigators, it, the, same, the same argument was made. We need more investigators in that department, in that, in that part of your department, but being made by the same people who say we, we shouldn't have this many cops in the city. So it's important as we go into the budget, because this is not a policy conversation, this is a budget conversation. When people come up with a random number and say, this is the amount we should cut, without looking at what that amount translates to, they're not being responsible. Um, and with that, I, I thank you, Madam Chair, for giving me the extra time. I appreciate it. And uh, Commissioner, I look forward to hearing the rest of your testimony today. Thank you. That is all the council members we have who have used the Zoom hand raise function. I'll turn it back to the chair, uh, perhaps to acknowledge the council members who are here with us today and close out this portion of the hearing. Thank you so much, council. Uh, thank you to all of my colleagues. Uh, special thank you to NYPD. Uh, we've held you over well over an hour of your, um, of your time with us. Thank you to the admin, uh, particularly First Deputy Mayor Foulihan. Um, Commissioner, this hearing has been, we realize it has been top heavy in speaking about reform. Um, there is a reason for that, and I think that you know that, so I'm not going to apologize for that. Um, we know that this is a budget hearing, and we would definitely have preferred for all of our time to have been spent speaking about the budget today, but unfortunately, we could not do that because we have a very, very stringent clock on us with regard to 
policy issues. So I thank you for your indulgence. And I will also say that um, if there are any further questions regarding the budget, I'm sure there will be, as there should be, um, we'll send you a follow-up letter and we'll request that uh, response uh, be uh, given back within a two-week time period. And we thank you in advance for that. Um, again, uh, this has been a very, very uh, intense uh, first portion of our hearing. We didn't expect any less. Uh, I thank all of my colleagues again for your passion. Um, as you can see, we differ on several opinions, but I do expect us to work as we always do as a body together uh, in thought so that we can get this right. We're not playing around with anything that we do. And uh, we know that we're coming into this heavy budget season again. We've got to do the work of this council. So thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Thank you, NYPD. We uh, are going to... Uh, next, hear from the Civilian Review Complaint Board. CCRB's fiscal 2022 budget is $20.6 million. Most significant for CCRB is ensuring that it has enough resources to effectively investigate the hundreds of complaints it receives every month. They must be an effective check on the police department, and we commend them on their work through the challenges during the COVID-19 pandemic. I am also going to acknowledge uh, my colleagues that have joined this hearing this morning and this afternoon. Council members Holden, Lander, Brennan, Rosenthal, Barron, Miller, Reynoso, Rodriguez, Gibson, Deutsch, Levin, Powers, Lewis, Rose, Riley, Amprey, Samuel, Lager, and Menchaca. Uh, hopefully I've gotten everyone uh, in that list. Um, uh, I look forward to hearing about developments in the CCRB budget, your outlook for the next year and any concerns you might have. Uh, we've got about 30 minutes, so I would like to get um, started. Thank you very much, CCRB. Um, thank you, board, Reverend uh, Frederick Davey, uh, and Executive Director Jonathan Darsh as well uh, to your staff for being here today. Um, I should also mention that we did have the public advocate, Jumani Williams, with us today, giving, uh, giving his very impassioned testimony as well. Um, so thank you, uh, Council. I believe we can begin. Thank you, uh, Chair Davey. Just want to do a mic check with you if we can. Yes, thank you very much. And can we also unmute uh, Executive Director Darsh? Good afternoon, everyone. And before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath. Please you raise your right hands. Uh, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? Chair Davey. I do. Uh, Executive Director Darsh. I do. You may begin. Thank you. Um, Chairperson Adams and members of the Public Safety Committee, um, thank you again for this opportunity to appear before you today. Uh, as is known, I'm Fred Davey, the chairperson of the Civilian Complaint Review Board, and I'm joined by our executive director, Jonathan Darsh. This last year has seen uh, one of the most significant uh, changes, uh, or some really significant changes for the world, the city, and for the conversations about what policing and public safety can look like. Oversight has always been integral to public safety, and the last year has highlighted the need for strong, independent oversight yet again. During my tenure as chair, the Civilian Complaint Review Board made significant strides in service to all New Yorkers and remained central to the conversation of how we achieve a fairer, more equitable, and more accountable public safety system in New York City. During my more than four years on the board and three years as chair, the CCRB grew to over 200 staff, released a database of officers, CCRB disciplinary history, and expanded its, its authority to hold officers accountable for sexual misconduct and false official statements. We published one of the first ever comprehensive reports on the use of body-worn camera footage by an oversight agency, issued a report on NYPD's interaction with youth accompanied by the first ever public service announcement with our Youth Advisory Council, 
Ann hired our first ever director uh, for our new civilian assistance unit. Caused primarily by the pandemic, the agency saw a 20% decrease in complaints received, uh, dropping from 4,962 complaints received in 2019, 3,875 complaints received in 2020. However, the CCRB saw a tremendous influx of complaints due to the violent clashes between the NYPD and peaceful protesters following the killing of George Floyd. CCRB received over 750 complaints of police misconduct at the Black Lives Matter protests, resulting in 297 individual cases. CCRB has worked diligently throughout the year to investigate these cases despite a number of challenges particularly around access to information from the police department, the inability to in identify officers as a result of the police department not keeping track of where officers were deployed, officers wearing helmets with improper shield numbers, and new challenges stemming from remote work. To date, we have closed 112 of those complaints, including 37 fully investigated complaints, 50 truncations, and 24 of which were closed pending litigation. Of the fully investigated cases, CCRB substantiated misconduct in 38% of those cases. As we continue to bring the remaining 185 cases to a close in the coming months, we will share our findings with the public and prosecute officers where the board recommends charges. At the beginning of 2021, we adopted the police department's disciplinary matrix as has been discussed in this hearing and signed uh, an MOU that will enable the CCRB to recommend discipline in a more transparent and independent manner for all cases, including the majority of cases stemming from the peaceful summer protests. I am particularly proud that after the repeal of civil service law 50, I am particularly proud uh, that after the appeal of Civil Service Law 50A, on March 4, CCRB established an online database containing the CCRB disciplinary histories of the NYP, of NYPD officers, marking a true change in the community's ability to have transparent public safety. As we continue to advocate for final authority over discipline in CCRB cases, the agency is encouraged by the direction in which it is headed and hopes to see that direction supported with funding from the administration. In 2020, as a result of the charter changes New York has voted to implement, we now have one member appointed by the public advocate and the chair is jointly appointed by the mayor and the speaker of the city council. The police commissioner is now required to provide written explanations for deviations from the board's disciplinary recommendations in all cases. And CCRB's jurisdiction has been expanded to include false official statements made to CCRB in the course of investigations. Finally, CCRB's headcount has been linked to 0.65% of the NYPD's uniform officer headcount. After an initial estimated budget increase, CCRB's budget was revised by the administration due to the pandemic, as the charter, of course, allows. Just like the rest of the city, CCRB had to make some tough decisions, including fundraising from private donors to fund the production of the CCRB's first ever public service announcement with our youth, working creatively to ensure staff uh, was able to successfully transition from work to work from home and internal staff restructuring uh, at CCRB by consolidating senior roles in order to hire much needed additional classes of investigators. As the CCRB works to incorporate the new disciplinary matrix and take on the prosecution of highly sensitive sexual misconduct cases, we will need, we will need to make sure our one of a kind administrative prosecution unit is no longer operating with a staffing deficit to take on the increase in cases and workload while making sure we don't re-traumatize victims. Similarly, now that 50A has been repealed, we will need additional FOIL officers to ensure timely responses to New Yorkers' requests for information. 
Recently, the administration announced the David Dinkins plans, which were, plan, which was the largest expansion of the board's authority since its creation in 1993. This includes consolidating all oversight under one entity, which will ensure the oversight is more effective and efficient. CCRB supports this plan and looks forward to working with the administration and other stakeholders to successfully implement it. We note that mere consolidations of agencies will only be a meaningful step forward if combined with several key changes that also require funding. We are working with City Hall and OMB to ensure that CCRB has adequate uh, levels of funding in order to do its job effectively. In order to implement the Dinkins plan, the CCRB will need increased access to NYPD records. To increase our access to evidence, the administration proposed changing state law to exempt the CCRB from sealing statutes. This would allow the CCRB to obtain documents so that the agency, so that agency investigators can properly investigate all cases. Recently, the council introduced a bill that would allow CCRB to investigate any officers who have engaged in severe acts of bias, including uh, acts exhibiting prejudice, intolerance, or bigotry, or unlawful discrimination against any person or group of persons on or after January 1, 2016. This would be a, a drastic change in responsibility for the CCRB. OMB is working with us to get the tens of millions of dollars we would need to implement this change. Furthermore, after a year of litigation, the agency will resume its investigations of allegations of sexual misconduct. Taking on sexual misconduct allegations is one of the reasons the CCRB worked to create a civilian assistance unit within the agency. This innovative unit, unit which will support complainants by assisting them in understanding and navigating the investigatory and disciplinary processes and provide complainants with connections to the critical city resources like housing assistance and mental health services. We're currently in the process of hiring advocates to staff this program. These are significant increases in responsibilities for the CCRB which currently has fewer than 150 investigators investigating the police department that has over 36,000 sworn officers. As an already underfunded agency, overall, uh, our overall budget would have to be increased significantly to ensure effective, independent, and thorough investigations to be true to our current and expanded mission. As CCRB continues to become stronger and more transparent, we look forward to the support of the administration and the council to be better able to accomplish our mission, which is to provide strong, effective, independent civilian oversight of the New York City Police Department. As a result, we need adequate resources to continue to provide effective oversight of the NYPD, including staffing, training, and public education. I'm confident that with your help, that the CCRB will continue to flourish, improve, and lead the way in civilian oversight nationally. I thank you for your time and continued support and Executive Director Darsh and I are um, available to answer um, any of your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Davey. Thank you for being here. It's good to see you as always. Um, I think you've done a lot uh, to move the conversation about police discipline forward lately. So I really appreciate your candor during this whole process over these past few months. Uh, before I ask about the budget, I wanted to follow up on a few items from the plan itself. I know that there are, are a significant number of CCRB reforms included, but I wanted to know if you think there are any areas related to the CCRB that we should consider including or areas where the plan does not go far enough. So I think it's a really um, excellent plan. It's a, it's a major step forward and we really appreciate the mayor and the administration uh, for, for advancing it. Um, obviously we are still focused on final authority um, and we appreciate uh, the resolution that currently exists in the council, I think introduced by council member um, uh, uh, Cumbo, um, and then as well as the sort of state legislation that's been in, introduced by Senator Bailey and I think Assemblywoman Cruz. 
So final authority is is a is a big issue for us, but we think the the current uh, plan that the mayor uh, has put forward um, is is a major step, uh, and will uh, continue to strengthen uh, these. Uh, 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 agency and its ability to exercise civilian uh, oversight um, of the department. Obviously, you know, we'd like to see something, uh, and, and it is in the plan, and we'd like to see it actualized, and that is, you know, what we're here for today, and that is sufficient resources to, to actually carry out the mission, now expanded mission, uh, that, we've, uh, that we've been tasked with. Okay, thank you. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the budget. Um, and talk about your staffing, your budgeted headcount for the next 236 positions. Is this enough in your opinion? John, you want to answer that? So the, <clears throat> thank you, uh, uh, too many chairs on my left right now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I think the 236 number is is not what is currently in the in the budget based on the I, I think it is it is it is lower than that because it is 0.65 percent of the NYPD's member of service headcount and I think that is like a 224 number but uh, you know we we are working with OMB and the administration to increase that number. Uh, you know, everyone had to take uh, cuts this year because of the pandemic. And the agency actually was uh, proactive in restructuring so that we can continue to hire more investigators to make sure that we could hire, uh, that we can provide the level of service that New Yorkers need and expect from the CCRB investigating cases of police misconduct. Are you currently under a hiring freeze? So uh, we have recently hired two classes of investigator and we are scheduled to hire another class of investigators in June. And we are on a, uh, in addition to those three classes, we are on a three to one exchange for people uh, have to depart the agency before we can replace them. What's the turnover for investigators? I think we've lost approximately 18 investigators in the last fiscal year. And what's their starting salary? Uh, $42,000 a year. Okay. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, the CCRB's investigations of the NYPD's protest cases. How many complaints did you receive that were related to the police protests? So we received 750, um, 750 complaints uh, that um, uh, we, um, when we looked at them, there was a lot of overlight overlap. So we um, are investigating 297, I think it is, uh, of, of those actual complaints, um, having consolidated some and obviously um, uh, uh, dealt with others that, that weren't uh, particularly relevant to our, our jurisdiction. But 297 is the number now that we are um, investigating. We keep hearing that the uh, that complaints in 2020 were decreased compared to previous years. Why do you think that is? Uh, that is true, as I said in my testimony. I think it's mainly due to COVID. Uh, you have fewer people out in public uh, engaging um, uh, with uh, with members of service, uh, and and because of the COVID restrictions on. Uh, uh, people's ability to be out in public, I think there's um, just a, a lower number of complaints. We expect that, uh, you know, those levels of complaint to uh, resume to once, uh, once the restrictions on uh, COVID interactions are, are lifted. And uh, clearly we had this burst of uh, additional complaints 
around the June uh, George Floyd and Black Lives Matter protests. Okay. Can you provide any specifics on the number of cases substantiated and the discipline you recommended and whether or not the police commissioner deviated from any of your recommendations? On the protest cases or just in general? On the protest cases. So we have substantiated uh, 14 complaints which comprise 24 allegations against 20 officers. Uh, that's a 38% substantiation rate of fully investigated um, uh, complaints. Uh, but to date, uh, um, there have been no deviations from um, any of the disciplinary recommendations uh, that we've made. Okay. Well, in general, how often does the police commissioner deviate from your recommendations? Well, it, it depends. Uh, when you're looking at the APU cases, um, you know, it was, uh, it was a challenging year last year for the department. Um, uh, the staff reports to me that we were, that the department was at an 8% concurrence rate on APU cases. It, it, even if you took into consideration uh, guilty verdicts at, at departmental trials, Staff reports that that number, that percentage then increases to about 12%. It was higher, uh, as I understand it, for, um, for the less serious cases. Uh, I think we might have been around the 65, 70% concurrence rate. Uh, I think overall with the department, we generally average about 40% concurrence on, um, on APU cases and, um, and uh, higher than that, of course, on the less serious one. I will say that I'm, uh, you know, pleased that the commission and I have signed this uh, memorandum of understanding, and that we have uh, the disciplinary matrix to guide us, uh, and um, and we're going to be diligent um, about ensuring uh, that both we and the department follow that matrix, and uh, the extra enforcement or oversight that comes with the MOU, and uh, and trust that that's going to lead us. Um, to greater concurrence rates. Um, uh, one final word on that, is, you know, and again, I'll come back to it. Uh, if the agency um, had a final authority on its cases, just those CCRB cases, um, I think, you know, the issue of concurrence would, would go away. But uh, both the matrix and the MOU, I think are, are very strong instruments that, that um, um, will lead us to a greater concurrence. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the body-worn uh, camera footage issues. How long, on average, does NYPD take to provide you with body-worn camera footage? Juan, you want to uh, address that? So the the backlog has essentially been eliminated now. The if you so it, it's tough to to use an average because historically there was a very very large backlog. Uh, we, we haven't fully implemented the MOU that we signed with the department uh, early in 2020 because uh, or we haven't fully implemented the MOU that we signed in 2019 because as we were getting ready to set up the temporary secure room, the pandemic uh, hit and we've been unable to, uh, to get it started yet, but the department has been moving has been working with us to respond to requests quickly. Uh, there's still a need for us to have direct access to body worn camera footage. Uh, it will allow us to be more efficient, but also it will uh, increase public trust in the process. How often does CCRB receive incorrect footage? So I don't have a uh, exact number on that, uh, Madam Chair, I can get that for you, but it, is, it does happen where we will make a request and then we'll get uh, that there's no, we'll get a negative response that there's no footage. And then when we, you know, notify a member of service to come in for an interview, they'll tell us that they reviewed their body-worn camera before the interview. And so that will let us know that there's body-worn camera footage or during the protest cases where we have different complaints from the same protest, you'll get uh, 
investigators who will have make requests that are responded to positively where their colleague who has a makes a similar request for a incident that occurred nearby at the same time or a similar time will get no no uh, will get a negative response mm -hmm. uh, and the department corrects those once they're aware of them but it it is something that would be eliminated if there was uh, direct access to body worn camera footage. Do you know how often the footage is redacted? I, I can get that number for you. The department has been uh, accepting verbal waivers of uh, people's uh, privacy rights uh, so that we've been getting unredacted footage very quickly, but I'll check with you on the redaction number. Okay. It, when it comes to issues with the footage itself, how often is uh, footage obscured by clothing or because the camera becomes dislodged or any other issue? So I will, I will, get those numbers for you, Madam Chair. They, they, uh, it is a, we did our body worn camera report last year and it included those issues. Uh, and I don't know that they are large in number, but they are, they are significant when they happen. And we've been working with the department which has taken steps to improve the ways in which they secure body worn cameras to uniforms. Has CCRB provided recommendations to the NYPD on how to improve its body-worn camera programs? Did you have a part of that? I'll jump in the, there. Yeah, the um, the CCRB and the uh, and the department signed a um, memorandum of, of understanding on access to body-worn camera footage. And as uh, as uh, John has said, as Executive Director Darsha said, the uh, the access to that footage has has improved as a result of that uh, MOU, and the you know, and the backlog uh, basically has been dealt with. But you know, again, uh, the technology uh, you know exists to where the agency uh, should have direct access to body worn camera footage, uh, and uh, and that would eliminate uh, uh, any number of these issues that that arise while. Uh, also allowing for the protection of, of people's privacy. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to my colleagues who have questions at this time. Uh, thank you, Chair. We have uh, Council Member Holden up first. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair Davey, um, you described the summer protest a few times as peaceful. Do you actually believe that all of the summer protests were peaceful? Because that sounds like a misrepresentation. Oh, clearly there were uh, some of the protests uh, that weren't peaceful, but for those protests were and, and uh, complaint and complaints we received from those protests, those were the ones I, I was interested in. Yeah, but you did, you did describe it twice as you, you got complaints from the peaceful protests. Is that did you guys determine whether a protest was peaceful or violent? We we determined whether we determined whether or not we got complaints from peaceful protest, and that's how I described it in my testimony. So you you stand by you call that means you got no complaints from violent protests. As far as I am aware, um, but I, we will check that, and I'll let you know. Yeah, because it's a little curious because I, I, I saw a lot of violent protests. We saw burning police cars. We saw looting. We saw a lot of things that were violent. Right, but sir, we saw a lot of things and that, means, that you know, weren't violent either. There were uh, mistakes, some of them serious mistakes made in how peaceful protests were, uh, were, uh, were dealt with. And, uh, and that's what we saw. Uh, that's what, uh, those were many of the complaints we received. 
uh, and those are the complaints uh, that, that we're, we're, we're addressing and investigating. So you're only investigating the peaceful protest complaints. So I said we'd get you that that information. I mean, just, if you're, you're 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 supposed to be impartial as a chair of the CCRB, and I just felt that was that statement was strange that you you categorized all the protests the complaints that you received were peaceful. It's just a little odd, but um, I would not say that I categorize all the complaints we received that were from. No, you said it twice. You said you categorized the protest. Just saying protests would have been sufficient, but you went out of your way to say they were peaceful. And I didn't, I don't think any New Yorker can say that all of the protests were peaceful. So that's why it's a little, it's a little strange. I think it's important to recognize the right in the democracy for people to peacefully protest, which a majority of the people who were protesting did and not to have their peaceful protests besmirched by people who were intending on violence or improperly impeded by the NYPD or any other law enforcement agency. And we want to encourage peaceful protests and we promise the people of New York City an impartial um, review of the data and the facts when it comes to um, allegations of NYPD officers uh, improperly interacting with anyone. Uh, but we want to emphasize the importance to a sound democracy of people being able to engage in peaceful protests and to have a proportionate response from law enforcement. Yeah, we, we all, listen, we all want, if we have protests, obviously um, that we want them peaceful for, for everyone involved, police and protesters. But we saw a lot that weren't peaceful. That's all I was I'm trying to make a point here that if the an impartial body chair is going to categorize that he got complaints from only the peaceful protests, that's I think a mischaracterization of and so I, I would amend that. I would just say protest. There's no reason to to be partial uh, because then it, it does it 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 really resonated with me that, it, that you're making an anti-NYPD determination by yeah. saying that because there were protests that were violent and yeah. cops were hurt. I have a deep respect for the NYPD. I have a deep respect for the work that they do. I have relatives who have been officers. I have friends who are officers. So for you to say I'm making an anti-NYPD is just you're being inflammatory and I think it's unfair. I, I listen. When I say the impression that I got from your categorizing all protests in the summer that you got complaints from as peaceful, I think that was a huge stretch. I, and I, I would expect. Remember that you're making to make a point. And that's expired. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, sir. Um, Chair Davy, did you did you want to finish uh, your answer or? I'm done. Thank you. Um, we will now turn to Councilmember Barron. Time starts now. Uh, have I been called, recognized? I'm sorry, no, ma'am. Thank you. I had stepped away, didn't know I had been called. Madam Chair, thank you for this extremely important hearing and particularly timely in terms of the mayor requiring that the city come up with a plan. And we know that uh, there have been meetings that have been held and certain parties have been involved in those meetings and very vocal in those meetings as they try to come up with this plan and present it to us to support it and vote it up before the deadline has expired. I'm very concerned about the CCRB. Uh, I have legislation which talks about doing away with the CCRB. We can't have the Fox guarding the chicken house and making those decisions. And I say that 
without any dispersion or uh, disparity to the members that are there, but they are appointed by the very body that's being investigated, that they're investigating. That's problematic. Similar to a special pros prosecutor being uh, appointed to see particular cases where criminality has been involved and that then prosecutor hiring retired detectives to do the investigation. It's problematic, it's conflictual, and we see issues with that. So we know that the members are appointed by the mayor, by the police department, and also by the city council. We are proposing in our legislation to do away with that and really talk about representation of by and for the people by having 17 districts formed from the 51 community districts that exist. There'll be 17 districts and each of those districts will elect a person to serve on an elected civilian review board. And that body would then be charged with conducting findings and hearings and making a determination which cannot be changed by the commissioner. I heard talk earlier about a memorandum, a memorandum of understanding that this is what they intend to do, but there's still wiggle room in that. Because I heard the commissioner say that if he didn't expect that there would be reasons that he would not follow the recommendations, the findings of determination, but if he did, he would be willing to explain it. That's not good enough. We need to have that separation, need to have that division so that the community, which has very questionable trust and justifiably so in the NYPD can be assured that the persons who are conducting these hearings that they have selected to be on the board are in fact representing their interests. So we want to make sure that people are aware this legislation will be presented soon. And we would want this to be the essence for moving forward, uh, we have very, very, as I've said, justifiably limit, limited confidence in what the M NYPD has proposed. We know that in the past, they've come to us in hearings and made profound definitive pronouncements about what they are doing. And we found out subsequently that that is not what has been happening. So I just want to share the information. There are three main tenets of the proposal that we're introducing to become law for an elected civilian review board to maintain it. First and most importantly, that the representatives on that board be elected. And secondly, that the commissioner not be able to waffle or overturn or not implement what the findings and determination of those elected members uh, have from their hearings and investigations. Anyone can bring complaints. It doesn't have to be the person who's been victimized to commit to bring a complaint. Anyone can bring a complaint. It will be fully investigated. And then the third main tenet is that there'll be an independent prosecutor. Persons whose family members have been uh, disrespected by the community, by the misconduct that goes on in the police department, even though we're talking about body footage, it doesn't make a difference. We saw what happened. We saw what happened with Rodney King back in, how many years ago was that? Whatever number of the years are. And we saw what happened with Eric Garner. It didn't make a difference. So we're not relying on those uh, police uh, department cameras giving us their footage because as it goes forward, police are not brought to justice by That's losing, va thank you, by losing vacation days for the misconduct that they commit and certainly not brought to justice as Inspector Shell was not brought to any type of justice when he shot Ortonzo Bovel in the back and there was never an investigation. And he rose through the ranks, elevated himself, increased his salary, got his pension with no justice for the family other than the justice that they got through a civil suit. So I thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to talk about the legislation that will have a, a, a body in place that will seek to get justice and will seek to have appropriate consequences for the misconduct that police commit, particularly against unarmed 
innocent civilians in our society. Thank you. Chair Davey or uh, Mr. Darsh, would you, would either of you want to respond? Um, I'll um, say um, I appreciate the passion and the commitment uh, to justice and fair um, uh, policing. Um, I would respectfully disagree about an elected CCRB. Um, I think that um, that might inadvertently introduce a level of politics into this process that could easily um, twist us in the knots and perhaps um, grind us um, to a halt. I think the amount of money that could go in uh, electing into electing people to an elected CCRB, such as money that the police unions and other people with um, less progressive ideas about policing might um, might inject into this process could result in a board that was uh, more sensitive to um, less progressive um, approaches to policing and civilian oversight than, than even we currently have and in, in, in the direction that we're moving. Um, the commissioner, um, uh, you know, uh, designates, the police commissioner designates three members to, to the board, but they are actually appointed by the mayor and of course the council and the mayor appoint the balance along with the public advocate. Um, I think holding public officials accountable for the work of the CCRB is, um, is a, is, seems to me a more effective way uh, to pursue this and then ensuring that the CCRB has final authority over, the, uh, over, the, um, over its uh, decisions um, is 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 um, a very effective way to approach this. I, I've you know I have lived in New York City for now almost forty years. Um, I I I know the h horrific feeling that one gets. Um, I can only imagine what it is for the families when unarmed uh, civilians um, are um, are uh, killed or uh, severely injured uh, by officers of the NYPD. And I can understand um, a good deal of the uh, frustration with the uh, low concurrence rates between the department uh, and the agency and the CCRB. But I think we're, we're um, on the right path. I think we're a lot closer to addressing those problems in the system. Um, again, final authority would, I think, put us where we need to be. But I, you know, out of a deep respect for you, council member, and all that you've done, the ways in which you and, and your husband and others have put uh, your lives on the line for the people of New York City in ways that I haven't and could never dream of, would not probably have the courage to. And I'm really appreciative of that. I just, the, the notion of a elected CCRB and all the politics and all the money that could get involved in that, um, for me personally, um, um, is, is one that I would ask that we seriously consider not doing and just strengthening the, the current approach that we have. Well, thank you for the acknowledgement of the work that we do for our people and the, also the advocates that are in this, but we do have a disagreement uh, fundamentally. And the group that has presented this legislation to me as the prime sponsor was well aware of that. And we went into discussions, uh, my group and that group also, to talk about the very things that you talked about, that there might be an opportunity for the union to try to construct that. And it was something that they felt would be overridden by the people who are in the community and understanding, no, this is a candidate that we're advancing because they have a track record in our community. But thank you once again, and we can continue to dialogue about that. Thank you so much. Thank you to the chair. Thank you, madam. Thank you, council member. Uh, we'll, thank now you. To, we'll now turn to council member Rosenthal. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Chair and and um, Chair Davies. It's it's an honor to be speaking with you and asking you questions. Um, I'm uh, I want to ask two questions. Um, one is a follow up from Chair Adams, who asked about the number of people, the attrition that you're seeing at CCRB. And then at one point I heard there were three classes since or during the same time. Net, I want to, I'm curious how many people are in a class? And then um, where has it left you net net? So John, I'll turn that over to you. 
So uh, the number of people in a class varies uh, between eight and 12 in recent years. Mm -hmm. uh, and net net, we're probably going to be even after we hire the June class. Yep. We, and one of the things we're looking for in the June class is uh, the final number will depend on if any other people leave, they may right. allow us to hire more folks. Right, so right. It's, it's, uh, it's a so work in progress. Right, and hypothetically, if in the executive budget, the mayor added funds for staff, hypothetically, you could run another class after the June one or make it larger. Correct. Okay, great. Um, my second question, um, Chair Davey, is for you. Uh, over the past three years, I've spent a lot of time looking at the NYPD Special Victims Division and have been very disappointed year after meeting, after meeting, after meeting when promises are made and not kept. Um, there are still cases, I'm working with advocates, where you know the survivor just doesn't want to proceed because they've been treated so badly. Um, there was one recently where she was treated so badly, she left town and uh, anyway, uh, are those cases that could be brought before the CCRB? If, um, if a person in an encounter with a NYPD officer. Yes, a so, detective. I'm sorry? Detective. So I think our focus is on uniform officers only, but John will let John way in here um, on a detective, John. So we, we have jurisdiction over sworn members of service, which includes detectives. Uh, we have jurisdiction over excessive force, abuses of authority, discourtesy and offensive language, and now also uh, untruthful statements. So uh, if, the, if the conduct by the member of service is on, on duty conduct where they invoke their authority and it uh, is against the civilian, then we would, and it fits into one of those categories, we have jurisdiction over it. Right, so if a detective did something like they're filling out a form with a survivor and says, um, you know, uh, are you okay with us closing your case because we haven't been able to do any calls with the perpetrator with you and it's just not holding together i'm making that up i that's a probably terrible example but you get where i'm going like just in the work of their doing their job it's an abuse of their authority that they're making a recommendation that probably is not true and the survivor does not know that but upon working with an with an advocate learns that in fact, the department is not doing enough and could be doing more, could be investigating by looking at tape, uh, video, for example, um, or calling other witnesses. But if the detective is not doing that, could that be a case? So I, I would have to really look at the individual facts of that the civilian brought to us. And we would, of course, listen, and, and we've been training our investigators in uh, trauma-informed investigate, uh, interviewing, and we've sent a- uh, time expired. 12, 12, can I finish, Madam Chair? So we've sent 12 people on staff to FETI, and we are uh, sending another five soon. But I think in the, in the facts that you were describing, I don't know if that would rise to abuse of authority, maybe a discourtesy, but we'd have to look at each individual case that uh, that, the, that is brought to us and determine if it's in our jurisdiction. Thank you. As a follow up, perhaps would it be okay if um, I work with some of the advocates who have a better, you know, better examples than I have to see if, you know, they we should be thinking about CCRB. 
I, I would say, uh, if I might, uh, Madam Chair, um, Council Member Rosenthal, that anyone who believes that they have been um, unfairly treated by a member of a uh, sworn member of service, as Mr. Darsh said, should um, register a complaint with the CCRB and let us sort out where it belongs. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, council members. I don't see any other council members with um, their hands raised, so we will, I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you very much. Uh, I have no further questions. If there are no further questions from my colleagues, I will thank the panel. Uh, I'm, CCRB. I'm sure there's one, one issue that- Go right uh, ahead. So one of the issues that the agency has is, is that sometimes documents are considered sealed by the police department that we need in order to investigate cases. One of the items in the Dinkins plan uh, would call, calls on the state to exempt CCRB from a lot of the sealing statutes that sometimes prevent us from getting access to information. And I think that is uh, something that I urge you all to, to look at and, uh, and consider a home rule resolution supporting uh, the CCRB's ability to access information in order to uh, successfully investigate matters that are, that are in front of us. Duly noted, thank you very much. Thank you for the time. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Okay. We are going to move on. We're moving on to Mock J. I will now call on the panelists from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Um, before we will, before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath to all representatives of Mock J who will be offering testimony or will be available for questions. Please raise your right hands. I will read the oath and call on each of you individually for a response. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Uh, Marco Soler, uh, Acting Director. I do. Uh, Deanna Logan, Deputy Director of Crime Strategies. I do. Dana Kaplan, Deputy Director of Justice Initiatives. I do. Eric Cumberbatch, Deputy Director of Office from the Office of Neighborhood Safety. I do. And Osvaldo Cruz, Chief Financial Officer. I do. Thank you very much. You may begin your testimony when ready, Mr. Soler. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Adams and members of the Committee on Public Safety. My name is Marcus Soler, and I'm the Chief of Staff and Acting Director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. I'm joined here by Deanna Logan, Deputy Director for Crime Strategies, Dana, Ka Dana Kaplan, Director, Deputy Director for Justice Initiatives, Eric Amberbatch, Deputy Director for the Office of Neighborhood Safety, and Oswaldo Cruz, Chief Financial Officer. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about Mark J's budget and priorities for this year. Mark J advises the mayor on criminal justice policy and is the mayor's representative to the courts, district attorneys, defenders, and the state criminal justice agencies, among others. Mark J designs, deploys, and evaluates citywide strategies to promote public safety, reduce unnecessary enforcement and incarceration, and improve fairness. Mark J works with law enforcement, city agencies, nonprofits, foundations, and the public to implement effective strategies that makes the city safer by improving system coordination. Together with our partners, the fight to end gun violence in all city neighborhoods is our top priority for this year. This year has been particularly difficult and challenging for our city. With our partners and stakeholders, we sought to continue to operate our many programs and initiatives in the midst of a uniquely difficult year. We are incredible, incredibly grateful for the essential work that our providers and criminal justice stakeholders have performed during the public health emergency. In conjunction with these partners, 
MACJ helped mobilize a historic effort to ensure that the criminal justice system continue to function during this crisis. MACJ worked with our partners across the justice system I use the broad resources and expertise of city government to navigate the challenge of maintaining safety during the pandemic. As the administration's primary representative to the courts, district attorneys, defenders, and state criminal justice agencies, Mark J communicated feedback and ideas from these stakeholders to the mayor and uh, all the city agencies regarding court procedures, vaccine priority, and health protocols, providing a crucial communication bridge that helped to facilitate the effective implementation of COVID-19 health and safety protocols. As some in-person operations resume, MACJ has worked with stakeholders to plan for multiple grand juries to deliberate on felony indictments and some criminal justice jury trials. MACJ team is working and coordinating with the city health agencies to clarify the screening guidelines and processes for minimizing COVID exposure in in-person operations. Nearly a year into the pandemic, our working groups continue to meet on a weekly basis, serving as a critical touch point for updates, problem solving, and relationship building at a time when many of the usual pathways of communication within the criminal justice remain unavailable. In addition to our work on, to ensure continuity with the criminal justice system, our teams also conducted important education and community-based work during the pandemic. The Office to Prevent Gun Violence launched the media campaign, Stay Strong in New York City, probably you saw it, to encourage a culture of community well-being during the public health emergency. The campaign emphasized that New Yorkers are fighting the pandemic together and included social media and digital media components. The campaign finished with a total reach of nearly 5 million, with more than 2.5 million people watching videos and nearly 18 million total impressions. The mayor's action plan for neighborhood safety quickly mobilized with his 15 NYCHA developments to meet community needs during the public health crisis. MAPS resident volunteer corps conducted more than 11,000 remote need assessments and completed more than 7,000 food deliveries in MAP developments, plus Jefferson and Johnson houses in East Harlem during the course of the pandemic. Additionally, the Office to for the Prevention of Hate Crimes worked to combat the deeply worrying and uptick in anti-Asian bias incidents and hate crimes by creating a comprehensive interagency plan to ensure that city agencies are effectively supporting the Asian community. This is part of our legacy. Over the last seven years, the mayor has made historic investments to promote safety, reduce unnecessary arrests and incarceration, and improve fairness in the criminal justice system. These investments continue to improve our criminal justice, uh, will continue during this year. I'm going to talk a little bit about these investments with you. What are we doing right now in reducing unnecessary incarceration? In the recent years, we have seen significant changes in the criminal justice system. It all starts with the fact that New Yorkers are committing fewer crimes. For example, to use data from prior years, from 2013 to 2019, the number of defendants was down 40% from more than 220,000 to less than 440. That's prior to the pandemic. And we are using that number because we think it's more consistent. The same way the number of people rearrested was also down 52% from 67,000 to 37,000. Starts with New Yorkers. To provide further context around arrest and rearrest, it's important to know then historically about 20% of arrests, of people, of docketed arrests, have defendants with an open criminal justice case. Approximately 50,000 New Yorkers right now have an open criminal case during every given, any given month. Over 97% of these individuals are not rearrested and over 99% are not rearrested in a violent felony in each month. These rates are similar across all the different programs that we run and whether it's supervised release or others. Reducing New York City's jail population is a key commitment of this administration. And we have seen significant reductions in the city's jail population since the start of the administration. New York City currently has the lowest incarceration rate of all large cities in the United States. And we have seen historic declines over the course of this administration. Alternatives to incarceration, 
supervised release and effective reentry services are vital to the reduction of the city's jail population. Our commitment to close Rikers Island is also dependent upon continuing to reduce the jail population and we are all in. Our commitment allow me to share a bit more about these programs and initiatives and how they continue to further Mark J's goal to, sorry, no Mark J, the city's goal to reduce unnecessary incarceration. Alternatives to incarceration. Alternatives to incarceration programs are core mandated diversion programs that provide participants with supported services in their communities and instead of a jail or prison sentence. Alternatives to incarceration programs are key components of the city investment in reducing the course reliance on incarceration. Mark J currently invests $35 million in contracts, invested $35 million in FY21 with 15 nonprofit organizations, and we run 24 ATI programs to New York City. In 2017, the city increased its investments in ITI programs to serve approximately 5,500 5, people, as well as to provide additional behavioral health services to ITI participants and housing resources for women enrolled in ITI programs. In 2020, with the passage of bail reform legislation, the city expanded its ITI programs even further to divert more people, as well as to provide additional supportive services to more fully address participant needs. Overall, the number of people served by ITI programs is expected to increase from 4,000 at the beginning of the administration to about 20,000 people over the next two years. During the COVID-19 pandemic, these programs were able to redirect a, many of these services to remote models, furnishing ITI clients with cell phones and other means to engage in, safe, in services safely during our public health emergency. I want to talk to you about supervised release. In 2016, the New York City launched, the city launched supervised release citywide offering judges the option of releasing appropriate and eligible defendants under specific supervisor, supervisory conditions in lieu of setting bail. Supervised release is designed to address the likelihood to return to court. Defendants in supervised release are required to report to program case managers regularly and are offered reminders of their court cases, case management support services, and voluntary connections to social services as needed. My J, Mark J contracts with three organizations at the present to provide supervised release citywide. The current overall value of these contracts is more than $70 million, and we will be releasing an RFP in, for fiscal 22. We also do a lot of work and invest in reentry, a key uh, mandate from the mayor. Changes in practice of police and judges have meant and 43% fewer people left jails in 2019 than at the start of the administration. And we anticipate that number to fall to, four, to less than 14,000 by 2026. During this administration, we have seen some promising reductions in the return to jail, with reoffending falling by 36%. While this reduction is encouraging, the numbers of those who return are still too high. We are currently making significant investments in services and reshaping the way we deliver those services to ensure that they are effective. These investments under effective deployment will be key in reducing the return rate further. Mark J has expanded his reentry program to improve transition and release planning and services. The city has invested $20 million into this new programming which builds upon the success of the Jails to Jobs Reentry Service Program that was launched in 2018. Upon release, interested individuals work with reentry mentors who help facilitate all aspects of reentry on an individualized basis. The reentry mentors develop relationships with release individuals to encourage participation in relevant services and programs. The supports provided by this team of service providers include assistance locating temporary and permanent stable housing, as well as other wraparound resources 
determined by the specific needs of each returning individual. We anticipate that the case planning and coordination combined with expanded services offerings and a stronger relationship will help to ease the path of, to a stable life outside of the criminal justice and outside custody and reduce the likelihood of return. As I said, recidivism, reducing recidivism is one of our key goals. Our providers are currently implementing these supports along with DOC and our nonprofit partners. Awards have been recently made to 10 nonprofit providers in response to the pandemic. MACJ, Creator Team, and providers were able to mobilize to quickly restructure their programming to provide remote services. Additionally, in order to maximize safety, MACJ worked with agency and nonprofit partners to stamp up an entirely and set up entire new set of services in under-enrolled hotels in New York City. Beginning, beginning in late March 2020, Mac J worked with the New York City Office of Emergency Management, a nonprofit partner, Exodus, to provide trans transitional housing to clients living in jail. These hotels have been vital to maintaining safety during the pandemic, and we are incredibly proud of the work done by Mike J and his providers to ensure that those living in custody have safe, secure place to go. There are four such hotels. Sorry. MACJ continues to work with DOC, DDC, and other city partners to close Rikers Island and to implement a fair a small jails plan across four, the four boroughs, above the, uh, across, across four boroughs. The updated completion date on full implementation is August 2027. MACJ has been working with agency partners and stakeholders and members of the community, of different communities to provide updates and design workshops in all the communities where the new jails will be located. MACJ and city agents, agency partners have met regularly with city council members, community boards, and local communities to help develop the designs for the new borough jails and to maintain communication channels among all the stakeholders. This work will continue to, until the end of this year and beyond. I want to talk now briefly about our commitment as I said, to our top priority, to bring a strong neighborhoods to improve public safety and address the problem of gun violence. Research evidence has shown us that a strong neighborhoods are an essential component of a sustained, improved public safety approach. Through the Office of Neighborhood Safety, led by the Deputy Director Eric Amberbatch, which is comprised of the Mayor's Action Plan of Neighborhood Safety and the Office to Prevent Gun Violence. The administration has made important investments in supporting communities to help residents co-produce lasting public safety. The MAP program was launched in 2014 and currently operates in 15 NYCHA developments citywide that have historically experienced high crime rates. While the past year was challenging and unfortunately saw crime rise across the city and the nation, over the last seven years, the MAP program has proven to be an effective driver of change in communities. I will share a little bit more about what the program does and how it alters to address the unique needs of residents during the pandemic and the other crisis that we are experiencing. House within, as I said, the, the Office of Neighborhood Safety, the Mayor's Action Plan enlists residents, city agencies, and community-based partners to help move beyond enforcement and address the factors underlying safety. Through neighborhood staff, MAP harnesses the collective expertise of residents, government, community partners to drive change at both the neighborhood and administrative levels. MAP's work helped to develop the strong community infrastructure that allow neighborhood staff to remote and a, to successfully respond to the challenges of during the pandemic. In addition, to the investments in building a strong neighborhoods, lasting public safety also requires investing in non-enforcement methods of interrupting cycles of violence. This is the work primarily of the Office to Prevent Gun Violence that employs a multi-pronged approach to improve public safety by interrupting 
the cycles that lead to gun violence and address the culture and ultimately foster a, the violence. The Office to Prevent Gun Violence launched in 2017. The work started really at the beginning of the administration in 2014 and works to address gun violence through a shift in social norms and the work of community members in mediating disputes to prevent shootings and conflicts that might lead to shooting. The core component of the Office to Prevent Gun Violence work is through the crisis management system, you probably have heard, which deploys teams of credible messengers, community members whose background allow them to connect with and motivate at-risk individuals to 22 sites where they mediate conflicts on the street and New Yorkers to service and can create peace and support healing. These include a year-round employment program, mental health services, trauma counseling, and other opportunity center resources. COVID-19 presented a unique challenge, which the CMS force mobilized to meet. We understand and how difficult it is for a program that is designed to meet face-to-face -to, -face to operate under these conditions. But still, lots of things happen. CMS providers serve some of the first wave's hardest hit communities, and we're able to leverage relationships in these communities to help encourage public health mandates at the height of the crisis. As part of this work, CMS has successfully distributed PPEs through catchment areas, as well as provided guidance and encouragement around social distancing and COVID-19 testing. This essential work was a core component of the city's eventual success of flattening the curve and was performed while continuing to conduct core cure violence work and responding to other crises brought up by the pandemic, including food distribution and the, delivering, the delivery of to vulnerable members of the communities. As mentioned previously, in order to address the unique challenges of this year, as presented in our communities, the CMS work will double this year. That's a commitment from the mayor. And as you heard yesterday, we also have committed to implement advanced peace. Very briefly, we'll tell you, we have other programs called Atlas developed to, it's, it's a voluntary program that is going to deal with and connect core involved individuals to employment, social and therapeutic services to make sure that we are effective. I would like to conclude to say that our hope is that public safety is a fundamentally co-production than the city engages with the citizens. New Yorkers, as I said before, are the most important factor in maintaining and improving our city's public safety. While we are striving towards a more fair and just criminal justice system, we believe that the advancements that we have made over the last past seven years have fundamentally transformed the way that justice works in New York City. New Yorkers are key components of that transformation. And we are looking forward to continuing this progress over the next year. Thank you for the opportunity to present this testimony on Max J's behalf. And I'm happy to answer questions with members of my team. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Chair Adams. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Solar, uh, for that extensive uh, opening. Uh, I really do want to congratulate Mach J um, before, I, before I start with uh, my questions. Uh, the work that you do is uh, absolutely exponential with just 62 in, in, as a part of your headcount, I believe. Um, it's absolutely amazing the work that you're able to accomplish um, in behalf of this city with such a low headcount. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there and thank you all for your, your great efforts um, in, in the work that you're doing and will continue to do. I was really um, interested, uh, Mr. Solo, when you mentioned, and I'd like for you to speak to this point, um, you mentioned in your testimony a minute ago, the record reduction of crime number, of the number of crimes committed Yet, the NYPD in their testimony this morning continues to blame bail reform for the spike in crime. Can you just speak to that? This is what I would say, Madam Chair, and thank you 
uh, for the opportunity to partner with the council. MACJ operates across all agents, all parts of the criminal justice system, as you know. We look at crime holistically. Crime has many different elements, particularly in this crime, minor crimes, etc. In terms of overall crime, the city under the leadership of Mayor de Blasio continues to be at historic lows when compared to other jurisdictions. The city, since the beginning of the, you know, a May of 2020, have experienced, as many other cities in the country and nationwide, a gun violence crisis. The crisis that we experience is very focused around gun violence. It's not as an extrapolate to all other crimes. We have seen, as I said, a significant reduction that it started obviously many years ago, but has accelerated under this administration. So what I wanted to highlight is the fact that many New Yorkers, when we look at the numbers, are committing fewer crimes than they were committing before. And we know that public safety starts with the work that people do, with the fact that New Yorkers are less willing to commit less crime. We also know that for those who are involved in the system, what we look is to provide strategies and innovations that work. This is why all the array of programs that I have talked about, and that's the important thing for me, more than the debate about, you know, the current causes of crime. What are we going to do and how we are going to innovate? That's my drive. This is why I provide you with the programs that we do, and all of them deal with the same issues. We want to reduce reoffending. We want to provide alternatives outside the criminal justice system. That is the goal of my office. That's the goal of this administration. I want, I know that Mayor de Blasio knows and has pushed this office to continue to be innovative, creative, and execute during this last year of his administration. And we will try to do that until the end. And Thank try you. programs that are sustainable beyond this administration, because we think these are worthy programs. As I said, all the programs that I described. Okay, thank you. Um, I also want to note that uh, this is the first time that we're hearing from Mock J that, uh, that you plan to release an RFP related to supervised release for FY22. Um, I'd like to know if that means that, uh, that we can expect to, or that you're expecting to expand, uh, expand uh, contract awards beyond the three current providers. Um, and what you expect the total budget to be, how many people you plan to reach? So let me, let me frame it this way. As I said before, the administration made a commitment in 2016 to create this program. I think the program is a success. It's now part of L reform. A, we use different metrics to evaluate as we do all the other programs. We are launching a um, uh, RFP precisely because we think a competitive process is what is needed. Obviously, I am not going to compromise the process, the contractual process by saying to you uh, whether or not it uh, will be three or 20 providers, right? I, this is what we will do. We will have an RFP for every borough. We will expect to have as many uh, provide people interested in submitting proposals as possible. In terms of the commitment, the mayor has spoken several times about the commitment in, in dollars amount. Uh, the fact that we are investing $70 million uh, this year is an indication that a, of the commitment of the mayor. I, my, the budget is a bit higher for fiscal year 22, as we expect a, certainly, and we have made some projections and have been disrupted obviously by the pandemic. But if our projections are and our estimates are adequate, the budget will increase. We are very careful. We are spending taxpayers' dollars. We are tying very much our work to the number of people that we serve. So I don't want to offer either a, we are going to offer millions and millions of dollars. What we are saying is we are connecting to the work that we do, to how effective that work is. And certainly the administration has committed, as I said, a, a substantial amount of money to support of that work. And that work is pretty much essential, as you know, to the jail population reduction. Okay, all right, so, okay. So let's, let's jump into the budget. 
um, yeah. and talk about pay parity for public defense. During fiscal 2020 budget negotiations, the council successfully fought for pay parity across many public sectors, including for indigent defense providers. The November 2019 plan included $3.7 million for pay parity across the indigent defense providers baseline contracts that are managed by Mock J. Pay parity for indigent defense providers was to be implemented in two phases and would be retroactive to July 1st, 2019 for attorneys with less than five years of experience. Although the funding was recognized in the indigent defense budget over a year ago, as of March 2021, the providers' contracts have yet to be amended by Mock J, and this is this is unacceptable. What is the plan to uphold the administration's commitment and to amend the contracts and disperse funds to the providers and as soon as possible? So, let me say that I take your comment, and this is unacceptable, and we will certainly. Um, will address this. Diana Logan, who is my deputy director for crime strategies and our general counsel, will specific, uh, know the details much more than me, and she will be able to address your direct question. But certainly, I understand that you find this unacceptable, and I will, we will, uh, you have my commitment to address this issue. Good afternoon, Chair Adams. Thank yeah. you for the question. And we have been working with OMB because we do understand and we are committed to making this initiative happen over the four year period. The specifics of those discussions and how we are going to accomplish that, I would give Osvaldo Cruz, our chief financial officer, the opportunity to discuss that. But I wanna make clear that that commitment to parity, the four year process that was done for not only indigent defense, but also um, across the criminal justice system with the DAs is something that the administration is in fact committed to. Ozzy. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Yes, yeah, so we've, we've received um, proposals from the different indigent defense providers that we are working with OMB on implementing. As, um, as Marcos and Deanna stated, we're in, we're in the process of working with OMB to, to get the, uh, I wanna say the, the clearance to go ahead and make the, uh, the formal adjustments in, in the different contracts. And we expect um, decisions on on, on those directions to come very soon. Um, I've been in communication with OMB uh, often uh, since, uh, since having received the funding and it took some time for us to, I wanna say, collect the information and share it across uh, the parties that were involved. Um, and I think we're, we're close. I think we're very close um, to, to having the, uh, the direction that we need um, to move forward with these amendments. Well, it, it, with all due respect, it's been over a year. Um, who can provide us with a timeline? I think that's a fair question. Uh, what does the timeline look like? Close isn't, isn't a timeline. Are we looking at a month? Are we looking at six months? Are we looking at 12 months? Can we get a little bit closer with specificity on this timeline? Yeah, I think um, if you allow us to get back to you, we can, uh, we can produce the, the specificity that you're looking for as far as that, uh, that action. Okay, I'll look forward to that response then. Okay, it's also our understanding that the salary adjustments only impact attorneys working on Mock Day's baseline contracts. Why are attorneys working on state and council discretionary funded contracts excluded? Also, please address if you know the answer. I don't know the apologies. I am not familiar with the technical aspects, obviously after you have made it very clear and this is unacceptable. I am going to get into the details, but my team should be able to address this. Also, can you please address? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question, Madam Chair? Apologies. Sure. Salary adjustments, as, as we understand, the salary adjustments only impact attorneys working on Mock J's baseline contracts. Uh, why are attorneys working on state and council discretionary funded contracts excluded? Um, as, as I'm sure you understand, the funding sources, so the agreement has been between the city and I want to say the providers for the city tax levy resources that we put in and that we put towards, uh, towards, the, towards the adjustments that were made related to salary parity. We have been in, in discussions with the state um, who, who 
bear a significant amount of the cost um, for the provision of indigent defense services to, to meet us or to come closer to what the salary parity, um, uh, salary adjustments uh, have, uh, have shown us to be the numbers. And again, it's, uh, it's something that I think we're moving closer towards um, with the state. But um, given the fact that these contracts are mixed funded, um, the decisions are made um, to address the city tax levy portions of the contracts uh, with, with the providers. Okay, uh, I'll move on. Um, can we talk a little bit about the uh, uh, points of agreement um, as part of the closure of Rikers Island? Mm -hmm. And the administration negotiated a POA for $391 million in investments for criminal justice reform, including a $254 million in citywide investments and $137 million in district investments. The council understands that these investments will be funded with a combination of, a new, of new funding and existing resources. The council has also requested that the administration provide a clear answer on when new funding will be added to the budget and how much funding is currently dedicated to these new initiatives. So far, we have not gotten uh, that clear answer. So how much of the total $391 million for POA investments is funded in the fiscal 2022 preliminary budget? And will Mach J update its Beyond Rikers Commitment Tracker to reflect these investments. So my colleague, Dana Kaplan, is the one who is leading this effort in the office. I think she will be able to provide you with the specific details that you're looking for. Go ahead, Dana, please. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to the council for the continued focus on uh, our joint commitment to close Rikers. So, obviously, as you know, yes, the points of agreement uh, document is something that is very important was uh, something that the council and the administration worked very, very hard on and reflects a series of key commitments and investments, both at the neighborhood level and in justice investments. Uh, to answer your last question first, in terms of the update of the tracker, yes, we are working on that right now. We put the tracker on our website, I think in early 2020, and it was with a commitment to do an annual update so that there could be a public way of uh, reporting out on the status of every single one of the points of agreement um, commitments, including the status of implementation and operationalization and to the extent that obviously a significant number of them have a fiscal component where they are in the city budget. So that, that review right now is underway. Our office is, of course, the, the points of agreement spans many, many, many city agencies and many city agency budgets. And so we have been working uh, across the administration to make sure that we have an accurate understanding of where each of those items are and it will be updated on our website um, in, uh, in short order. So in, in the very near future, I'd say in the coming weeks, um, obviously we'll make sure that you are notified when that is um, available publicly, but it will be available on the Mock J website. Uh, I think at that point, I don't offhand right now have the total number of what the investments are across the entire points of agreement document um, because that is the, 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 the kind of granular review process that we're doing right now. So I'd have to get back to you on that collective number. I will say that as it relates to the justice investment commitments uh, and where things stand uh, as, you know, in, in that regard, we have certainly been continuing to move ahead with some of the, the key programmatic components. Obviously, uh, as Marcos uh, spoke about the commitments to supervise release, the expanded alternatives to incarceration programming, the community-based reentry services uh, were all some of the key things that were committed to in the points of agreement document and that are now in place. Uh, there is a transitional housing RFP that is forthcom forthcoming eminently to ensure that we move ahead with the commitment to expand transitional housing citywide. 
Um, I will say that there are a small number of items that have been delayed, um, but, and you know, I, I can speak to, to each one of those, but I know uh, Council Member Levin asked about the status of the restorative justice uh, earlier in the hearing and, and you know, heard from uh, Dean Fulahan directly that the commitment to fund that remains. And I can say that across the board, that if there is any item that has been delayed in the points of agreement document, um, and again, uh, I think it's a small number at this point, but we are committed to seeing those items funded. Uh, that is something that we will move ahead with during this administration and the commitment to the points of agreement uh, document overall remains unchanged from this administration. Okay, great. Thank you, Dana. And, and all along those lines, and just to, to talk a little bit um, about Project Reset, um, it's our understanding that MACJ has communicated with the Center for Court Innovation that it is supportive of citywide expansion of the pre-arraignment program, Project Reset, which the provided $3.24 million in one-time funding for in fiscal 2020, but it was not included in FY 2021. The DAs are incredibly supportive of this program as a successful diversion program and it was unfortunate that this funding wasn't renewed just as programs were getting off the ground. Can Mock J commit to funding this program as part of the $14 million commitment made for expansion of pre-arraignment diversion programming in the POA? So, so as you noted, the, there was specific funding for reset that was a one-time commitment and of course in the the covid fiscal crisis uh because that funds had that funding had not been baselined that was not uh funding that was able to be secured again although we remain supportive obviously of of the work of project reset and of that pre-arraignment diversion generally uh, as you noted there is uh 3.5 million dollars of funds that are committed to for diversion, including at pre-arraignment diversion, that is in the points of agreement document. And that is one of the items that has been delayed, but the administration is committed to. And so we are optimistic that that funding for diversion generally is something that we'll see move ahead and we'll be able to support the types of diversion programs uh, that Reset has funded. I'll say just specific to Reset, Project Reset is, was a specific um, program that there are a couple of providers such as the Center for Court Innovation that obviously currently provides those services. We're very supportive of you know, the nonprofit providers that are provide, you know, working on, on that program and have really been leaders in that regard. As it relates to the funding of the diversion program, we'll have to work through, or the diversion funding, we'll have to work through what a procurement process may look like, and it may be uh, likely a competitive procurement process. Um, so I can't say specifically that one nonprofit provider would ultimately receive funding for uh, those services, but the commitment to ensure that we have pre-arraignment diversion uh, is something that we are supportive of. There is that allocation or that commitment in the points of agreement document. Uh, I think that to the extent that there has been a, a gap in that um, recently, uh, that is something that we will look to fill and uh, can work on, again, what a competitive procurement process would look like towards that, as well as I think, and I would defer to, to Council Member Levin on this, but I know that the original intention of that diversion uh, funding was not just to have it fund just the, the, the types of programming that Reset does, but to also think about diversion at all sorts of different stages of the continuum. And so I think we wanna really explore um, in conjunction with the council, not just where that might be able to address some of the holes um, that are produced by uh, the fact that Reset isn't funded citywide, but also how can that funding ultimately support diversion uh, across the board? Yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree with that at all. Um, I, I, I would agree with uh, everything you, you said. I wanted to find out where we were specifically because I do know that it was successful uh, and it was something, uh, is something that the DAs um, definitely do support. Yes. So thank you for that. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the crisis management system and anti-gun violence work. The recent 
upticks in shootings have been in communities where CMS is present. A recent report released by Mock J shows a 97% increase in shootings in 2020 as compared to 2019, some of the highest levels in the city as seen in more than 10 years, which we have spoken with uh, NYPD earlier today. All of the top 10 precincts with the most shootings in 2020 received CMS funding. In fact, in fiscal 2020, these precincts received $16.4 million, which is nearly half of all funding. And despite this, all experienced an increase in shootings from 2019 levels. Why are we seeing a rise in shootings in these communities that receive the majority of CMS funding? And what does this say about CMS? Additionally, what is Mock J doing to address the recent uptick in shootings in these communities? So if you allow me, I am going to address first and then allow Eric Amberbach, who is the real expert on all these, but I want to say two things. One is we have documented and part, we have also partnered with other external researchers that have shown the effectiveness of CMS from 2013 to 2019. That is documented there. The CMS sites were more effective in reducing gun violence than areas where we didn't have gun violence. It's not only that, we did all the type of analysis that shows that neighborhoods that have CMS, for instance, we saw property values going up. We saw uh, sales values, sales taxes going up in those neighborhoods. We know that CMS was effective. As I said before, we are living a crisis, a public health pandemic crisis, but also a national crisis where all the communities in the United States are experiencing significant increases in gun violence. 50, 51 out of 50 top cities in the United States have experienced increases in gun violence. We have seen some indications that at least when it comes to shootings, that trend is continuing in 2021, less so in 2008 for murders, but certainly we are concerned. What we are focused is in the last part that you have indicated, and I'm gonna let Eric talk about the, the why, which is, what we can do. We think that the strategy comes from doubling the workforce as the mayor a proposed and advancing his state of the city. We believe that it comes from advanced pieces here, just a bunch yesterday. Increase from implemented all of the strategies that we think ultimately as Atlas, that we ultimately think, we think addresses the problem of gun violence and violent crime in the city. But it is very difficult under these conditions to operate Eric knows very well some of the factors in those areas. Those areas is where we found gun, high levels of gun sh on shootings and gun violence in 2010 when we started this work and continue to be the neighborhoods that are most impacted. So please, Eric, certainly chime in and address the question, please. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Marcos. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys yeah. hear me? Yeah. Yes. OK, thank you, Marcos. Um, and good afternoon, Chair Adams. It's, it's good, good afternoon. To good to see um, you. Thank you. Um, I would add that, you know, we're in those 10 neighborhoods for the reasons that you brought up. Um, we're, we're not, these things aren't happening by accident. And if you look historically, it's always been these 10 neighborhoods that uh, suffer um, from many inequalities that ultimately often result in and have violent outcomes. So, you know, when we talk about um, a pandemic, um, a state of uh, social unrest and, and this generation's um, criminal justice and just, just the struggle around humanity, um, all of these disruptions that occurred in the communities that we service, some of the most vulnerable communities, um, and you compound that and put it on top of each other, I think what we've seen is a fracture of the supports and networks and systems that bolster individuals and bolster community um, that we never really recognize as playing a part in public safety efforts. I'm talking about having face-to-face -face contact with teachers, mentors, community centers. Uh, I'm talking about having money to, to go to grocery stores, employment opportunities, um, even face-to-face -face contact, so many stressors in the most vulnerable areas at one time, um, you know, we, we saw an uptick. 
Um, and it's not something that's just a New York City issue. I think we've seen this and, and we, we track the data. This is happening across the, the country. Um, what we are doing and have been doing, we track every single shooting in New York City. Um, as shootings occur in these areas, we ensure that our sites are deployed, um, that they're properly resourced um, to be effective. Uh, when we engage with victims or victims' families, we, we link them to victim services and other support networks um, and really look to build uh, a sense of resiliency and restore that in community so that community members aren't just left um, to business as usual when these shooting incidents happen, but they actually join us as part of the healing um, of a community and neighborhood. Um, the mayor announced the, the doubling of CMS. Um, we're very grateful um, to, to have that type of announcement. Um, and right now we, we wanna work uh, in a very inclusive fashion with the CMS partners um, to really have a data-driven approach on what that doubling would look like uh, so that we can roll out in the next fiscal year with even more resources uh, in these areas. I will say a lot of our efforts are to go further upstream. Um, we, we look at you know, uh, violence in, in crime data only uh, in a lot of these spaces, but really what we wanna do is get very much deeper as close to and if not um, root causes and really look at systems that allow violence to, to uh, uh, perpetrate or, or, or exist and flourish um, and really create environments that are healthy and, and promote healing and, and safety for individuals um, so that we don't have violence. So that's, that's what we've seen and, and that's what we're doing. Um, all of our work is evidence-based or, and or informed by evidence um, and steeped in injury prevention and, and public health um, efforts. And you know we're we're a small team, but we're we're all over the city, and and we're 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 working these neighborhoods um, as hard as we can at this point. Yeah, Eric, and of course you know um, I applaud you for your work, uh, your colleagues for your work. Um, I, I I think nobody does it better um, than you. you and your colleagues out there. So thank I. You. You Thank you. You actually went someplace that, that I want to uh, expand on a couple of places that you just took me. Is there any, uh, and maybe Marcos has this answer, is there any analysis and evaluation of CMS to share? I'm happy to share the analysis that we have done. Yes, I'm more, that there are some public data then it's already been out there, but I will definitely share with you the analysis that we have been doing for the last 18 months with in partnership with John Jay and people from the University of Chicago. We definitely share those analysis, with that data with you specifically. A, okay. not, it might need some update, but it's, but it's right. which we'll share immediately what we have. I will say two more things because this is to the credit of Eric and his innovation. One of the things that the mayor announced is the joint force to end gun violence. Part of that is the implementation the reinvigorating of ceasefire, but also the implementation of something that the city has not tried in this current format, which is piloting the notion of shooting reviews, very hyper-targeted shooting reviews in specific areas, which are gonna tell us most about the question that you asked before, which is the drivers of violence. We think that that is going to be important because it's not just about individuals, but it's also about what is happening in those places, what is happening in those networks. And that I think Eric will, and my office will certainly play a key role in pushing forward this vision. The other thing I wanted to highlight for, from our perspective in response to the analysis that we do is, as Eric indicated, for us it's always evidence driven. We are not happy where we are. I confess that I think as Eric indicated, the very essence of evidence-based strategies like cure violence requires to meet. So certainly the pandemic continues. We are gonna need to have a much more other to try all the alternatives to tackle the problem and to complement what the city is doing in terms of enforcement to make sure that we continue to have very robust community driven strategies to reduce gun violence. So that is what we will try to do in, in during this year. Okay, great. And, and again, just to touch on something else that Eric just mentioned and that was the doubling. 
So let's talk a little bit about that, the expansion of CMS. The mayor announced in the 2021 State of the City Address that the CMS workforce would be doubled. The total funding for the crisis management system for fiscal 2021 is $42 million, of which the administration provided 40 million, in addition to the council's discretionary funding allocation of 2.9 million. I'm aware that the RFP was canceled. So why doesn't the administration plan to release an RFP for this expansion? It's been over 10 years since there's been an RFP for crisis management. Rather, the contracts are just continuously extended and extended and extended. What is Mock J doing to ensure that new community-based organizations are considered for CMS funding? And what exactly does doubling the workforce mean? How many people will be hired? Is this expansion for cure violence only or for all CMS programming? So, sorry, I'm taking notes to make sure I address your two questions. So the, the reason why we do not have an RFP, there, are more, there is a complex reason, but there are two elements that I want to highlight. The first one is, as I said, we are in the middle of a public health pandemic. There is, we're in the middle of a legitimacy crisis. We are in the middle of a grant crisis. We are in the middle of an economic crisis that is affecting the city. We thought then this moment was not the right moment to, after we evaluated, to a to launch the RFP. We couldn't. We have the RFP ready. We are working on the RFP. We are trying to figure out how to create a competitive process, as you have indicated, that can include additional partners into this process. So it's not that we have completely abandoned the idea of an RFP or on a competitive process. It's just that we have a very clear direct emergency, as I said, and in these four areas that we felt it was important to address immediately and to continue the services. So we did not have a situation during the summer similar to the past summer. On, additionally, as you know, the mayor, obviously, as you know, doesn't happen. And one day came up with the idea that wanted to work the expansion and we needed to figure out how to have mechanisms to structure these. I think this addresses your second question. The idea of how to double the workforce is obviously connected to what we have already done. We have a round announced to the vendors, to all the providers, that we are extending the current contracts. And what we are going to do is work with them, obviously through the procurement processes of the city to uh, work the specific details of what doubling the force, the workforce means, right? Because as you know, every organization has different structures. I cannot simply say to you, straightforward, okay, everybody's getting this number of people, everybody's getting this number of dollars. Every organization is not structured in that simple way. Every organization has a different model. So what we are doing is evaluating all those budgets from those organizations. We are trying to come up with a model, a, a, a location model that makes sense based as Eric indicated in terms of priorities, in terms of where the need is highest, where we have the most, the most important emergency. And what we're trying to do is to as to uh, adhere to this notion of definitely doubling the workforce to make sure that if right now we have 250, 300 people working on work on CMS, we can say effectively in the summer, providers will have the resources to hire an equal amount or greater of individuals working on CMS. What we want to work with the providers, and Eric can talk more if necessary, is what that means specifically, right? Is it do you want to invest more on public health, oh, sorry, on mental health needs? Do you want more actual bodies? Do you want to expand the catchment areas? Those are the very specific details that Eric is leading. And we, as I said, don't think with 24 providers is a simple you know, answer. We, we are trying to make sure that we get this right. As providers often tell us, it's not just about the quantity, but it's also about the quality oh. of the work. And what we are trying to make sure is that we address with them the quality. Eric, did I miss anything that you want to address? Sorry. I think you, you covered it well. Um, we, we don't want to be prescriptive in, in this rollout, and we, we want to be in tune with the needs of each individual community um, as we think about resources and roll out resources in these areas. So we, we want it to be um, informed um, by the community itself. OK. I think that's fair. All right, in touching on the joint force to end gun violence, um, as was mentioned, the mayor announced in 2021 State of the City 
um, address to launch the launch of the New York City Joint Force to End Gun Violence to address the national surge in gun violence. This working group will receive, will review shootings and work to address underlying dynamics involved in gun violence and create better communication between law enforcement and anti-gun violence groups. What exactly is Mock J's role in the Joint Force to End Gun Violence and how will the group measure success? So a, let me tell you where I think our role was. We, as I said before, we were, we are the advisors to the mayor on public policy. A, we had a very, very important, but not the unique role in advancing these ideas that you saw in the joint force. Obviously we try to be innovative for the mayor and there are multiple partners in city hall and other city agencies that has helped us to put this together. Our role is going to be ultimately a determined in this partnership than we, as the way we always do in MacJ. We're doing this partnership with a bunch of different people. We don't have, personally, I don't have a desire to be the leader of anything. I like to work with everybody. I, we are trying to work exactly on who will be a, leading this effort and where it will be housed and other decisions like that. But what I can tell you is our Office of Neighborhood Safety will be part of these. Our deputy, uh, our Office of Crime Strategies will be part of these. Our research team will be very much involved in what you are describing. How do we develop, develop a specific metric that allow us to tell what is success? So how do I measure success of this program? We are doing something that we have seen in other jurisdictions, with, which we think has been successful, has been measured in a particular, a, in many different ways. There are two metrics that for me is important. Certainly is once we implement these, is obviously whether or not at the end of the day, whether gun violence goes up and down when we implement these. There is the second metric that is much more important to me, or as important, I should say, which is what are the lessons learned from all of these? Does it really become a structure where the city is learning, not just Police department is learning, where MACJ is learning, where multiple agencies, DOC, DOP, et cetera, is learning from this experience. That experience can be shared. And as a result of that, we have a different approach to the way we do gun violence. That to me is the essence of shooting reviews. It's one of the multiple strategies that we have there. We want to do network analysis to understand the relationships between folks who are involved individuals who are involved in gun violence. We want to invigorate a, as I said, a ceasefire, another strategy that we think has been very powerful. We want to certainly figure out other strategies, both a therapeutic strategies that might, we might have not implemented today, but we think might be useful. This is an opportunity for us, again, to try to create innovations, to try to bring to the table ideas that today we don't have. A gun violence is, a, is not a static problem. It's a dynamic problem as we have experienced. The city, as you know, just two years ago, had the lowest level of murder, the, the lowest murder rate since 1940s. All of a sudden that changed. Why? There are multiple factors, but what I can say is we certainly need to always innovate. If we are just happy with what we do, we are not going to come up with something and innovate and to try to be effective. So the purpose of the joint force is to figure out how we can push ourselves to the limit, how we create these working groups that works better, how we can be more cooperative, and how ultimately can we, we can be more effective. That's how I measure success for this program. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna touch on one more area before I bring my colleagues into this. Um, let's talk about rethinking incarceration. Mock J has been at the center of the interagency efforts to decarcerate and to reduce in intake to our city's jails, especially at the start of COVID-19. Mock J was instrumental in implementing the 6A program, negotiating with state parole to overcome barriers to release for individuals held only on state technical parole violations, assuring that otherwise homeless individuals have a safe place to stay upon release and bridging communication gaps between the released individuals and service providers. I'm saddened to see recent reports that show the jail population is now rising back up to numbers we saw prior to the pandemic. Moreover, 62% have serious felony cases, 54% have a, have a mental health diagnosis, 
and one in five have a gang affiliation. Most concerning to me is that over 75% of people have had prior admission. The current population is presenting serious systemic challenges. As the city's lead on shaping criminal justice policy and programs, and given the increased rate of people in security risk groups in the city's jail, what is Mock J doing to reduce gang violence and gang-related crimes? So Eric, uh, you want to take this question? Uh, I would just say one very brief thing is our commitment, our specific commitment to reducing the jail population as at the same time a achieve greatest, you know, higher levels of public safety has no change. We'd say that in 2014, the mayor said that clearly. We have helped the, uh, to shape that message. We are committed to the goal of both, as I said before, reducing gun violence and reducing incarceration. A, what we have experienced is, as you have indicated, a very clear problem of, of gun violence increase, which obviously can be clear, and you can see it clearly in, in the jail population. We know that the jail population has gone up about 800 people a, since a last year, primarily driven by folks who are there for murder, for gun violence, a, for gang related activities. That is the reality. We think that all these strategies that we are doing together are, are the strategies that ultimately are going to get, bring us to the goal to which we know we are committed and we know that we can achieve, which is the 3300 by 2026, a, so we can influence fully the safer, a, a smaller, fairer jails. But what I can say is there is no one simple solution. A, to the problem of gun violence, gang violence, crew and gang violence, and certainly that in the jails. But Eric, I know we have tried to implement certain initiatives. You could develop a little more of what we are specifically doing with the jail population and, and gang violence, please. Sure, I'll speak more so towards the, the gang violence piece. And, you know, I, I just wanna put it in context Oftentimes, people that reside in dense areas, um, when there's acts of violence, it gets attributed or considered gang violence, um, as opposed to uh, people that live in a specific area um, and the complications that comes with uh, untangling and unpacking what is really uh, structured gang violence versus um, disputes and, and, and other um, types of things that result in violence. So I just want to make a, a clear delineation that there, there may be people that are categorized as in gangs um, that may have exhibit or, or have exhibited violent behavior it doesn't necessarily link it to um, actual gang related gang on gang shootings or, or, or that type of violence, although that does occur. Um, I would say a lot of what we're doing is positive um, network building amongst uh, young people that uh, are most at risk or, or um, have risk factors for violence. Um, one of the key initiatives that we've rolled out and, you know, as, as the city um, really uh, slowed down or, or was impacted by COVID, um, we were launching youth-led campaigns peer-to-peer um, -peer messaging that really spoke about uh, young people creating their own narrative around um, exhibiting positive behaviors, um, making peace um, actionable, um, and being stewards of their own community. Um, our anti-gun violence employment program, where we work with outreach workers um, in, in neighborhoods to actually identify who are young people with risk factors that we need to bring closer um, to us, um, and give them leadership responsibilities and show that we actually want to invest in them because we care about their lives. Um, and to see the transition of when we care about young people, how they then care about others um, and so forth. Um, our outreach workers and violence interrupters that do great work already. So violence interrupters um, really mediating and, and mitigating um, just levels of violence in community or um, uh, different, dis different disputes that may be taking place, getting in between and, and really um, problem solving 
um, very granular issues. Um, uh, outreach workers that do great work um, identifying people who have gaps and needs in their lives um, and ensuring that there's resources that are culturally um, appropriate and competent for individuals to get the type of um, supportive networks and, and get to a place of um, resilience where we don't see some of these things happening um, that, that are being mentioned. So I think there's a lot that we're doing. There's a lot more that, that definitely can be done. Um, and and I'm, I'm very uh, excited about the expansion. I think that will give us um, more energy and, and greater reach um, for these types of efforts to continue to grow. I agree. I agree. Just a couple more questions for me. Um, and one of them has to do with um, mental health needs. And we know that incarceration is not the answer for addressing behavioral mental health needs. What programs does the city need to invest in so that Rikers Island does not become, I'm going to say does not become, but does not continue to be a mental health care provider? I would like Dana to please address that since obviously she knows much more about this than me. Sure. So yes, I, you know, I think that since the behavioral health task force many years ago, we have still been focused on uh, a number of implementing a number of different strategies that are specifically targeted around diversion of people who have uh, mental health issues from the justice system and specifically from incarceration. I would say, you know, obviously these programs and diversions exist at all stages of the system. So there has certainly been work uh, more recently that is about, you know, diversion from even the front end in terms of arrest and diversion centers and, and the, the recent pilots that have uh, been initiated in this regard. As it relates to diversion from the point of detention specifically, uh, one of the things that we have been focused on is within our alternative to incarceration providers and within our supervised release providers, making sure that there are appropriate referral points uh, to mental health supports and social workers such that uh, those programs can be relevant and effective for people with uh, mental health concerns and considerations. Um, so that has certainly been one of our strategies is we know that there might be particular um, considerations that judges might have in referring someone to supervised relief, release as an example, if they don't feel as though there are or the uh, appropriate referral points and you know uh, supports at the at the neighborhood and community level to be able to um, meet those specific needs. And a number of our providers have that expertise, which is um, very welcome. Uh, there's also, of course, you know, there's a, a new RFP, or it's not new, but uh, DOHMH has been focused on the expansion of justice uh, of JISH beds um, for, to provide particular supportive housing um, for people who might have a level of need that goes beyond what is available um, in other uh, uh, transitional housing or other long-term housing placements. And so, Certainly the JISH bed expansion um, has been one piece of this. Um, and then ultimately long-term, I think that you know there's an effort both to ensure, again, that at every stage of the system, we are diverting people as appropriate um, and can, you know, and, and, and not utilizing detention for people who can um, safely be supervised elsewhere, uh, but also focused on when people are in detention, um, what is uh, a more appropriate way to, to meet those needs. And so uh, as you know, connected towards the long-term plan to close Rikers, um, as, as you know, council members may know, obviously there's also the focus on increasing the capacity in health and hospital facilities to be able to serve um, 200 individuals uh, who uh, are uh, in who are remanded to detention, but essentially would be better served in a more therapeutic environment. And so, Correctional Health Services um, has uh, move, is moving ahead with the procurement um, and design of those beds within hospital facilities. And so, again, when we talk about kind of you know once people are in detention, 
uh, and at all stages in the system, we're looking towards how we can better serve that community. Thank you, Dana. Uh, thank you, Marlo, uh, Marcos, and thank you, uh, Eric. I'm going to let my colleagues in. Council. Uh, first up will be Council Member Barron, followed by Council Member Levin. Before we time to turn to Council Member Barron, I just want to thank everyone from the public who's patiently waiting. I know we're a little behind schedule. We have um, the indigent defense providers coming up next. Um, and I just want to thank everybody. We have a lot to get through. We will get to everyone who wants to testify today. Um, and with that, I will turn to Council Member Barron. Time starts now. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, to, to the host and to the panel for being here. Um, I just have a few questions. First to start out, this whole so-called criminal justice system had its beginnings, as was said a little earlier, in the carceral system to re-enslave Africans, those who were running from slavery to re-enslave them, to capture them and send them back, or once the uh, 13th Amendment was passed to find a way to fill the jails and get slave labor. So oftentimes there's a perpetuation of that concept when people are criminalized or put in jails for really seemingly petty uh, misdemeanors or crimes. So that is in, in fact the basis of how the system started. And we in fact, at this point have what Martin Luther King called domestic colonies in as much as we get very limited services coming in and the labor is extracted and taken out to the larger system. My question regard, regards those who are found to have been wrongfully convicted. I, I heard you mention your jails to jobs program and I'd like you to perhaps speak briefly more about that so I can be better informed. But for those who are wrongfully convicted, I'm proposing legislation that says those who were found to have been wrongfully convicted should be entitled to have the state pay whatever child support may have accrued during that time and that they not be uh, burdened with that obligation. And secondly, that those who have been found to have been wrongfully convicted will in fact be able to be entitled to extensive social services. And I did hear you talk about a program that helps get housing and other kinds of services. So I wanna know what do you think about those two pieces of legislation and then just also in terms of Mock J, uh, the work that is being done through the cure violence programs. I have Man Up, who really, uh, Man Up is really the model for all that is being done because they started without any kind of funding, but just with a commitment to help increase the, the peace that existed on the streets and to help deflect any kinds of disputes that would lead to violence. So they're the model, they're the originals. And, and uh, they've been doing that for years. They did that for years with no funding, just out of their own commitment. So looking at what they're doing, I think that as we look to say, we're going to change the model of safety in our communities. We've got to look at establishing community-based organizations of our constructing and our input and our shaping as the base not these external police officers and systems that come with a particular mindset that demonizes us and criminalizes us, stops us for no reason. But we've got to be able to have that power within our own communities to determine how we're going to keep our communities safe. We can rely on those persons that have lived in our communities, have credibility, and perhaps and had involvement with the system to be able to be heard fully by those who are going down a, a treacherous path. So how we've got to look in this new era of looking at how we're going to reshape what's going on to bring that power and that authority and those resources to those community-based organizations, not the police who have the history that I talked about, the police who don't see us as um, citizens that are valued and entitled to respect so I just wanted to get your comment on those two pieces of legislation and to just give big ups to all of those cure violence groups and cease, cease the fire groups that are working in our communities. 
Thank you. I think Eric and I will certainly, and the entire office will convey that because that's work. I will say two things. I am not familiar, apologies, I'm not familiar to the two pieces of legislation, but I will address the two core issues that I think you're addressing. One is, I think you know that our office is all about building community-based organization across the system. Not just obviously on addressing gun violence, but as I said before, across the system. And with regards to the broader goal that you have said, I, I think the mayor has been very clear. We have tried to drive that, a, a try to advance the mayor's vision. We have reduced, I understand it's, it might not seem sufficient, but we have reduced misdemeanor arrests significantly under this administration. We, we have pushed, obviously, for the kind of things that you were talking about, the criminalization, criminalization of regular routine behavior. We are addressing the issue of the criminalization of poverty in the police reform. I am with you 100% about reducing the footprint of the criminal justice system. I cannot speak specifically to your a, a specific legislation about people who have been unfairly impacted. I, I don't know enough. Certainly, I will ask my general counsel to look into the legislation and we will get back to your office. But I can just say that all those two goals, we have been very clear from the beginning, reduces the footprint of the criminal justice system across the board and creating the civilian infrastructure that will bring us to safety and not rely just simply on the old criminal justice system is two goals and certainly my office, I agree. And we will certainly pass a good, you know, your information to our vendors. We just were just on the phone with them and up so we will certainly connect on a regular basis with them. Thank you so very much for your questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Member, uh, Council Member Levin. Time starts now. Um, thank you so much. A um, uh, couple, two questions. First question uh, for, for Dana, I, I, you spoke a little bit about um, uh, the restorative justice funding commitment. I asked the first deputy commissioner, uh, First Deputy Mayor Dean Fullahan about this um, this afternoon as well, um, and he committed that the funding that was the funding that was committed back in um, in 2019 that was supposed to be in the FY21 budget would actually be in the 22 adopted budget. So I'm appreciative of that. My question is, um, can we? work together on how we want to see, like, if, can we start working together now on how we want to see that funding allocated? Because, you know, by my count, we should be at about three and a half million dollars for the community-based sort of justice, because uh, it was supposed to be 2.5 in the FY21 budget, and then up to 6.5 in the FY23 budget. And obviously, I won't be here for the FY23 budget, so, um, if, you know, if we were to be on track, it should be around really should be about four or four and a half million dollars in the FY22 budget. Um, uh, so um, my question is, I mean, we, it would be, it would be, we should start working on this now of how we want to structure this because I've been talking to some providers who, who, you know, are of the opinion that it might make sense for the counts. It should be on the part of a council initiative the first year because that gives us a little bit more um, discretion as to how it's structured um, rather than an R, you know, a competitive RFP put out by Mache, which is would be, um, you know, it, it's it's that's com that's a competitive RFP, but it that then leaves us with less discretion as to how how it's structured. So council member, the question couldn't be more timely. I think we are thinking the same about the need to plan now, essentially, for mm -hmm. how to spend that funding when it is allocated in recognition that obviously there will be a transition in the council and the administration that we don't want to, you know, we don't want to delay the planning for the allocation of the restorative justice funding. We know that there is a commitment to fund it. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we are poised to execute on that commitment um, and not begin the planning at the point at which the funding is reflected in the budget. So we actually uh, just released a very um, small solicitation to uh, bring on a consultant to um, help work with essentially MACJ, the council, we anticipate working closely with you and other members of the council on this, as well as 
uh, some of the provider community and obviously the many people across the continuum that have mm -hmm. expertise on, on restorative justice, I think to, to the point that you have made clear that we wanted to seed restorative justice programming and funding at every juncture of the system. So both in community and also um, for more serious uh, felony level, level offenses in the courts. So uh, Makje, mm -hmm. we were able to self-fund uh, that um, solicitation to bring that consultant on. And we anticipate having a, a very um, focused planning engagement uh, timeline that again, works with the council, with us, but also with the full range of restorative justice providers and experts um, to identify where the gaps are. Um, what are the programs that could be resourced immediately um, where, you know, it's a question of just scaling up or providing additional support, but also as we think about longer term and, you know, getting to that full 6.5 million um, that is going to commit, you know, commitment yeah. committed, you know, how do we think uh, about the highest and best use of that funding so that we aren't just limiting ourselves by thinking about how do we fund, you know, seed, seedling efforts, but also, you know, how do we really think about um, a value add uh, to use the principles of restorative justice to advance justice more broadly. Again, as you pointed out, both at the community level, but also uh, to, divert the mo to divert the most serious um, level cases from uh, the courts and towards a different model of justice that I think you know, restorative justice upholds for us. So we'll make sure that you have a copy of the solicitation if you don't, uh, but also happy to get started working with you on that immediately. Okay, that sounds great. Um, okay, I'll, I'll turn it back to the chair and to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Levin. I do not see any other council members with hands raised. Um, Chair Adams, do you have any more questions for the panel? I do not. This has been very thorough, very informative, and I thank the panel for their testimony and their time today, and most importantly, for their work. I truly appreciate the time that you gave us, and I will get back to you on the question that you didn't find our answer to be appropriate, and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Okay? Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. You too. Okay, everyone, we will, we will be taking a, a brief 10 minute recess. Um, it has been a long day. We are, we are going to be here for as long as it takes. Um, we will start up again at 4 p.m. with uh, the Legal Aid Society, Bronx Defenders, Brooklyn Defenders. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, and we'll be back up shortly.
Welcome back, Chair Adams. Are you ready to continue? I am as soon as my moderator comes back. I see him. Very there. well. Um, and all legal aid and defenders are ready. Folks, thank you for your patience. For those just joining, joining us, we uh, just finished a quick recess. We will be resuming with the Committee on Public Safety. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant. I will now call on the panelists from Legal Aid, Brooklyn Defender Services, and the Bronx Defenders. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath to all panelists who will be offering testimony or be available for questions, please raise your right hands. I will read the oath and call on each of you individually for a response. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? Uh, Janet Sable, Thank attorney you. chief of Legal Aid Society. Yes. Uh, Adrian Holder, attorney in charge of the civil practice of the Legal Aid Society. Yes, I do. Tina Luongo, attorney in charge of the criminal defense practice at the Legal Aid Society. Yes, I do. Chris Schreibersdorf, Executive Director at Brooklyn Defender Services. Yes, I do. Justine Olderman, Executive Director at the Bronx Defenders. Yes, I do. Um, and I believe, uh, Ms. Sable, you'll be uh, giving testimony first, is that right? Yes, I will. Thank you so much. Um, we thank you, Chair Adams and the Finance and Justice uh, System Committees for the opportunity to testify today. We're testifying on behalf not only of the Legal Aid Society, but of all the defender organizations as we are all facing significant financial challenges this year. It has been, needless to say, a devastating year. A year ago at Legal Aid, we pivoted our entire organization of 2,200 people to remote operations, and we made enormous adjustments to our service methods to ensure that we remained connected to our clients and, um, and able to engage in the critical representation that they needed. You'll hear more about our vital programs from my colleagues at Legal Aid and Bronx and Brooklyn Defenders, but I cannot begin any public presentation without calling out the inspiring work of the staff of the Legal Aid Society and our sibling um, agencies. Their work has been beyond extraordinary. While they've been struggling with illness and grief and anxiety and uncertainty, working remotely under difficult and demanding conditions and working in the courts, despite their fears about safety, um, our staff across all of our organizations have not stopped delivering um, outstanding legal services and advocacy for our clients and our communities. But at the same time that our staff has been fighting on the front lines, resources and contract funding began to shrink and slow down, causing enormous cash flow challenges that threatened payroll and operational support. At the Legal Aid Society, um, our state funding from the Office of Court Administration that supports our civil and juvenile rights practice were cut by 10%. The New York City indirect cost rate funding supporting our civil and NIFA immigration projects, as well as our criminal defense practice, were reduced by 40%. The New York City cost of living adjustments that we had um, expected from the administration for FY 20 to 23 were eliminated. The promised expansion of pay parities for attorneys was halted and federal aid under the Paycheck Protection Program, um, available to many of our, our sibling organizations, was not available to the Legal Aid Society, and we weren't uh, due to our size and our budget. So we really were left to cover the FY21 shortfall on our own. We are, of course, mindful of the financial challenges that the city and the state have faced this past year. However, in light of what we expect to be an infusion of federal dollars coming to the administration, um, we really, and the fact that the demand for our services has, has far from waned, in fact, it's grown, we really urge you to restore support for our city programs um, and it's more critical than ever. First, I'm gonna talk about um, uh, our general financial issues, and then we'll turn it over to the other members of the panel to talk about programmatic issues. Um, 
we asked the city to follow through on its commitment to pay parity, including re restarting discussions about the promised expansion of parity for attorneys beyond five years of service. As Chair Adams pointed out, thank you very much, uh, Chair Adams, we have not received any parity dollars for either FY20 or the retroactive parity dollar for, uh, for FY20 or 21. But based on the promise from the city at the Legal Aid Society, we turned over those parity dollars to our staff and negotiated a new living wage salary scale for our staff on the expectation that the parity dollars would be baselined in FY21 and beyond. We ask today that the City Council also supplement our Knife Up immigration program with a comparable parity supplement for junior attorneys. And we endorse the Chair's suggestion that Mock J provide parity dollars for the City and State, especially for the money that flows through Mock J. Again, because we expect that there will be additional dollars coming into the City and the State, we believe that it's really time now to renew discussion about the expansion of parity dollars for our more senior attorneys and our supervisors. Turning now to the indirect cost rate funding initiative. This initiative was um, touted as a real, um, as an opportunity for not-for-profits across the city to finally obtain the full cost of the work they were doing um, under city contracts. For the Legal Aid Society, the expected infusion of revenue from the indirect cost program allowed us to begin to address the severely depressed and stagnant salaries of our 1199 support staff and our administrative staff. It was therefore an, a massive blow to be advised shortly after our indirect cost rate um, was approved by the city that our funding was being cut by 40% for FY20 and FY21. And of course, we only learned of this in FY21. And even worse, we learned just this last week that our funding has been cut to a mere 30% of our approved indirect cost rate for FY22. As with parity, we relied upon the city to follow through with its commitments and now ask for the full restoration of the indirect cost rate um, funding initiative. I mentioned it earlier, but it, it, it is worth mentioning again that the Legal Aid Society did not receive even $1 of federal aid to address the unforeseen COVID-related expenses and shortfalls. We were ineligible to participate in the Federal Paycheck Protection Program, so it means we didn't receive any payroll assistance or any forgivable loans nor did we receive $1 of support from the Federal Legal Services Corporation. So despite the imposition of a hiring freeze, which we undertook, and despite all the cuts to our discretionary spending, which we undertook, and our encouragement of staff to resign and take voluntary leaves, we find ourselves in an incredibly challenging financial situation compounded by the major bottlenecks in contracting and processing of amendments by our major funders, the New York State Office of Indigent Legal Services and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. That the, the contracting process and the failure to get paid by our, by, um, uh, the, by Mock J for the, the Office of Indigent Legal Services and Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice funding has been devastating for all of the defender organizations. So today we seek your help in allowing us to continue to do the very important work that we do and to continue to support our staff who do battle on the front lines. So let me turn over now to Adrian Holder, attorney in charge of the civil practice, um, who will be followed by Tina Luongo, um, the attorney in charge of our criminal defense practice, and then over to uh, Brooklyn and Bronx Defenders. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, thanks for this opportunity to testify before you all, um, you all and, and your staff who have been phenomenal partners in our work. Um, representing the civil practice, I'm proud to be on a panel with our criminal defense practice and our um, sibling partners. I'm emphasizing at the point that at the Legal Aid Society, we represent the entire household, an entire community. 
Legal services is an essential component for racial justice and to combat poverty. Our work in this moment has been to advocate for the needs of New York's marginalized communities of color. Those most deeply impacted by what we regard as a triple pandemic, the impact of the coronavirus, um, but also the impact of the economic downturn and then the impact of racial terror. To respond to the crisis, among other actions we have taken, um, we have collaborated with city and state legislators to uh, create pandemic relief legislation, including the Tenant Safe Harbor Act and the COVID-19 Emergency Eviction and Foreclosure Prevention Act that helped extend vital tenant protections. We advocated strongly to safeguard the health and safety of New Yorkers experiencing homelessness and residing in city shelters during the pandemic. A uniquely vulnerable population, in addition to early advocacy that secured accommodation in private rooms for many New Yorkers, we filed a lawsuit to ensure that the city is required to offer everyone in, sh in single shelters their own private room and bathroom for the duration of the pandemic. At the same time, with many of you, including Council Member Inez Barron, we successfully advocated against NIMBYism, ensuring that plans to dismantle the Harmonia and Flatland shelters, housing disabled adult families and families with children, were shelved and fought to ensure that adult men at the Lucerne Hotel on the Upper West Side of Manhattan were able to continue receiving appropriate services in the face of campaigns by local pressure groups. We've continued to be at the forefront of efforts to combat um, I mean, for, to advocate, sorry, uh, immigrant New Yorkers and non-citizen communities across our city. As one of the three New York Immigrant Family Unity Project providers, and the other two are Bronx Defenders and Brooklyn Defender Services, um, our proud siblings, um, together we led un uh, groundbreaking efforts to litigate and advocate for New Yorkers held in dangerous and life-threatening conditions following the widespread transmission of COVID-19 at New York area jails. And as a result of our interventions, we jointly secured the release of 242 detained New Yorkers whose medical history and circumstances made them particularly vulnerable during the pandemic. We pressed the city to ensure adequate internet access for children living in shelters and remote learning during the pandemic. We advocated directly at the federal level to reduce barriers preventing SSI recipients and veterans from automatically receiving CARES Act economic impact payments. We provided dedicated support to nonprofits and small business owners across the city in renegotiating leases, maintaining business viability and understanding their options through the CARES Act um, during the pandemic and throughout. Um, and will continue. And we did that with our community development project, which is part of the city's crisis management system response team. We advocated for survivors of domestic violence during the current crisis, both pushing for systemic changes to ensure their safety and simultaneously continuing to provide support to clients remotely. And we significantly expanded our use of virtual outreach and reached nearly 65,000 New Yorkers through video webinars and virtual trainings between April of 2020 and January. And we did that with a lot of your offices and a lot of you all's assistance. Now, while we have successfully advocated for immigration moratoria and other measures to ensure vulnerable New Yorkers do not face being evicted during a major public health crisis. We envision a potential landslide of evictions and other threats to our clients' housing once tenant protections eventually expire. Further, there continues to be significant need for assistance with employment-related issues for low-wage workers. Our employment law team has seen a three to four-fold increase in cases related to accessing unemployment insurance and a doubling in general non-UI employment matters, including wage theft and employee employment discrimination. As the city navigates a return to more normal business operations and many low-wage workers face being forced back to unsafe work environments, this demand is only set to increase further. The Legal Aid Society has the depth of expertise, the, the breadth of scope, and the capacity to defend and advocate for vulnerable New Yorkers. We are a part of the recovery to address the racial, social, and economic inequities our Black and Brown neighbors face. We therefore respectfully request New York City Council maintain its longstanding support for the following citywide initiatives. The Legal Services for Low Income New Yorkers program um, in fiscal year 2022, we respectfully request a restoration to fiscal year 2020 funding of $6.3 million for all the designated civil legal services providers of which the Legal Aid Society would receive 2.1 million so that we can continue to provide essential services to thousands of families and individuals in New York City. It's this funding that allows us to pivot in moments like this. It's this funding that allows us to go beyond the contracted services that we have in the civil practice to really be truly responsible 
responsive to the emergent needs of our client community. The New York Immigrant Family Unity Project has represented detained immigrants facing deportation since 2014, helping to ensure New York families are not separated simply because they cannot afford an attorney. The nation's first universal legal representation program for detained immigrants, NIFA, provides um, high quality, holistic representation to New Yorkers detained and facing deportation who cannot afford an attorney. And this year we are uh, requesting a, a continuation of the $16.6 .6 million for NIFOB um, split evenly by the three NIFOB providers in the amount of $5.533 million each. Um, and this year we respectfully request that the administration baseline NIFOB funding and the FY22 budget. The Unaccompanied Minor Children and Families Initiative has been providing free legal assistance to unaccompanied children with adults, children, uh, unaccompanied children with adults and uh, children fleeing act, uh, um, endemic gang violence and domestic abuse since 2014 with the support of the New York City Council. Um, we are asking in fiscal year 22 for an enhancement of $1,075,000 for UMFI to cover the increased costs of running this program. This funding has remained flat for years. And um, in fiscal year 20, uh, uh, 2022, and out of that um, full amount, um, the, the full amount for all of the um, unaccompanied um, um, minors and families initiative um, providers, it is $5.15 million that's being sought. Um, so we, our, our, our version of that um, is, is um, a fraction of that, of that cost. And finally, when the budget process is over and when um, the council members um, are looking at Dove money, we definitely would ask um, that the Dove initiative that supports our family law and domestic violence practice, and many of you all have been very supportive of the Legal Aid Society in, um, in previous years, we, would, we request that we be able to maintain that support from the individual members. And so I really do appreciate this moment and um, this time with you all today to be able to testify. You're gonna be hearing more from our other partners that we stand um, in solidarity with. And you'll also be hearing from a lot of our sibling organizations um, on the civil legal services side um, tomorrow. But right now I kick it to Tina Luongo, who is the chief defender um, for our criminal defense practice. And thank you again for your time. Good afternoon, everybody, and good afternoon, Chair Adams and members of the committee, uh, and to the many people in the public who are anxiously waiting to talk about police reform. Um, I just want to take a few moments to talk about some of the areas that actually were covered throughout this day, uh, brought, brought uh, to you by um, the Commissioner of NYPD and his team, and to Mr. Davies, uh, the Commissioner, Mr. Commissioner Davies and his team, and to um, the interim um, director, Mr. Solar and his team from MOCJ. But first and foremost, I think it's really important to sort of recognize that what we learned through COVID is that the systemic issues, the, the racial and social justice, poverty driven issues that plague our clients long before COVID were simply just highlighted and made worse by COVID. And that a return back um, to to what may be seen by some as normal must be actually a return to doing things differently so as to not go back and to learn from the lessons that we have learned through COVID. In fact, uh, this city has been tested in many ways and our client communities have shown through brilliant resistance, uh, resilience and stamina their fight and demand for us to rise as a city in equity, fairness, and humanity. And in fact, um, what I am most proud of is that the staff of our offices join in standing in solidarity side by side with our client communities uh, in making those demands. And so what did we do during this pivot? Um, almost a, actually a little over a year ago, we moved from a in-court, in-person proximal system that was driven by much of the passing of paper in courtrooms and courthouses to a fully remote system. Um, but more importantly, what we needed to do through that as everybody was moving remote was to recognize this one thing, that our clients long before COVID were made invisible by systems and that this was just going to make that problem worse. And so our teams pressed into play 
a series of things to, in every single way we could, squeeze out humanity for our clients and make sure that whatever due process was left by the governor's extension of executive orders that's eviscerated all of the things in the criminal legal system that bring due process, that we find a way to bring that to bear. And so what did we do? Our teams across all of our organizations moved immediately to file hundreds upon hundreds of individual and systemic writs that actually forced and called the question to decarcerate our jails and prisons before the pandemic took lives. And unfortunately, I stand here today being disappointed that some of the leadership, particularly in our state, have ignored our calls for decarceration and vaccination and that we have lost lives while people are being held. We implemented hotlines because as the pandemic spread in our jails and, and prisons, family members could not get the answers they needed from uh, the correctional systems. And so we moved to hotlines where all of our staff started to answer calls, um, calls for help and signals that uh, their family members were in jeopardy. We pushed OCA, DCAS and the Department uh, of Correction to take plans that made safe safer our courts, jails, and prisons. And unfortunately today, I have to report that despite a year long effort for things to be better in our jails and prisons, more sanitary, more clean, more provisions, that has not happened. And in fact, today, uh, just this week, I had to send yet a second letter to the commissioner of DCAS, imploring them to ensure that the MERV ratings that are so necessary for ventilation that were changed in our courts in public spaces be held to those same spaces where incarcerated people are brought for arraignment and court. And to date, we still have not gotten an answer that that remediation would happen. We pivoted and that pivot did not just cost the money that Janet and others are talking about today, but that executive orders also created a backlog of matters. In essence, people who are sort of trapped in limbo in the criminal legal system. Many of our clients in, who are still held uh, at Rikers and in upstate prisons are in limbo to get the relief they need. And so our staff are, have pending caseloads that are larger than ever before. And because we have had to hit the pause on hiring and filling back roles or to, or to implement other provisions for earlier retirement. The fact is that we actually need people more now than ever, staff more now than ever, to meet the growing needs of our clients' matters that are growing day in and day out. That backlog, we are hoping that Mock J and the Offices of Court Administration will do being mindful of how to prioritize backlog cases and not just move things along for the expedience, but to actually look at the matters that must get moved because people's lives are being held in limbo, either in incarceration or through a pending matter, uh, a job might be on the line or a home might be on the line. So what are we asking? We are certainly asking for us to, to have our funding restored. But we are also asking the city council and, and Mock J and the Office of Court Administration, DCAS and DOC to be proactive and come together. We have been asking for a citywide task force on COVID planning in the criminal legal system for all five courts that are standardized, that are transparent and accountable and planned in advance because what is hanging in the balance are our clients. What we're also asking for is, is a call from this city council to the governor to vaccinate those who are incarcerated. It is simply unconscionable that the governor is allowing correctional staff to be vaccinated in the same facilities at the same time, just feet away. There are people being held against their will, not being vaccinated. We are asking for the support. Much of you heard from the, the conversation earlier today 
with MockJ about the full funding of our program partners to ensure that they are ready for the re-entry of people returning home. And I am so proud of the joint effort we took at Legal Aid Society, but I know other defenders in pulling together our task force of re, for re-entry experts to be ready to help bring people home and have them stay home. And finally, and you will hear a, a little bit about this, I think when I turn over to my, my partners, Lisa and Justine, Police reform has been much of a conversation today. The plan that's before you, um, we have said over and over, and the community has said over and over, did not actually include those most impacted. And I think that there will be a much larger response coming in the days ahead to that plan. But I do want to actually elevate the incredible work being done by our Cure Violence partners in communities. That is where reinvestment must be placed, in the hands of the communities, in fact, most impacted and most at the point of knowing what is needed in order to truly, truly create safety. I know we have a long road to come out of, um, of, of COVID in, in a way that makes our city whole but I do want to say that most importantly, as we're thinking about the decisions that should be made, that those decisions are made by people who are practicing every day in the courts and practicing on behalf of and in partnership with those most affected uh, by the challenges of COVID, which are always, always our communities and clients. And on that, I am going to turn it over to Lisa. Thank you. Um, my name is Lisa Schreibestorf. I'm the executive director, <clears throat> excuse me, of Brooklyn Defender Services. Um, if there is anything that this pandemic has made clear, it is that the defender offices in this city provide a service and function that is way beyond what has traditionally been associated with lawyers in court. On behalf of my office and other defenders here and some who are not here, including New York County defenders and Neighborhood Defender Services of Harlem, I wanna thank the city council for its consistent support for our offices and more importantly, for our function. My testimony today is gonna to focus primarily on one of our important programs that you heard from uh, Ms. Holder, which is our NIFA program. Um, it is a program that is fully funded by the city council and it is very important um, that, uh, that the city council continue its support of this program. Um, in the past few years under the Trump administration, um, which included horrifying increase in immigration enforcement, callous policies, and the elimination of just and fair remedies that previously existed in immigration court, the knife of staff of attorneys, social workers, paralegals, and others have been bombarded with tragedy after tragedy but have fought hard to assist hundreds of detained individuals to maintain their right to stay in this country with their families. Um, upon the beginning of the pandemic, like the criminal defense attorneys in all of our offices, our NIFAP attorneys filed dozens of applications to get individual people released, winning the life-saving release of hundreds of people. And um, in addition, on the criminal side, our um, staff also filed you know, numerous multiple um, you know, writs, which included many, many, many people, also winning the release of many, many people. Um, we now know because we've seen recent articles about the deaths that have occurred in, in the jails and also how many people were um, passed away right after they were released, including one of our own clients. Um, so we know that this work is literally life-saving work. Um, more details about this program, of course, um, were described at the immigration hearing earlier uh, last week, I think. And also you heard from Adrian Holder as well. But um, what I really wanted to say is that those of us who do public defense work are committed to representing individuals solely on the basis of need, not based on the meritorious nature of their case or any other factors. This model, which recognizes the humanity in every single person, no matter what they are accused of doing or even what they may have actually done is core to the improvement of the very systems that target people in the city, some of which have been discussed here today. 
Um, and I would like to add, um, I think you'll hear more from Justine Longo, uh, Justine Olderman, um, about also the ACS removals that my office also handles. Um, every single one of these functions um, really operates at the intersection of racism and government overreach. Um, and lawyers in court that fight against wrongful behavior on a daily basis are also an accountability measure. We are a countermeasure. It is crucial that the city council continue supporting all of our programs, particularly um, those that are not as well supported as they probably should be um, by the administration from time to time, especially this year, um, because our organizations need to be stable and we need to be independent in order to continue not just the work we have contracted to do, but also to maximize the very essence of what we do and what we represent in this city, we need to stop having to worry every few months about whether we will or will not be able to continue a particular program, whether we might have to lay off staff, worry about whether we can uh, pay our staff a living wage through pay parity, whether we will lose our indirect rate, whether we will be, our funding will be, um, you know, rolled back to previous years, all of which you've heard about today, um, but mostly whether we have to worry that the city will keep its commitments to us. Um, and that is why our, we are asking the city council to fight for the NIFA program to be baseline this year. Um, it is, um, I think it is, we are in a little bit of fear that people will think that because the Trump administration has ended that somehow the risk to immigrants is less than it was. And in fact, it is not. What happened now is the people who have been facing deportation proceedings will continue to face those proceedings because they've already been instituted against them. Um, they need lawyers more than ever um, because there are remedies possibly now that didn't exist. In the, in the reckoning that is coming now where uh, things like DACA are being reinstated these are, these are remedies that are almost impossible to navigate without an attorney. We know that it is really important that the cases we have, con we have started, must, we must continue and must see them through to the end. We will fight in those courts for um, the types of, you know, moving things off the calendars and getting administrative um, relief through the courts and also um, getting remedies for our clients. Um, but what I really, the reason I think we most want to see this baseline is because we all want to be stable. When our organizations are stable and strong, then we are able to do things like file a lawsuit to get incarcerated individuals a vaccine. We can advocate in Albany and other kinds of systemic change. And we can also do a coat drive in the community in the winter of a pandemic. Our role is so multifaceted from the most individual to the most systemic. And all of our spaces are the exact location where the city needs to do um, the most work to set right uh, the racial and um, just generally oppressive behavior of so many agencies, all of which um, we work in courts, you know, in cases that have been, you know, in really initiated by them. Um, we ask you to strengthen and support Knife Up um, and allow all of our programs to continue, you know, strong. And, um, and thank you again so much for, to Council Member Adams and all the members of the committee for your support. Thank you. Justine. Thank you so much. So over the years, the defenders have testified in front of a host of different committees with different names. There's courts and legal services, there's justice systems, and now we are here today before you, Chair Adams, and the Committee on Public Safety. There are a lot of conversations that I'm sure you are aware of that are happening right now about what exactly public safety means. And there's a growing recognition that true public safety is about more than crime, policing, prosecution, and punishment. It's about affordable housing and quality education and employment opportunities and healthcare. It's about keeping families together and immigrants in their communities. And it is about ending the surveillance of low income communities of color 
by the NYPD, ACS, and ICE. So as organizations that represent low income, predominantly black and brown New Yorkers, not just in criminal cases, but also in civil immigration and family court proceedings, I like to think that our presence before you suggests some sort of symbolic shift in our thinking, a recognition, if you will, that the issues our clients face in these different venues, criminal, family, immigration, and civil, they are inextricably intertwined and so are the legal systems that they are forced to navigate. A drug case in criminal court can lead to an eviction case in housing court. An eviction in housing court can lead to family separation in family court. And what we all know as public defenders is that when a person is caught in the tangled web of our legal system, it can be staggeringly hard to get out. And that makes us all less safe. That is also where we come in. As you have gleaned from the testimony already here today, collectively the defenders in this city work tirelessly to address the drivers of system involvement and mitigate the devastating consequences that flow from it. And there has never ever been a time when the people we serve have been in greater danger of ensnarement in harmful legal systems than now. As I think Tina mentioned, our clients were already struggling with homelessness, unmet physical and mental health needs, underemployment, lack of access to quality education and healthcare when COVID hit. And now what we are hearing every day from our clients is they are literally just struggling to survive. So the need for our services, not surprisingly, as you've heard, has never been greater or more important. So recent studies have shown that investing in our work not only meets the need for legal representation, but is truly transformative. Public defense has been shown to reduce incarceration rates by 16% and incarceration length by 24%. Decrease evictions by 40%, increase the chances of winning a deportation case by 1100%, and decrease time in foster care by four months. Thanks to the council and the mayor's office, most of our funding was steady this past year and we were able to provide high quality support and services that our clients, they've come to expect from each and every one of us across the city despite the pandemic. And we're hopeful that with steady funding in fiscal year 22 and the rectification of the issues that Janet Sable talked about, we'll be able to continue to meet the needs of our clients in the year ahead. You've already heard from Tina about the impact of COVID on our clients in the criminal legal system and Adrian about the importance of our work in related civil legal systems and Lisa about our critical immigration work. And while this committee doesn't oversee ACS, it does have oversight over MOCJ, which is our primary funder for parent representation. So I wanna share a little bit about our groundbreaking work, keeping families together. And then I would like to transition and spend a couple minutes addressing the police reform and reinvention plan that occupied so many hours of this morning's hearing. So there are four organizations in New York City that have contracts with MOCJ to provide representation to parents who are faced with losing their children to the foster system. That's us, the Bronx Defenders, Brooklyn Defenders, Center for Family Representation, and Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem. And collectively, we represent over 1,200 parents every year in Article 10 proceedings. Each of us has an interdisciplinary model of representation, which connects clients not just with lawyers, but social workers and parent advocates. And our model has been incredibly successful in preventing thousands of children from needlessly entering the foster system and reducing the foster care census in New York City by almost 50%. So supporting our model is not just good for families, it's also a good investment. A recent study showed our model translates into nearly $40 million a year in annual savings. And of course, the preservation of the family bonds between parents and children that are so priceless. This past year in our family representation and our parent representation work, it's been devastating in the same ways that you have heard uh, about the devastation in other areas of our practice. While ACS and the court system never stopped separating families, reuniting families separated before the pandemic has been exceedingly difficult. 
access to the courts for reunification has been limited, as has the ability to obtain necessary services. Moreover, parents are struggling just to see their children because of ongoing restrictions on in-person visitation. Our clients facing ACS investigations and allegations of abuse and neglect, they need us more than ever before. Unfortunately, each year, including this one, the mayor has reduced our funding to 2016 levels. Without intervention, we will be forced once again to begin the new year at an extreme deficit and spend every day just hoping and praying for restoration of our full funding. While we have seen a reduction in new case filings, it doesn't mean our workload has decreased or we need fewer resources to provide high quality services. The number of parents we currently represent, which is the best indicator in all of our practice areas of our workload, has not seen that kind of decrease. Moreover, representation has become more complicated because of COVID and prolonged family separation. So what we're asking the city council to do is to hold the mayor accountable for providing legally mandated representation and related services to the parents and children facing um, separation. And while this is gonna be discussed more in tomorrow's general welfare hearing, I did just wanna bring uh, to the attention of you Chair Adams in this committee that we're also asking the council to increase funding for the Right to Family Advocacy Initiative to $3 million, which is 750,000 per organization. Um, for those who aren't familiar with it, this is an innovative cutting edge program that provides support and advocacy to parents who are being investigated by ACS and it helps create what is essentially an off ramp to the legal system by keeping children safely at home and avoiding the need for a case to be filed. So now let me pivot to the last part of my testimony because I know we're all anxious to get to the public portion of the hearing and I am too. I just wanna comment briefly on behalf of the defenders on the police reform and reimagination plan. Like you, Chair Adams, I heard you this morning. I share your frustration that these two hearings had to be put together. But then when I thought about it more and listened to the testimony this morning, I realized that in many ways, they're actually perfectly aligned because our work as defenders has led us to the inevitable conclusion that the only way we can shrink our bloated criminal legal system and begin to address the harm of policing in the low income communities of color that we serve is to free ourselves from the false promise of policing and start investing in alternative strategies for community care. I had originally planned on addressing the fundamental problems with the process that led this to that led us to this point, but given your opening remarks, and I know I've testified before you before on this issue, um, I don't think that's necessary. But I will say that given the lack of transparency, the hasty and haphazard way the process and plan was put together, and the sidelining of grassroots organizations and impacted people who have been working on these issues for decades, it is simply not surprising that the plan does nothing to reimagine the NYPD. If you go through the plan and, and you, you look at the, the word usage, you'll see things like expand, enhance, th strengthen, consolidate, to describe the vision of the mayor and the NYPD. It is a vision that imagines increasing control and power and responsibility of the police force. It literally moves us in the opposite direction from where we need to go. And perhaps there is just no better proof of what we can expect from this plan than the testimony this morning of Commissioner Shea. I don't know, I don't know how else to put it, except my experience sitting here listening to him was that it was as if the front page of the New York Post grew arms and legs, was given a badge, and got propped up before this committee. Because his testimony was filled with front page fear mongering. He spent time citing increases in violence and sharing the personal details of the most recent victims of gun violence. Why? For the same reason that the New York Post does it, to somehow scare us into believing that policing is the answer to violence and a salve for the pain that it causes. 
but we know better. This council knows better. If we want to reduce violence, we should be spending our scarce city resources on people, on communities, on education, job training, affordable housing, mental health care. And the other way we know that this plan doesn't contain the vision and the transformation we need is because this morning, as we sat here and listened to them testify, on the one, out of one side of their mouth, they gave lip service to historical harm and desire for change. But you also heard things like this, over-policing. It's not what we do. We do targeted policing. Gun crime is down because of court closure. And we have the best police department in the world. Are those really the words of people we can trust to reform and reinvent itself? True reform is not going to come from the NYPD or this mayor. It is going to come from the people that are going to testify next and you as their representatives. It's going to come when we start divesting from policing and start investing in alternatives. There are so many examples across the country of communities who are trying to truly transform policing, taking them out of schools, out of the business of traffic enforcement, out of the business of responding to people in crisis and are building true alternatives that make us safer. We should be following their plans, not this one. What this council does next, it is going to be its lasting legacy. Voting yes, it might be easy, but it won't bring the transformation that the people of this city need and deserve. Voting no will take courage, but if we care about a real response to the call for change that rang out through the streets of this city last summer, then the mayor has left us with no choice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair Adams, do you have any questions? I do, I do. Thank you, Justine. You just took my breath away as usual. Um, very powerful uh, to all of my uh, all of my legal aid partners. I say welcome. It's wonderful to see you all as always. Um, I just want to go back to where we started, and really maybe just where I started uh, this line of questioning, particularly with Mock J, and and going back to the pay parity issue, um, as we've already addressed with Mock J and has been addressed in your testimony, all of you, the pay parity deal that was negotiated as part of the FY 2020 budget has not been dispersed and the administration has not fulfilled its commitment to the deal. So I'm just gonna ask you for the record, can you please share what OMB and Mock J have communicated with you? Also for the record, can you please speak to how this delay has impacted your office how many of you have already dispersed the funding to your employees despite not having the allocations at all? Anyone can start, anyone can take that. Uh, Janet, did you wanna? I, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll take it as, sorry, I was waiting to be unmuted. Uh, thank you, Chair Adams. So, you know, we, we have heard nothing from OMB um, at least at the Legal Aid Society, we've heard nothing from OMB at all. Um, we have been working with both Mock J and with HRA on, um, you know, figuring out and trying to address what our parity dollars actually look like. And I, you know, what we don't know is what happens with those that analysis and those calculations. Um, and what Mock J is going, uh, what uh, OMB is going to do about it. Um, we've it's certainly been suggested that OMB may be the cause of the delay here, um, but there also has been, uh, you know, there's been a lot of slow uptake from both Mock J and HRA. But we are in the process of of uh, talking to them about what the numbers would look like, and so that's the one answer to your question. Another part is, as I testified, we gave that money to our attorneys immediately. And we did it because it was the right thing to do, because there was an imperative in moving forward on the parity dollars, because their salaries were woefully inadequate 
compared to um, their colleagues in the in corporation council. And so we felt it was in, incredibly important for us to give that money and augment their salaries immediately. And we did it based on the commitment that the, the parity dollars that we would receive would be retroactive to the earlier fiscal year. So we gave the money to our staff retroactively. And we're sitting here holding the bag right now in a way that is um, making us very vulnerable. And because of the issues that I raised about our cash flow is our cash flow concerns and the difficulty that all of the defender organizations are having really turning on the funding that is owed to us for work that we have done over the past several years from, um, from Mock J and from the from uh, the Office of Indigent Legal Services, which now flows through Mock J, we're all sitting here, you know, angsting about cash flow for work that we've done, for work that we revenue that should be in our hands. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Did you have anything you want to add? I'll just. No, I just wanted to say that um, we had all uh, I my office, and I know some of the others. Um, also did give that um, to our staff, even though, you know, just based on the commitment. And right. I wanted to say that, you know, I've been, BDS is like 25 years old and I have never before ever had a situation where the city committed something to me and it did not come to pass. This is a very unusual situation. Um, one of the other things that happened was because they had offered us the possibility of using last year's COLA raise to kind of even out the pay parity with the people that were on the, like, let's say the higher steps, because pay parity only goes steps one through five, that, um, uh, that we had proposed, you know, how we would like to do that. And they never gave us an answer about whether that was or not, it was not acceptable. So not only was the pay parity money never, you know, come to fruition, but we were basically unable to even submit for our COLA because we never got approval of how we were spending it. Yeah, and I'll just add, same for the Bronx Defenders, and I know also for Center for Family uh, Representation that we all gave out that money in that reliance um, on being reimbursed. So I know for the Bronx Defenders alone, the 2020 number that is owed to us is you know, at, at least a million dollars, let alone the, the um, money for fiscal year uh, 21. And the other thing just to, to add some context to it is not only is there the issue that Lisa talked about, about sort of the compression at the top and the fact that we should be in phase two for the next sort of uh, range of attorneys, but many of us fought really hard and, and fought unsuccessfully, which, you know, we, we don't like fighting and, and losing. It's not, sort of not in our nature. Um, but um, for pay parity to extend not just to lawyers, because when you increase the salaries for lawyers, all of our, our all of our organizations are based on interdisciplinary models where non-attorney roles are critical to our holistic representation of our clients and being able to meet their needs. And so creating this sort of wage gap between lawyers and non-lawyers is also something that we fought really hard. And since uh, we were not able to secure a promise of funding in that round for non-lawyer staff, many of us increased the funding for non-lawyer staff and the salaries for non-lawyer staff because we couldn't bear to have that kind of inequity uh, in our organizations. And so that further exacerbates not getting reimbursed at least for the one through five. And if, if I might, uh, Chair Adams, add to this, that one of the other representations that OMB made to us was that the indirect cost rate program, to the extent that each of our organizations might see additional revenue as a result of the IC, of ICR, that we could use that money to do just what Justine is talking about, to cover either the higher level of staff who weren't getting pay parity in the first round of negotiations, or to use it for our non-attorney staff because we weren't able to persuade the city to extend parity to the non-attorneys. And that is exactly what we did at Legal Aid. And we used very conservative numbers. I mean, we're not being irrational here or you know, bold and, and sort of operating and budgeting on a whim. We really believed that the city was gonna follow through on its commitment and use those dollars 
to um, address some real inequity in our 1199 staff members salary as a result. And we were using our indirect cost rate dollars for doing that. And then they were cut from us before we saw a dime. Yeah, you know, thank you, Janet. Uh, you know, I, I think I want to stay there because I, I'm, I'm going to try to differentiate. Um, th this is so disturbing. The more I hear it, the more disturbing it, it becomes to me. In, in differentiating what you're talking about right now with the pay parity between the COVID-19 expenses, it's our understanding that the public defense providers have had to pay out of pocket for expenses related to COVID-19 to equip your staff with the necessary tools to work from home and provide representation for your clients in virtual court. How much did you all spend collectively on these necessary expenses in FY 2020? And how much have you spent year to date, if you know? Um, and how much do you expect to spend in FY 21? And if the costs are not reimbursed, tell us what the ramifications will be. So I would have to get back to you on our actual numbers for the Legal Aid Society, but I will point out that um, this is one place where we may be in a different situation than the other organizations because we are citywide and because we have the three practice areas, we were too large to be eligible for any of the paycheck protection money. So, um, and so we weren't able to take out loans. We weren't able to get any additional revenue. Um, so we have been covering these expenses. We have received some money from Mock J um, to pay for some limited amount of COVID expenses. And similarly, we have some money that came from HRA, um, but it covered a discrete period of time and we have many more expenses and we'll get back to you with that. Okay. I can answer that. Um, yeah. What happened was about uh, the beginning of 2020, there was a big change in the discovery law, which then, um, and, and the criminal side, which um, really put all of us and the prosecutors actually in a position where we didn't have the technology to take the amount of data that we needed to get from the DAs. I mean, some examples are the, the amount of um, body cam footage that is now, you know, they required to turn it over and we're required to accept and store. And it's a large amount of work and effort and storage space and downloading and uploading and even just people uh, power to, to do that. And the city had committed at that time that they were gonna give us some money towards that, um, which to my understanding also didn't come to full fruition. But um, it also, because I'm not completely clear and I would get back to you on the specifics, there's, there's that kind of money, then there was some money they offered us in terms of COVID, which very similarly, they ask you what you need, you give them an answer, you don't get an answer back from them. Maybe they tell you something and then later on, it doesn't actually come to fruition. But I can tell you from my, from my staff, we did not have laptops for every single staff member in our organization when this started. So on a very basic minimum level, we had to immediately get enough laptops so everybody could work from home, including downloading the discovery. And that's every single staff member, not just attorneys, but our admins, social workers, attorneys, um, really everybody, paralegals, everybody that works in the organization. Um, you know, it's, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to build the technology. We were still operating on hard files when we went home. And the courts have now changed to essentially virtual files and are now going into e-filing. So it's not just the technology, it's also the software, it's the filing systems, it's every single thing that we can do to operate in this new universe, which I'm sure will be ongoing and it's not going to go back, which maybe is for the better for some of it, but um, we are very short of the money that we need. And I know we didn't um, talk about this, you know, I know we've mentioned that this cash flow problem, but the amount that the city owes us is so extreme that even if we could find a way to find that money in our budget, it, without getting the actual cash reimbursed at this point, most of us are going paycheck to paycheck at this point, we where are. We are, we're getting almost daily updates about whether or not we have enough money in the bank account to make the next payroll, um, which is, you know, I think our office is owed like $20 million right now by this, by, you know, combination of city and some of the state money that passes through the city. 
So um, we were fortunate that we were able to qualify for a PPP loan this time, but not last time. Um, but there's no way to know in advance how much of that might be forgiven. We're grateful for the assistance and the cash flow, but I just want to be clear that that only really covers payroll and rent, and all of the expenses you're asking about can never really be supported by those loans, which you know are hopeful and you know hopefully contribute a bit that we need. So um, I don't know if, if Justine or some of the other organizations have. Yeah, I do. I, I have those numbers. Uh, it looks like in fiscal year 20, we spend like approximately $150,000 in COVID expenses. The problem for fiscal year 21 is that we are going to have to do some major changes to our space to help people safely return, um, especially once the courts reopen. And so we expect, and, and that's more expensive than, you know, even laptops and, and software. And so uh, we anticipate that, that um, the, the figures will rise and problematically to your point, and I appreciate you noting this, that we don't have any guarantee that we're gonna get reimbursed for that. And so we don't have any choice but to bring people back. And so we are definitely gonna be um, in a situation where we're gonna be you know, sort of experiencing financial strain if we have to put that money out. And once again, um, aren't, aren't reimbursed for it. Uh, I just wanna pick up one other thing that Lisa just commented on, which is the discovery uh, reform implementation initiative. So, one of the issues, and, and feel free just to shake your head if this is too, too in the weeds, um, but one of the things that happened was that that initiative um, you know, came through and the funding came through mid fiscal year. And so we were given um, half of the money as expected that we had budgeted for. And we fully anticipated that in the next year in fiscal year 21, that we would be restored to the full annual funding of you know, the work necessary to keep up uh, with the reform initiatives. And our unexpectedly, without explanation um, and still not rectified, our personnel budget was cut by 50%. So we, that is another place where we expected to have revenue, where the um, city has fallen short on what they led us to believe would be forthcoming in this fiscal year. You begin to get the sense, right? We didn't get major cuts to our core you know, city contracts, but these things add up between the pay parity and the COLA and the indirect rate and you know, the discovery money and the COVID expenses. You can understand why Janet started off by saying that you know, in, in many ways, we are really facing kind of extreme financial instability and strain right now. Sure, absolutely. And, and you actually touched on the B part of my question. I was going into the capital, but you touched right. on that also. Um, uh, you and Janet touched on the capital also and bringing your staff back and changes are going to have to be made. And that's more right. Right. on the capital side also. So this thing continues to compound most disturbing. Um, okay. Let, let's look a little bit, let, let's shift gears just a little bit and talk about um, criminal justice changes. Um, because of COVID-19, New York courts have transitioned to virtual operations, including arraignments and the city established programs like the early release of, uh, or 6A program, which I touched on uh, with Mock J, um, and have begun uh, electronic monitoring. How have these operations and changes either helped or hindered your clients? So I, I'll take the first pass and then can turn it over to others. Uh, certainly the, the, the uh, providing of uh, Rhea and Mokje sort of working in tandem with us to and our social work teams to provide uh, stable housing through hotel space to sort of reintegrate people was clearly important because when we were going in making applications to the courts or trying to make uh, asked the, uh, for district attorneys to reevaluate their bail uh, during a pendency of a matter, having uh, sort of having a home that was uh, also, um, also COVID compliant and allow for social distancing was really important. So clearly that was a, a critical and, and now that we are now that we are sort of again sort of making this opening up this sort of this next pathway, 
really thinking about ways in which to systematize that going forward to the benefit of our clients, because there's always going to be clients returning home, particularly from upstate, as well as uh, those um, who are at Rikers during, a, uh, during the pendency of a trial, uh, a case. The, the, the other thing that, but I, I wanna sort of say that there is a bit of a conversation happening and started with the governor. I'm happy to say, I don't think that Albany will enact this, but that there is this idea that we should continue virtual proceedings because they're more efficient and more effective. They are not, they are dehumanizing. The uh, data shows that judges will more likely set bail when they can, um, when someone is not in front of them, right? And this. Right, this idea that that this should this system should remain in place. It is terrible and it should not. But we need to get our court systems to a place where they are safe for us to return and do it in a in a safe uh, manner. Which is another thing that we did in another capital expense is that the defenders self funded an expert to evaluate our court systems and provide a report. Um, um, that was not reimbursed by any of our contracts which to me strikes me as a bit odd, right? Because we are looking at the whole safety of, the, of all, all the stakeholders, but we took right. that on and we have yet to meet the OCA epidemiologist nor see a report. Um, that being said, as to electronic monitor, um, I will say that while the city did announce it, 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 was, um, it was not a program that was uh, over, over -utilized, utilized at all. In many ways, it wasn't. In some ways, Clients did and client families did appreciate during the height of a pandemic this option. But again, as we sort of move to this next phase, electronic monitoring is con uh, community confinement and it shouldn't be used in, in lieu of providing services that actually truly decarcerate and remove, remove over, over surveilling of clients that, that are in the community waiting for their matters to move. In fact, what we have seen during this time is that clients who have, have stayed in contact with us, we have provided cell phones to all of our teams. We are able to, to connect to our clients and are connecting to our clients on a regular basis, uh, answering questions for them. Um, and so that, um, that sort of breadth of services, again, services are important, but it would be, it, it is a time for us to think about providing these services separate and apart than a pending matter separate apart, of an, uh, uh, apart from the negotiation that happens with the district attorney about an outcome of a case um, and removing the criminal legal system from actually the service provisions in, 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 the, in the communities. And in fact, I'm happy to hear that the ATLAS program is taking a different, uh, was mentioned by Mach Jay, uh, to sort of remove it actually and put it into communities and away from the criminal legal system. With that, I'll turn it over to my colleagues who may have other things to add. You know, I just want I just want to interject because you hit on a lot of a lot of good stuff. What resources and programs would your organization need in the long run to support some of the types of things that you just discussed? Right. You know, for us, it is the it is the defense team, the holistic defense team, right? It's the thing that Janet and Justine talked about when we talked about the equity of funding our, our staffs that provide the non-legal services. Sometimes I'm going to say this, I'm a defender and a defender at heart and very proud of being a lawyer, but I will say that the people who are most often the folks on our teams that are providing the services that the clients need the most is not always the attorney. It is the social worker, it is the paralegal, it's the community organizer, it's the support person, it's our hot person who fields a call from a hotline. Um, they're the folks that are working to connect the systems to create the, the, the framework for the, so that staffing and a recognition that when we are talking about pay parity and we are talking about staffing up, we're talking about staffing our entire teams. And what is really interesting, uh, Chairwoman, is to sort of recognize the, the nexus between what was talked a lot about today, even during Mock J talking about how the number of people incarcerated during COVID has gone up. Now I stand with, uh, with Justine and the members of the public who are gonna talk about Commissioner Shea's um, sort of fear mongering that, you know, that the sky is falling and our streets are, are terribly violent. In fact, though, the rollback of the bail reforms is actually what has caused this. 
and also the fact that we were in a unprecedented pandemic and services were cut off mostly for clients with mental health needs the, and, and we are here. And so at the pivot moment where the rollback of bail, um, COVID has created an increase in people in uh, at Rikers on more serious charges, you need experience. That is pay parity too. And the conversations we should have about our staff that are, are six years and above and the most senior people who, are, who can actually help and come support people who are navigating multiple issues as a result of being accused of a serious crime. Um, and so it's support services in terms of staffing. And it is also, I will say that, that there was a talk about um, Project Reset. And while I really think that it is time for um, us in this city to think about how we can do away with project programs like that and just simply not make uh, arrests of people on low level offenses, um, it has created a, a value it right now during COVID to help us connect, continue to keep people connected in services. Can I add something to that? I really, I think it's important to be really thoughtful about who should be providing services as we divest from the criminal legal system. And while I agree completely, and I know it is completely critical and crucial that we play a role in that transition period, and I really appreciate you asking that. Um, it is really important that we only be seen as a bridge and that all of these processes that we're trying to do seen as a bridge to moving all of these services into the community. Because this is not about, you know, um, okay, we'll arrest as many people, the DAs will be gracious and divert people, we'll provide all these services and then everybody, you know, sort of a happy ending. Right, it's too, that is not really what the criminal legal system should be doing. We should be litigating whether or not somebody committed a very serious, you know, accusation against them or not. We should be litigating in court. We should be holding government accountable to proper behavior. Um, there are times when it is very clear that services are really needed in order to resolve a case. But um, all of these services, which we sometimes call wraparound services, which my office, you know, has extensive housing, education, employment. Um, you know, and benefits and every other kind of service, immigration in particular, um, these things are a bridge um, to, to like really hold like the line while we divest from the entire criminal legal system and make all of these services available in the community on demand when needed through respite, you know, centers and all kinds of ways in which people can drop in to take care of a crisis and avoid all of us. And, you know, that will be a successful ending. Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask uh, one more area here and then I'm going to um, ask my colleagues to chime in with their questions. Just in talking about Article 10 cases, we haven't really touched on the family um, court contracts um, a, a whole lot over the past, what, about an hour now we've been chatting, I think, um, maybe a little over which is fine. Um, the past three fiscal years have included $8.7 million uh, in one-time funding to support an increase in Article 10 family and abuse neglect cases. Mock J and OMB shared with the committee that they were continuing to monitor the situation. The uh, FY 2022 preliminary plan did not include one-time funding this year. Is it safe to assume that this means that the issue has been resolved? Or do family court providers require more funding? What is the dollar figure required to right size the Article 10 budget? Um, thank you for highlighting that. I do often feel that even Mokche forgets that they are the funder for our parent critical parent representation work. Um, so this has been a consistent issue uh, for our organizations since fiscal year 17 that every year we start the year at fiscal year 16 levels, even though MOCJ itself has acknowledged that those levels are woefully inadequate to be able to meet current need. And so there is nothing about this year that is different. While intake is down as it is in lots of you know, different court systems, 
The, the measure of our workload is our pending matters, as well as looking at how complicated that representation is. And across all of our different practice areas, and certainly when it comes to parent representation, representing parents who have had their children taken from them, who are desperately every second of every day trying to access the services and the courts necessary to be able to reunite their families has become exceedingly difficult. So the system did not stop for family separation, but it essentially ground to a halt for family reunification. So our pending caseload is growing. The work of connecting people to the services that are the precursor to family reunification, to being able to get the cases in front of the courts, to be able to litigate um, separation and litigate uh, reunification is extremely difficult. And so there's nothing about the work that has changed except it's gotten more complicated and more difficult. And yet the funding has been once again, put back at fiscal year 16 levels. Lisa, I don't have in front of me, I don't know if you do the total numbers, but I can tell you for our organization, uh, we are normally funded in the range of $10 million. And what they have told us will be in our fiscal year 22 amendment is in the range of $7 million. It's very yeah. similar. Yeah. In, years, in years past, right, we have sort of like, on a wing and a prayer. We just, you know, we keep marching forward with faith that OMB will actually deliver and restore, you know, the necessary funding levels. You know, as like sort of Lisa mentioned with respect to Knife Up this year, we're, we're more concerned, especially with MACJ and OMB in particular, having um, really betrayed their, their pay parity promise. Um, we have some concerns about what is going to happen this year, and we really need the council's help making sure that those funding levels are restored. I mean, that without those rest, the restoration of those funding levels, it would literally be catastrophic for families in low-income communities that we serve. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Chair Adams, one other thing I just yes. wanted to bring to your attention, sure. not as critical, but just to make you aware, since you were asking about Article 10, is that yep. we are, MACJ is already behind in the RFP process for Article 10 representation. Right. And I think we have... <laughs> Chairperson Rosenthal, I'm, I'm looking at your hands on your face. I share that. I share that expression yeah. internally. My hands are on my face too. Um, so we are a year behind. Um, and as you are, I'm sure, um, you know, well aware, there has been a lot of turnover at the agency. And we have some real concerns about the timeliness of that process and it being rushed. RFPs are really incredible opportunities to rethink the way we are representing low-income people, the kinds of services we are providing, an opportunity to look at those studies and see what works and how you know, we can ultimately build a really successful program. And if it's rushed and there isn't the opportunity for meaningful input, even if we get it done on time, um, you know, we're in danger of, of not coming out really with a kind of thoughtful new, um, you know, sort of basis for, for future contracting that parents deserve. Thank you. I appreciate your testimony. Council, turning it over to you for uh, council member questions. I have council member Rosenthal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, it's so refreshing to hear all of you talk because this morning I, I, we were in La La Land and, you know, you, you need somebody to say, to validate, like, you know, no, you know, it, it's, it's nonsensical. So I really appreciate you all for that. Um, so I have some just quick, quick, uh, nerdy technical questions. Um, does everyone have a contract registered for this fiscal year? Any contract? Yes. You know, uh, one thing you could do is, I don't know if you already do this. Do you use the returnable loan grant? 
We've tried, we've actually had begun conversations about that and we're told, I believe that Mach J doesn't have any money to put towards that. You're talking about going to the um, fund for the city of New yeah. York, right? They told us that there was no money or that- yeah, they don't know what they're talking about. So- um, but, but, that, but that, they were saying they wouldn't assist us in that process. Right. And so you need to reach out to the mayor's office of contracts. Okay. Um, and I'm sure staff here can send it along to all of you, but that would be that's great. who you reach out to, to make it happen. And then the second reason I'm asking if you already have something registered is because if there is a registered contract, but they're late in payment, the city owes you interest on that money. Um, and I don't quite know how to finagle it because of course you don't have a contract registered with the, you know, indirect rates or the pay parity or the additional work, but I think it's worth exploring. I mean, have you all sort of added up how much interest you're paying on the loans you have to take out? Well, we haven't we haven't addressed that issue at Legal Aid, but what I will say is that there's another wrinkle because um, this is an interesting idea. But you know, for some of our contracts, it once in order to make any of these changes, like pay parity or a new addition of any kind of money, you're be, we're being asked to submit a budget modification. And once there's a budget modification in the system, it stops payment of the other contracts. Wait, what? That's so you how, have a registered contract. But when you when you're when you're processing a budget modification, I believe I'm getting this correct. Um, but when you process a budget modification, you can't make submissions under your registered contract if you're modifying if there's a budget mod outstanding yeah. that that affects your registered contract. So it may create a situation where they're not technically late because we're doing everything through the budget mod process. But one of the things that we're trying to talk to them about is how do we how do we deal with this? Yeah. How do we do budget mods over here, but you pay us over, you know, yeah. what we're owed. Let's take this discussion offline. I don't want to use too much time. It's incredibly important. And I see that the finance staff is on this um, Zoom. So I'll follow up with her and, and maybe we can try to unravel what's Great. going on there. Um, hmm. Yeah, I'm still back in my heads and my hands. I, I can't <laughs> hard to get beyond that and just, you know, really appreciate and admire the work you do. Do you think that on, you know how there's right to counsel for housing? Yeah. I mean, why don't we have right to counsel for these other issues? Is that hard? I'm not clear which issues you're... So the, the parent representation, right, it's not um, not across the country, but in New York State, there is right to counsel for parent representation. And obviously in criminal courts, it's constitutionally mandated. Um, there is right to counsel now through the city funded, city council funded initi initiative right. for NIFEP. Um, and there's the right to counsel that is still growing in housing court. Um, the other areas that, you know, Adrian uh, talked about, all the other sort of life essentials, um, you know, don't require representation, don't require counsel. Um, and Adrian, you can speak to this much more. There is sort of a, a movement across the country for a more universal right to counsel in civil proceedings. I don't know if there's anything you want to add about that, Adrian. She needs to be un unmuted. She needs to be unmuted. Thank yes. You. Thank 
Thanks. Um, I don't have I don't have a lot to add, but absolutely, there there's definitely a movement, um, you know, that we're calling Civil Gideon, um, because we because I think um, as people who are trying to um, um, look at how it is that we can eradicate poverty and make sure that folks are able to fully realize um, what we are supposed to be promising in our society that there would be this emphasis on funding these other services and so you know new york has been a leader in 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 particular areas of some of this and it would be great to be able to see it expansive you can tell by the way that we actually coordinate with our sibling organizations um, on immigration services and and how we feel about the holistic representation which all of the the three organizations on on uh, on this panel really embrace that it really is creating true opportunities and helping to really get to the issue of resolving um this is the systemic um, racism and um inequalities that our clients and our client communities are facing well um adrian can you and i follow up on that and maybe you know um chair adams will pursue it, you know, legislatively, you know, Chair Adams, we could talk about that. I don't know, you know, just sort of kick around these ideas um, because HRA has embraced the right to counsel for housing, you know, would Mock J embrace, you know, right to counsel and the other issues? I don't know. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you experts is, it sounds like you're not thrilled with um, the mayor's plan that he came up with. Do you have a, um, have you mapped out a strategic plan for how to, you know, get to where uh, all of you are talking about where we're going? Um I will certainly say that, you know, um, our office, the Bronx Defenders and Neighborhood Defender Services of Harlem had three representatives that uh, uh, that um, uh, on behalf of all the defender organizations to 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 join what was supposed to be a um, integrated uh, uh, working group rights task force in our city uh, to come up with this plan that would have the buy-in mo of mostly community members. Right. Um, and Justine were, was in those meetings, but I will tell you um, that the report back I continued to get from Corey Stoughton, who heads up our law reform unit, who was one of the members over and over was that it was a sham. Um, there was no real buy-in. Um, that the meetings were so structured, even with the defenders, um, that it was a P PR campaign. Yeah. Um, and certainly, you know, we have a community justice unit that's part of the the cure violence movement with a sort of legal arm of the of the holistic approach. And um, even our, even the the those members who are in the community working with our partners would be given the link. Uh, a couple of hours before for the quote, quote, community town halls. And they were structured such that there were no real questions, that the questions were fed through a webinar format, and they were all selected um, selected by the commissioner to answer. Um, and, and so the real, the real plan here has to start with, with communities. Um, and uh, and what we talked about earlier today, which is the real investment in communities to have this idea of public safety be owned by them and less from our police. Uh, I don't know if J Justine, you want to sort of talk also about some of the details about how you kept trying. Yeah, I mean, I think we've talked about it, you know, before uh, at other hearings that Chair Adams, you know, you have held uh, even before the plan came out, um, you know, and I will share with you since you asked this question, I think Chair Adams this morning, you know, what kind of outreach did they do after the plan came out? 
I'll tell you candidly, they reached out to us, the, the three defenders that were originally invited to be part of this sort of sham committee. Um, and we told them very clearly that it's like a little, you know, it's, it's too late for meaningful input from us and that we they have lost all of our trust and we don't trust them um, to be able to take that input, you know, and have it incorporated in any meaningful way. You asked questions about how many people had, you know, commented that that shouldn't have been hard for them to find, you know, about what that what the community had responded and how many people had responded to the plan. Like, you know, the, the it's clear that their plan is just to hope that the city council rubber stamps this and they can go back to sort of the smoke and mirrors of reform and trainings and enhancements and groups that take a closer look at things. The plan really has to come from council. The plan really has to be, uh, and I hope we're, we're starting it today, is to convince the council that voting yes on this plan is not going to bring about the transformation that this city needs and deserves. Um, and that the plan, it, you know, if and when there is one that this council votes on and advances, it has got to include divestment in whole from huge swaths of the things that we have essentially just turned over to the police department to solve for us that they really have no business being involved in. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna see back to the chair because I know that we're, we've been going a long time. So, thank but you. Uh, Chair Adams, I mean, and, and to everyone, Justine, I still have your card sitting on my dresser should anything call ever happen. Anytime. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm looking around and this Zoom at all the people who I know are uh, really have access to the answers, have access to community to get us to the right path. And um, just wanted to let you know how much I appreciate your work. Thank you. And we appreciate your support. <laughs> Thank you, council member. Um, I don't see any other hands raised from other council members. So chair, unless you have more questions, I think we will turn to public testimony. I just want to say thank you again uh, to our great partners, um, Legal Aid, and our, of course, our great defenders. Um, again, your input is invaluable to this committee uh, and to my colleagues. Um, we take nothing that you say lightly. We do take everything that you say to heart. So we thank you very much for your input as always. Thank you so much for being a part of this panel today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair, very much. Thank you for holding an extraordinary hearing. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you, everyone. And I will be turning over moderator duties to Matt Thompson. Um, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the members of the public who have waited for so long. Great job today, Dan. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Council. And thank you, Chair. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical Council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin your testimony once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function. And I will call on you in the order you raised your hand after the panelist has completed their testimony. Council members, you will have a total of five minutes to ask your question and receive an answer from the panelists. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you um, and the sergeant at arms will set the timer, then give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would, not, I would now like to welcome the following panelists to testify. First up is Shane Correa from the Center for Court Innovation. After Shane, I will be calling on Ravi Reddy from the Asian American Federation followed by Michelle Cortez from the Center for Family Representation, and then followed by Tahira Coles from the Center for Family Representation. Time starts now. Great, thank you so much, Chair Adams and members of the New York City Council for being here and uh, throughout this entire day of testimony. My name is Shane Karaya. I work at the Center for Court Innovation and I wanna focus this testimony on some of the most time sensitive issues and time permitting uh, to the longer horizon issues that COVID has created uncertainty about for us in our organization. 
The first issue is related to the Innovative Criminal Justice Initiative, which accounts for core funding for the Center for Court Innovation to flexibly respond to the needs of our communities. During the fiscal year 21 budget, our award was halved. And during COVID, that was unfortunate as we had to make hard choices to focus on issues like housing stability, mental health responses, and domestic violence programming, while simultaneously cutting services uh, due to the budget cuts in areas like anti-gun violence programming, child trauma support, and DWI screenings and assessments during a year when traffic safety deaths reached some of the highest levels since the start of Vision Zero. We ask Council to support a return to fiscal year 20 levels or more so, so that we can continue to pilot, evaluate, and assess models that grow through public, that we can grow through public and private funding spanning all levels of governments and donors. Next, in regarding uh, the issue of reducing unnecessary incarceration, we are heartened mm -hmm. to see the commitment to the points of agreement. Uh, as an organization that implements programs relevant to that, we'd like to draw your attention to the issue on pre-arraignment diversion. Currently, we operate Project Reset in the Bronx thanks to Schedule C Council funding. However, with no date in the POA, we're uncertain as to mm -hmm. when the city plans to roll out citywide funding for pre-arraignment diversion again. During fiscal year 20, we implemented it in the outer boroughs, but by the end of the fiscal year, due to the pandemic, Funds were cut and we were again limited to the services that we operate in the Bronx thanks to council support and in Manhattan thanks to support from dwindling asset forfeiture funds from Daney. We ask that council help provide clarity for us so that we can understand when more New Yorkers will have access to pre-arraignment diversion, which helps prevent unnecessary bench warrants to help us lower the population in Rikers. The next issue that I'd like to draw your attention to is that regarding the mayor's action plan and our uh, program of neighborhood safety initiatives, which helps connect residents in some of the worst, viol uh, most violently hit public housing communities with administration officials so that their voices can be directly heard. While most of MAP has been baselined, this community uh, engagement portion of the program is set to expire in fiscal year 2022. We're hoping for clarity so that we can understand how to best support these communities longer term and ensure their voices are heard uh, going forward. With the, my time uh, limiting, I, I won't start on the other two components, but I look forward to being able to connect with y'all in the future. And thank you for taking this time to listen to us. Thank you. I will now be calling on Ravi Reddy to testify. Time starts now. Thank you so much for your patience and giving us the opportunity to speak today. You, you've been here forever and just thank you for the opportunity and still have the ears to hear what we have to say. Uh, I'm Ravi Reddy, the Associate Director for Advocacy and Policy at the Asian American Federation. The, these city budget conversations are coming at a critical time for our community and for the entire city. As we look to the pandemic recovery, we're staring down an unprecedented rise in anti-Asian hate crimes rooted in racist rhetoric since the beginning of the pandemic. And since early 2020, nearly 500 reports of bias incidents and hate crimes have been collected by our reporting tool, the Stop AAPI Hate Platform, NYPD, and the City's Commission on Human Rights. The rise in anti-Asian xenophobia and violence in our city has been palpable since the first news of COVID-19 hit our airwaves and has compounded the practical challenges our community members are facing alongside our fellow New Yorkers. From an 81-year-old Asian woman who was lit on fire by two asylums last year in Brooklyn to the violent assault of a Filipino-American, Noel Quintana, on his way to work earlier this month, vivid violent assaults on Asian New Yorkers are impacting how our community members relate to their city. Bias incidents are significantly underreported as 70% of Asian New Yorkers are immigrants and systemic factors like high poverty, high LEP rates, and lack of immigration status deter reporting and reinforce continued systemic inadequacies. As such, City Council must use this budget to address the dire need to expand the capacity to track anti-Asian bias incidents, including supporting efforts by Asian organizations to collect reports in language and through channels most accessible to the community. But that's only one facet of the challenge. A recent survey conducted by our organization of Asian small business owners showed that over 60% of respondents said they were worried about anti-Asian bias and hate crimes for the safety of themselves, their staff, and their business establishment. And are most vulnerable, our seniors, continue to be further isolated within their own city, not just due to the pandemic, but also because they're afraid of getting attacked if they go out. 
the city needs to invest in community-based safety measures run by Asian organizations to provide an immediate response to street violence and support the coordination and rollout of a safety ambassador program to escort vulnerable Asian immigrants in public spaces like public trains, public transportation, training, and all the while training volunteers in de-escalation strategies so they can serve as a safe deterring presence in certain neighborhoods. From the creation of safety pamphlets and e-resources to continued robust community engagement on self-defense with community members who trust them first, our CBOs are doing the work and our city needs to support them as they lead by example. The city's approach to public safety must also consider how to help victims heal from traumatic events. We are asking the city to fund recovery services in Asian languages to help victims heal from their attacks, including providing access to a victim compensation fund and supporting a network of Asian community-based organizations that can provide mental health support, legal services, and other supportive services. Time has expired. Furthermore, we must support programs that increase access to mental health services for all communities, since perpetrators themselves may have mental illness and need services so as not to further harm others and themselves. I'm gonna cut out my conclusion and just say, thank you so much for being here, giving us this space and listening to us. And we look forward to working with all of you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now call in the next panelist who will be Yao Chang from the Anti-Violence Project, followed by Jasmine Bowden, also from the Anti-Violence Project. Uh, followed by Michael Szyzycki from the New York Civil Liberties Union. Time starts now. Um, good afternoon, committee chairs. My name is Yao Chang, and I am a staff member in the Community Organizing and Public Advocacy Department of the New York City Anti-Violence Project, AVP. So AVP empowers lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and HIV-affected communities and allies to end all forms of violence, we do this through organizing, education, counseling, and advocacy. Today, I am advocating to promote the safety and well being for all LGBTQIA survivors at the Pride March in Manhattan, New York, outside of policing. Many LGBTQIA survivors who we serve face police violence and disproportionate criminalization in their daily lives, especially working class, HIV affected, undocumented people of color. We must take all violence, including police violence, seriously. To end violence against all LGBTQIA plus survivors, we can start by removing cops from pride, defunding vice and defunding the NYPD and shifting resources to alternative and accountable methods of addressing violence. This includes the hate violence prevention initiative that was cut completely last year, which offered public bystander intervention trainings and community-based reporting and rapid response actions to address violence in our communities. It also includes the Outreach to Persons in the Sex Trades Initiative, which offers resources and services to sex workers instead of criminalization. Police are a main source of violence for our community, including their ineffectual and violent policing of the pandemic and the brutal crackdowns on protest protesters in the George Floyd uprisings. Last year, our hotline received significantly increased calls from LGBTQIA plus participants of Pride events and the protests against police brutality for George Floyd. We need to address this issue now and remove cops from Pride. We have spoken with and heard from our community members that the increasing presence of, of police at Pride over the past decade has been a deterrent for their participation because they know they will not be safe. Most of all, police should not be at a march whose origins began with queer and trans people of color and sex workers resisting and rebelling against police violence and police ra raids in the Stonewall Rebellion. Many of our communities experience police as a source of violence and do not feel safe going to the police when they face violence. We need to be diverting and defunding the NYPD's bloated six billion budget, especially eliminating Vice's 18 million budget to fund community-based solutions, including community security at Pride, and training and resources for community members to intervene on hate violence, as well as resources for people in the sex trades. We know the city is in a challenging financial position, but we strongly urge the city council to restore this funding for, the, for all of these resources and community-based initiatives um, to fiscal year 2020 levels. We appreciate the past support and we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now turn to Jasmine Bowden from the Anti-Violence Project. Time starts now. Uh, 
Hi, can so everyone can hear me? Um, good afternoon, committee, chairs. My name is Jasmine Bowden, and I am a community member of the New York City Anti-Violence Project, AVP. AVP empower empowers lesbians, gays, bisexual, transgender, queer, and HIV-affected communities and allies to end all forms of violence through education, counseling, advocacy, and organizing. Today, I am advocating for more resources to go to address violence against our communities, the communities AVP serves. Many forms of violence have increased during the COVID pandemic, including hate violence. Violence against LGBTQ New Yorkers, Asian, and many others has not stopped during the pandemic, especially against Black trans women of color. On January 4th, I was pepper sprayed with derogatory remarks on a New York City street. And when I went to the police, they did not make me feel like a victim and would not support me and what I needed to tell, needed or tell me the information that I needed to respond to this violence. Many in my community did not feel safe going to the police when they face violence. One example, my recent experience on January 4th. That's why it's important to have alternative safety approaches like the hate crime preventive prevention initiative that funds organizations like AVP to continue to build safe ways to report and mobilize members to combat hate violence in their communities. We, re we request the city council to divert some of the NYPD astronomical budget to fund community-based solutions. We know the city is, is in a challenging financial position, but we urge the city council to restore the funding at the fiscal year 2020 levels. We appreciate past support and look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I would now like to invite Michael Szyzycki from the New York Civil Liberties Union to testify. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Adams, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Michael Szyzycki, Senior Policy Counsel with the New York Civil Liberties Union. I want to briefly address the administration's reform plan. Um, in short, this plan is further proof that the administration has learned nothing from the past year of protests and demands for real reductions in the countless ways in which policing causes real harms to communities of color. Instead, the proposals we're seeing are largely more of the same approaches that have already been tried, that have long been promised as the ways to reform and improve policing, and that have been entirely inadequate to that task. So we've been told for years that more trainings, more community and neighborhood policing, more policies on discipline would transform the NYPD and improve its relationship with communities, but they haven't. Uh, but the administration's plan doubles down on these approaches, calling for more training, calling for more integration of police into community infrastructures, and continuing to pretend as if the NYPD's disciplinary matrix is the be all and end all on accountability, as opposed to what it really is, a non-binding set of guidelines, subject to the police commissioner's unbridled discretion. On transparency and oversight, the plan's commitments ring hollow. We've seen how committed the NYPD is to transparency when they release their so-called disciplinary dashboard that continues to hide the overwhelming majority of police disciplinary records. And on oversight, the plan's expansion of the CCRB still doesn't address the fundamental imbalance of power between that agency and the NYPD. And it puts all of the existing oversight functions, including functions that currently exist in other agencies, into the one agency that actually has direct police commissioner appointments to its leadership structure. And the police commissioner and the mayor have continued to resist calls for supporting the one thing that could actually lead to a fundamental move towards greater accountability, which is removing the police commissioner's monopoly on disciplinary decision making. Um, and just a note on process, Executive Order 203 was issued back in June of 2020. And we've known since then that there was an April 1st deadline. Uh, and towards that deadline, that includes all of the steps in this process, developing the proposal, soliciting input, revising the draft in light of that input, and having a real opportunity for debate and discussion. But here we are, there's just over two weeks to go, and we only saw the first draft of any part of this plan on March 5th. And as it turns out, it was only part one, with part two not being released until March 12th. This is shameful. There's no excuse for how long the administration delayed in this process, and it's slap in the face to the communities across the city uh, to slowly roll out these plans in bits and pieces at the very last minute while trying to say with a straight face that they'll still meaningfully incorporate public feedback. We've said it before that this process has been a sham and it's done a real disservice to New Yorkers who have been calling for a real reimagining of community safety. So in this moment, we really look to the council to take on a leadership role that has been so sorely lacking from this administration. Uh, while the timing of the plan's release was unacceptable, the fact that we're now discussing it as part of a preliminary budget hearing 
drives home just how much this conversation is tied up with how the, the oh, city yeah. allocates our resources. The mayor's plan is a plan for continued overinvestment in policing at the expense of services like healthcare, housing, education, and other supports that can actually address and meet people's basic and fundamental needs. And the council must ensure that we're making the appropriate investments in actual community well being and not merely accepting a plan that maintains or increases investments in an agency like the NYPD that has shown time and time again that it's unwilling to reform itself. Thanks so much. Thank you for your testimony. I would now like to call up uh, the next three panelists who will be Juhyun Kang, uh, please forgive me if, for any mispronunciations from Communities United for Police Reform, followed by Donald Nesbitt from Local 379, and then followed by Jim Hamlin McLeod from Local 1549, um, as well as Ralph Palladino from Local 1549. Time starts now. Uh, thank you. My name is Ju Hyun Kang with Community United for Police Reform. First, I want to thank Chair Adams, of course, not only for holding this hearing, but also raising really critical and detailed questions to the administration this morning, um, and also naming the need to fire Wayne Knights. Uh, so I just want to start off with that. Um, CPR is a is an organization that runs coalitions on various issues, including over 200 organizations on various coalitions that are legislative and otherwise on police uh, accountability as well as safety. Um, I was going to spend most of my time talking about the preliminary budget, uh, but uh, instead most of my comments are going to be in relationship to some of the comments this morning from the administration on the mayor's plan. On the budget, there's just three things I want to say. One is that I want to clarify that in spite of what uh, Commissioner Shea and others said this morning, under oath, the NYPD budget was not cut by $1 billion in FY21. In fact, the city's controller, the independent budget office, the uh, Citizens Budget Commission have all verified that it was not $1 billion that was cut in FY21. Secondly, that the FY22 proposed budget cuts increased the NYPD budget while other areas, including parks, sanitation, youth programs, are cut, um, and that, of course, CPR will be calling for significant decrease in FY22's NYPD bloated budget and redirection of those funds to deep investments in community safety and infrastructure. On the mayor's plan, uh, a few things that we wanted to say in terms of the quote unquote reform and reinvention plan. One is uh, similar to what we said in January that this plan is a setup in many ways, forcing the council to have to vote in a matter of days on a plan that was uh, sent out with hundreds of pages that very few people in the city have even seen. Secondly, that the process was so bad that in um, uh, late January, CPR member organization, the partner organization launched a separate effort called Redefining Community Safety, holding a series of forums throughout the city or uh, virtual forums with various communities in the city to talk about areas that would actually increase safety in communities that didn't rely necessarily and exclusively on police. On the mayor's plan itself, there is absolutely nothing in the plan right now that is meaningful that would reduce police violence or increase accountability. In fact, many of the items would actually expand the NYPD's bloated budget and outsized power, as well as its role in daily lives. Some examples of this include um, the inappropriate roles, including fixing basketball courts that could be done by uh, NYCHA or the Parks Department or even the Saturday Night Lights pro program that could be run by other agencies. The last thing I want to say with remaining time is just that the NYPD was being very misleading this morning in terms of what they're actually doing about discipline, both on the discipline matrix as well as the discipline database. I'm happy to explain uh, that further. Um, and uh, last two comments is just that fundamentally we believe that decreasing police violence has, has to include decreasing the role of policing in our daily lives. That includes reducing the budget as well as the scope um, and power and outsized power, not only the NYPD, but the outsized Time power. Time has expired. Um, thank you. Thank you. I would like now like to turn to Donald Nesbitt from Local 379. Time starts now. Donald, we see you. You've been on all day. There you are. Yeah, sorry about that. I was having a little technical difficulties. 
So uh, thank you to the committee members. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Adams and the distinguished members of the committee. I'm Executive Vice President Donald Nesbitt from Local 372. Uh, we represent 2,600 uh, school crossing guards um, under the leadership of President Sean D. Francois the first. Local 372 school crossing guards are often the front line of defense to improve the safety for students who walk, bicycle, or take transit to school. Student pedestrians often face major safety traffic hazards every day caused by double and triple parked cars at bus stops in front or near school buildings. As essential workers, school crossing guards remain vigilant throughout this pandemic, even when the schools were shut down. Approximately 90% of school crossing guards are female, working daily at a 25 hour cap part-time schedule that includes early morning, lunchtime and school hours to serve 1.1 million charter, parochial and public school children. Additionally, many of our members are at higher risk because of their age with 33% of the membership being over 55 years old. Our workforce is predominantly black and Latino and at 85% and at living and working in the zip codes with the highest COVID rates, uh, much higher than other communities. However, despite their role on the front line, school crossing guards are not often treated like, treated like essential workers. School crossing guards do not get paid for snow days and certain holidays, days when schools are shut down or when the city, even when the city remains open, leaving their paychecks dependent upon the weather or whatever conditions may happen with schools in New York City. On top of this immediate tangible concern of loss of wages, this, this also represents an issue of equity for our members. Despite working under the New York City Police Department, school crossing guards are, are functionally um, support services to New York City schools and similar to other titles that we represent. Likewise, school crossing guards do not get some of the compensation for lost time when schools and situations happen in school. Additionally, the role for, first, for the first line of defense for students and pedestrians often place school crossing guards in a vulnerable position with no immediate assistance on hand. School crossing guards are at risk not only from cars veering too close or from um, viral exposure to COVID-19, but from physical attacks and harassment from people on the street. A number of school crossing guards have been victims of on-duty assaults, while, while, which is a violent felony under current state law um, local 372 respectfully requests the city funding to support the promotion of a citywide campaign of public awareness to stop the violence against school crossing guards. Again, I thank the committee. Um, I thank you, Chair and Committee, for the opportunity uh, to testify before you today. And on behalf of the local 372 school crossing guards, um, I thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we will have Jim Hamlin McLeod from Local 1549. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Adams. Good afternoon, Councilwoman, Council members. Um, my name is Jim Hamlin McLeod. I am a grievance rep for Local 1549. Um, I'm one of the grievance reps who represents all the police administrative aides the senior police administrative aides, the clerical associates, the police communication technicians, and supervising police communication technicians for NYPD. Okay, they are the city employees who have and who are still working tirelessly through this COVID-19 pandemic. They're the eyes and ears of NYPD. They, administ they administratively and, and physically support the department. Their jobs were created to the purpose of keeping police on the streets to better serve the public by community policing. Why is it today we have lost so many of these jobs to uniform officers? I noticed that the commissioner spoke about earlier about innovative ways to save and, and cut costs um, for the department. But one of the ways you can cut costs is stop getting rid of civilization. Hire more PAAs and SPAs. Do attrition we have lost as well as he lost in uniforms members of service. We have lost 400 uh, PAAs and about 140 SPAAs. Okay, they have not replaced them. Uh, the, the, the staff um, is, is not getting that overtime um, as, as, as he said that they are spending out there. Uh, Councilman Levine, I hope when he, or when he gets his um, report back on overtime, he asks about civilization overtime because there's none there and there's none to be blamed on the civilians there. 
Okay. Um, I was I was fabriclasted by Councilman Landers and his report about how their only loss of $417 million as opposed to that $1 billion budget that they're supposed to have lost and they've gained $196 million increase. Again, he talked about innovative ways to cut costs and my thing is the civilization. He has 500 officers pretty much doing civilian work. Okay, if they're in there doing civilian work, they're also in there doing civilian work um, with overtime, don't get overtime for doing administrative work. They get overtime for working through the 911 system. Not too long ago, the last couple of months, he had, um, they had, the department had about 60 uh, police officers being trained to take 911 operators um, work. And I don't understand if we're in a crisis and all hands on deck, then those 500 officers that he has doing administrative work for the department should be out there helping the city bring those numbers down. He said, we have an increase of gun arrests or, or shootings up by 40%. That's alarming. All hands should be on deck. And if all hands are on deck, then there should be more police officers out in the street and not inside the police tents. We know civilization saved NYPD and the city millions. The cost of a civilian is much cheaper than a uniform officer. Time has expired. Thank you for your time and be safe. Thank you for your testimony. I'd now like to call on Ralph Palladino from Local 1549. Time starts now. Sorry. <laughs> Good day. Um, and greetings from Local 1549, Local President Eddie Rodriguez, and, uh, and welcome to the new chair of the committee. Um, Local 1549 believes that um, what there needs to be serious um, reform in terms of the police department. We agree that Albany needs to be looking at this. What should be included in the city's reform plan? The city and the NYPD should make civilianization an important part of the reform package they will send to Albany. Former Mayor John Lindsay created the Police Administrative Aid, PAA title, expressly for the purpose of civilianizing the NYPD. This good policy idea was never become a reality. New York City continues to be the worst city in the nation in the ratio of uniform to civilian employees by far. New York City is at the bottom of the ladder in efforts to civilianize the tasks that should be performed by PAAs, clerical associates, secretaries, and other civilian titles but are being performed by higher paid uniform employees. Local 1549 won three arbitrations ordering the NYPD to civilianize the clerical positions. But this administration and the one before it has refused to do so. This despite promises and insurances by various city leaders to follow through on civilianization. This year's budget, the NYPD these downsized clerical titles while continuing to have uniform employees perform our work. This was not the intent of the demands of the social justice movements led by Black Lives Matter, but the city and NYPD use it as a compliance, uh, a compliance to transfer some funding from policing to social services. They eliminate jobs that could go to the community residents. The city talks about gaining support of neighborhoods and everyday people in the reform plan. A good way to accomplish that is to hire people from the neighborhood and people from the community and not cut their jobs. These decent paying jobs are disappearing from the NYPD and more of the work is being performed by uniform employees. It is not a military organization. It is a civilian organization. If more com community residents were hired off a civil service list, the NYPD could be use them as liaisons of goodwill. It could help reduce unemployment and increase economic activity of the local neighborhoods. Numbers do not lie. Look at my the rest of my testimony that's six pages long and you'll find the numbers back up what I say. Numbers do not lie about the reductions in staffing in the 911 centers either. While call numbers go up and new tasks are assigned to the PCT and SPCTs. Meanwhile, uniform cadets are being used regularly for short periods to serve as backup rather than hiring more PCTs. 911 employees are, are first responders and essential workers and should be paid accordingly. Time has expired. And hiring civil service interpreters would make the NYPD more neighborly friendly also, showing they care about the diversity and language needs of the citizens. Thank you very much. 
and I couldn't get my video working. Shoot. Thank you for your testimony. Matt, do you want to see me? I'm about to testify. Unless there are questions from council members, I will move on to the next panel. All right, seeing none, I'd like to invite the next four members of the public up. They will be Andrea Bowen from the Sex Workers Project, Dawn Yester from Advocates for Children, Sarah Sitzler from Writers for Black Lives, as well as Anton Lowe, for, also from Writers for Black Lives. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Adams and council members and council staff. I'm Andrea Bowen and I'm government affairs consultant at the Sex Workers Project at the Urban Justice Center. The Sex Workers Project at Urban Justice Center or SWP provides client-centered legal services to individuals who engage in sex work regardless of whether or not they do so by choice, circumstance, or coercion. We seek a restoration of our $100,000 in speakers initiative funds cut in FY21 and a continuation of $50,000 of our FY21 funding from the support for persons involved in the sex trades initiative. We seek this to uh, fill a gap in city legal services, workers' rights, legal services to those in legal sex trades. These workers are at great risk of wage theft, sexual harassment, sexual assault, and federal and state labor laws are rarely enforced in these trades. Um, as regards the mayor's police reform and reinvention collaborative draft plan, plan, FWP has noted its positive aspects in the press release that went out. However, um, NYPD and the mayor must actually be held accountable for ending the policing of sex work, and organizations like SWP intend to be a part of that accountability process. Specifically related to the draft plan, major players were not actually consulted in a way that made clear to them that they were providing feedback on this NYPD reform plan. The process is far from complete. The task force coming from this should be a body that creates a real plan on changing the NYPD. It should be led by the Unity Project on the government side and entities that have connection to the sex work community to create a space that's public, formal, and places emphasis on community feedback and feeding into a final product whose process is clearly articulated from the get-go. And none of this should hold council and the mayor back from eliminating the vice division of the NYPD in the FY22 budget. SWP advocates for elimination of funding for NYPD's vice enforcement division at approximately 18.2 million with reinvestment in human services that protect sex workers' human rights while supporting them in their surrounding communities. A recent ProPublica article explains in depth how NYPD Vice clearly targets BIPOC communities and we should waste no time in eliminating Vice in this budget. Thank you so much for your time and attention and I look forward to talking with you further. And my contact information is in the testimony I'll be emailing you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd now like to invite up Dawn Euster from Advocates for Children. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Dawn Euster, and I am the Director of Advocates for Children of New York's AFC's School Justice Project. AFC works to ensure high quality education for New York students who face barriers to academic success, focusing on students from low income backgrounds. We are a member of Dignity in Schools Campaign New York, a coalition of youth, parents, educators, and advocates dedicated to ending the school to prison pipeline. Through our work with students in New York City, we have seen the significant and disproportionate impact school policing has on Black and Brown students. While the number of students arrested has decreased, Black and Latinx students continue to comprise the vast majority of them. In the 2019-20 school year before schools closed due to COVID-19, Black students in particular have had to bear the brunt of school policing representing about 25% of all students and about 56.5% of students arrested and issued summonses in school. The NYPD, including school safety agents and precinct officers and not clinically trained mental health professionals um, had already intervened in more than 2,250 incidents involving students in emotional crisis, handcuffing young, some as young as five years old. Of the students handcuffed, 58% were Black. AFC works in coalition with youth parents and school staff who have repeatedly called for the removal of police in schools. The experiences of these school community members have, sh have shared um, compelling stories and must be, cannot be ignored. Policing deeply impacts Black and Brown youth and has no place in our schools. 
Schools must be nurturing, inclusive learning environments for all students. Um, we support removing police officers, including school safety agents from schools and shifting NYPD funding from school policing to education and social services that will support a new vision of safety in schools. We must ensure all students, especially black and Latinx students who are disproportionately harmed by police are truly safe and supported. We support elements of the mayor's plan to break the school to prison, to break the school to prison pipeline and some of the language in the plan about investing in school staff to support students' social, emotional, and behavioral needs mirrors language in our own recommendations in the fiscal year 2022 budget. However, we are deeply concerned that the recommendations in the mayor's police reform plan related to school safety are mere words, as the blueprint fails to contain an action plan to truly invest in our students and school communities and keep our children safe and harm and free from harm of policing practices. For example, despite asserting that the city time has expired. Despite, despite asserting that the city may invest in staff trained and coached in providing direct services to students such as social workers, behavior specialists, and trauma-informed de-escalation staff, the mayor's plan does not include any steps to reach the goal. Um, just a couple of more words. Um, also, the, 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 the preliminary budget um, only contains $35 million to address mental health and social emotional needs of students, while the school policing budget is over $450 million. Um, in addition to that, um, uh, we, we are deeply troubled by the news that the city may spend $20, $20 million to hire 475 new school safety agents, or from what we're hearing to, um, today, 500 school safety agents um, based on the new plan to start working in the school safety division within the next few months. And we desperately need this money for schools um, to provide social workers, behavior specialists, restorative justice practice practitioners, so that students can receive the mental health supports and services that they need instead of being handcuffed in school or otherwise policed. Um, we, we really thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I would be happy to answer any questions. There's more information in our written testimony. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. I would now like to invite up Sarah Sitzler from Writers for Black Lives to testify. Time starts now. Hey, good afternoon, um, Chair Adams and members of Council. My name is Sarah Sitzler. I'm a resident of District 40 and member of Writers for Black Lives. And I'm testifying today to ask the council to divest from the NYPD budget and to reallocate funds to community-led programs and resources that serve a BIPOC and low-income communities because public safety is rooted in community care and accountability. What keeps us safe and reduces crime is all of us not only having our basic needs met, but having the resources to thrive. More policing does not lessen crime. Neither reform nor training can be effective when they are born within an inherently racist institution. Commissioner Shea recently went on record to apologize for systemic racism in the NYPD, but we don't want his apologies or empty platitudes. We want his resignation. Commissioner Shea says he wants to work with the people, yet he couldn't even show up for the last council hearing on public safety. He only shows up when the budget is up for discussion to spread lies and fear monger. According to a DOI report on the NYPD's response to the Floyd protests, as they're called, the strategic response group was documented as the most well-trained, yet they were the most militant, violent aggressors out of anyone at the protests. Um, the SRG was created to handle counterterrorism and active shooters. Why are they being sent to peaceful protests? Where was community affairs? Why were they not consulted at all? Um, why are NYPD helicopters flying over peaceful marches for hours at a time, being utilized as a mode of oppression and intimidation, flying over activist homes? Why did Artem Prusayev of the 84th Precinct point a gun at unarmed protesters with no recourse? Why do police fans show up to community cleanups last summer to surveil activists as we were cleaning up our streets because of budget cuts in sanitation left trash piling up on our streets? 
Why are peaceful protesters arrested on the Brooklyn Bridge or in Williamsburg being taken out of the way to the 75th precinct in East New York? Cut the choppers, the unnecessary surveillance, the harassment, cut down the budget. I'd also like to add that despite the heavy police presence at the protests, we have been in serious danger on several occasions when cars have driven through crowds. Both civilian cars and a police car have driven through crowds. All the body cams and the best technology mean nothing when police are not held accountable for their actions. Providing public access to the misconduct of the NYPD like the disciplinary matrix does nothing to remedy that misconduct and corruption itself. If Commissioner Shea really cared about transparency and trust, he would remove himself as the sole overseer of the NYPD discipline. I urge you members of the council, divest from the NYPD. Time has expired. Invest in our communities through BIPOC-led, community-led initiatives. Eradicate the school to prison pipeline. Invest in social workers, counselors, after school programs, community centers, resources for black trans, for queer, non-binary community members. So instead of being targeted by police, they're safe, they're protected, and they're able to live their lives to the fullest potential. Build a mental health and substance abuse response team that excludes the NYPD, base it off the CAHOOTS program in Oregon. Public safety is contingent upon not only having our basic needs met, but potential to prosper, to build generational wealth. Quality housing, education, and health care are rights. Real crime prevention starts with community care and resources, not more policing. Thank you so much for the time and allowing me to testify today. Thank you for your testimony. I'd now like to invite up Anton Lowe from Writers for Black Lives. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for uh, allowing us. Um, I'd like to second what Sarah just spoke about. Uh, more policing in our neighborhoods is not what we want. As a Black man, I don't want to see police with bigger guns and militarized vests on and helmets and these type of things in my neighborhood. We don't want to see that anymore. We don't want to see that at peaceful protest where we have to worry about being bashed with the police for doing nothing but being peaceful in the streets. We need better schools in our neighborhood. We need more opportunities in our neighborhood, cleaner communities. We don't need more gentrified neighborhoods. The police only come when we feel like the white people are moving in and you guys wanna make it safer for them. That's not what we need. We need protection in our own communities and to build in our own communities. We need money for businesses in our communities. That's what we need in our communities. And uh, that's it for me, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I would now like to invite up the next four um, members of the public to testify. They will be Sandra Sanchez from the Yaya Network, followed by Angelique Larson, also from the Yaya Network. Then Josh Melendez from Sisters and Brothers United, um, followed by Humberto Flores from Sisters and Brothers United. Time starts now. Good evening. My name is Sandra Sanchez here with the Yaya Network at another hearing. Now engrave my name in your mind because I won't be going anywhere until we get what we're asking for again. Public safety is bull and we all know this. Why do I say this? Because even with cops, people still die, hurt and mourn. Police in the US killed 164 black people in the first eight months of 2020. The Black Lives Matter movement during June was not the beginning of police brutality and some act like it was. Families lost their loved ones to those people who are supposed to protect us. Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, the list goes on and on. Now you wanna hire more cops than you can afford. Not surprised, this does really sound like New York City. Where can this money be going, you ask? Simple, during COVID, we had to adjust to many changes. Remote learning, unemployment rates on the rise, and instead of putting the money to help those in need, you become selfish and solely focus it on the least important people. There are families who weren't homeless last year that are now on the streets begging for money. There are students who still are in need of devices for remote learning. There are people who were happier than ever before COVID and now find themselves in mental health crisis. Why can't the money go to them? Why can't you once not be so selfish and realize the world doesn't revolve around police? Never has. Today, I'm asking for a change, and I mean more than just promises. We need action. We need real change. 
if cops are really trying to start stop crime, why do I always see them trying to catch those on a rush to work hopping the trains, but not catching those who are killing or stabbing or shooting around us? We need to defund the police. We need to stop treating kids like criminals and take metal detectors out of school. The hiring of police needs to stop and we need to dismantle the system. We need to start soon or people will keep on getting hurt and dying. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. I would now like to call on Angelique Larson, also from the Yaya Network. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Angelique Larson and I'm 17 years old. Six days ago, the results of a study in the United Kingdom was released, stating that 97% of all women between the ages of 18 and 24 have experienced some form of sexual assault or harassment. While this is not here in the United States, this is still a human rights crisis for all. This study did not account for minors or adults over the age of 24. As a high schooler myself, I can tell you that the harsh reality being that I do not know a single female who has not experienced some form of sexual violence. That includes myself. This is a harsh reality that the police system refuses to address. Victims are often turn turned away by the police force. Some are questioned to what they wore, some are questioned to what they why they waited, and others are eventually criminalized. Therefore, only 8% of all sexual assault allegations are eventually convicted leaving another 92% of assault allegations to go without justice. As a victim myself, I was told by the police that I shouldn't have waited so long. I shouldn't have continued communication with my assaulter. The detective on my case even said, and I quote, if I hit you right now, would you still be friends with me? When I said no, he replied, then how do you expect us to believe you? He then continued by asking my family if they had met my assaulter because quote unquote, he seemed like a nice kid. Yet I heard today how great the SVU is doing. I stand before you and ask that you make this process easier, that you make people like me feel comfortable speaking their truths instead of just assuming that we do when you are not in our situation. Reforming the response and hiring better, more equipped SVU detectives should be one of your first priorities. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Josh Melendez from Sisters and Brothers United. We have a United. question, Matt. We have a question from council member uh, Rosenthal, I believe. Uh, excuse me. Um, we'll go to council member questions. Council member Rosenthal. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Adams. I appreciate you. Um, Ms. Larson, I just, I'm blown away by your bravery. And I wanted to thank you so much for coming forward and speaking your truth. Um, I hope, I hope you got some love and support around you. And you know that, you know, if you need any counseling services, there are so many good ones um, that you can talk with who could really advocate for you with the NYPD and hold their feet to the fire if you want to investigate the case. So it just I hope you're getting the help you need. And I really just want to acknowledge and appreciate you. Thank, Thank you. you. We want to echo that. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. I wanted you to go first to being uh, one of my mentors in the council. Ms. Larson, uh, I too applaud you for speaking your truth and, and quite frankly, for speaking the truth of so many of us who at your age were not open to speaking the truth. Those who have been bullied, those who have been harassed, like myself, harassed by a college professor, still to this day, you know, uh, carry those things deep inside of us. I appreciate your testimony so much today. Stay strong. Thank you. Thank you. Unless there are questions from other council members, I will move on to the next panelist. Time starts now. Hello everyone, my name is Josh and I'm a youth assistant by the Zoom night. And I live in Council District 8 in the Bronx and I'm in seventh grade. I attend James Kiernan High School. After hearing the mayor's plan of hiring 475 police officers, I urge the city council to make it a priority to block, to block this as the money used to employ these cops in our school will be better spent on more social workers, guidance counselors, and health workers in our school. 
I'm excited to go back to school to learn alongside my peers, but I still don't feel safe knowing that cops are gonna be at my school. Cops don't make me feel secure and safe at my school or in my neighborhood. I've seen, per I've seen from personal experience how they treat me, my friends on my way to school, in front of my school, and in the entrance or in our hallways. As students and as a student in my music class, I have to bring a guitar home uh, to practice. And there was a time when I went to school and the police and, uh, and uh, SSA said that they would uh, only let me inside if they checked my bag and my guitar in case if I had a weapon as a gun or just a gun in general. And I got scared and I felt nervous. At that time, I wanted to cry because I was only, I, and I was being accused of having a gun, even though I was only 11 years old. Uh, I was harshly judged at the, uh, I was harshly, I was harshly judged at the door and being treated like a criminal. Seeing them all over my school just reminded me of when I used to visit my family members at Rikers. The uh, constant surveillance, the pat downs, uh, the pat downs at the door, the bad searches, it felt exactly the same way as going to school. I strongly oppose the idea of uh, transferring uh, uh, cops to NYP, uh, from NYPD to the DOE Int uh, or intro 2211, as there is no point of them being in uh, my school. Unless what you, unless as you want them, uh, unless if you want them there is for it to continue harassing and intimidating us. Students need to feel safe, like they belong in a safe and support, supportive, supportive school and not a school where the system is built to put us in jail. I want to go to a school where I don't feel like I'm the next target of a school cop, but in order for this to be, we'll need money to be, the money will need to be divested from school, school policing and put in, and put that money into a, uh, put that money to develop of students like so, uh, social workers, guidance counselors, medical professionals and in and in general more resources in public schools but specifically in the bronx and in brooklyn thank you for your testimony next up we will have humberto flores from sisters and brothers united followed by marcos romero time starts now hello um I'm Umberto Flores and I'm a youth leader at Sisters and Brothers United. I attend the, high, the Bronx High School of Science and I live in Council District 16. And I'm here to talk about police-free schools and about the preliminary budget and the shifts I'd like to see across the board. I would like to begin my, by mentioning the FY22 budget and the lies that were told about the budget cuts towards the police department during June 12th, 2020. The NYPD was not defunded by a billion dollars and the changes that were made were not recurring meaning that only impacted that one year's budget. There is currently no sign with the current proposed budget where our demands for police free schools are being invested. School police, despite what was said by the mayor, are still under the NYPD's budget. The FY22 preliminary budget is $5.4 billion, which is $195 million more than the FY21 adopted budget. So despite the message that you defunded the police, the NYPD's budget is not only protected, but it's still growing. And I'd like to move on to another topic, this one being police reform. The governor's executive order 203 required that each municipality in the state submit a police reform and a reimagination plan by April 1st. The city released their plan into parts on March 5th and March 12th, in which it highlighted a multi-agency transition team that would facilitate the transferring of school policing from the NYPD to the DOE. The transfer of the school policing from NYPD to the DOE doesn't mean the students will be happy. It also does not mean that the city is actually reimagining school safety. While that may seem like a good change, simply rebranding police officers isn't gonna ensure the safety of students. And I'd like to think about it if I put a mask over an animal. If you put a mask over an animal, it's still the same animal. There's no point in putting a mask over it. It doesn't change it. The plan should focus on root causes to what students face. Investing in counseling, therapists, social workers, and other resources that focus on the students' needs and the root of those of those needs is a far better idea than rebranding the police. I know someone in my family who had an experience where they were they went through something and they were scared. And instead of the school and the police 
helping them, they made them feel like they were just doing whatever they could to actually suspend her. That isn't what, that isn't helping them. That's just trying to criminalize them. And that's why I stand with, with this movement. I stand with countless others who have been calling for the complete removal of police in schools and saying vote no on intro 2211 because we cannot prioritize student success while still funding their criminalization. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. The next up will be Marcos Romero, followed by Chris Kwok from the Asian American Bar Association of New York, uh, followed by Madeline Borelli from, the Teacher, from Teachers Unite. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Marcos Romero. I'm a youth leader at Sisters of Brothers United, and I'm currently a sophomore at LaGuardia High School of the Arts, and I live in Council District 12. Let me take you back to June of 6 of 2020. In the midst of Black Lives Matter protests and unrest, I performed my first ever speech with others on the steps of Tweed, where we call for justice for countless who have been killed and harm of police across our country. And more specifically, to call for an to call for a fraction of the police budget to be repurposed to help out schools, to help out communities, to benefit the dreamers of New York, not to limit schools, oppress communities, and prevent tre treatment of dreamers as a delusion. We call for the complete removal of police from our schools, as you cannot believe my reaction the next day where a statement was released where the city of New York City is gonna repurpose the budget to help everyone instead of just the police. Then I waited, I waited, and I waited. At the end of a tiring budget process, the council voted on a budget that would transfer school safety division, AKA school costs from NYPD to DOE and we were devastated. Our vision for police free school was already being co-opted by a false and harmful vision for real school safety. Fast forward to March 16, 2021, today, after finding out there were plans for the city to continue to funnel money to the police budget, specifically to 475 new school safety officers, the MTA is shutting down, and now police are getting robot dogs. Tell me why do I continue to find myself yet again calling out the council to do what's best for students? Why is it so difficult? Our vision for schools is that we would dismantle police school infractures, culture, and practice. And in school militarization and surveillance and building a new liberatory education system. This vision can be possible if the city council would simply make bold decisions that would make our budgets reflect the things we value and need unless you value criminalization black, girls and boys, I hope this time around you put them first in your budget decisions. I ask that you divest from school policing, reject any new hires of cops in our schools and invest in deep funding of counselors, school workers, mental health support and restorative justice. To quote one of my favorite movies, just because someone stumbles and loses their way doesn't mean they're lost forever. All they need is guidance. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Unless there are questions from council members, I will move on to the next member of the public. All right, seeing none, I will call on Chris Kwok from the Asian American Bar Association of New York, followed by Madeline Borelli from the Teachers Unite, followed by Alexandra Haridopoulos from Teachers Unite. Time starts now. Thank you everyone for this opportunity. Thank you, Chair Adams, for still being here. It's, uh, it's late and uh, deeply appreciative that you're still here. Um, my name is Chris Kwok. I'm a board director for the Asian American Bar Association of New York. I, ser I serve as the chair of the issues committee, uh, which advises Albany's board on, on, on political issues. Uh, we're an organization of over 1,600 lawyers in the city. Um, Albany is participating in today's hearing to express our firm commitment to championing two changes to the NYPD's Asian Hate Crimes Task Force. Um, first, the task force needs funding. It is currently not funded at all. Uh, second, it is comprised completely of volunteer um, detectives and sergeants. Uh, they all have their day jobs within the NYPD. And when there's a job that requires their language or cultural competency, they get called in. So that although the mayor has had a lot of sort of PR from putting out the Asian Hate Crimes Task Force, um, they don't have funding and they are not assigned full time. 
And we feel that that is just an empty exercise. And so the Asian American community is fearful right now uh, of going about their lives, just going to the supermarket or walking home or taking the bus. And uh, we really want um, action. Uh, Abney wrote a report called The Rising Tide of Hate and Violence Against Asian Americans. And we have, um, we were proud to be the first to call uh, those two important things out publicly. And we think that um, they should be fully funded and assigned to uh, the unit uh, full time uh, in order to foster uh, trust with the Asian American community and to encourage reporting, which we've heard a lot. Uh, there needs to be accountability for the violence and harassment that has been perpetrated uh, against Asian Americans. There's a, you know, 27 percent, um, uh, I mean, 27 incidents in 2020 versus three in 2019. And um, we want the uh, police and the government to respond to the concerns in a serious way and not in the sort of showtime way uh, that I think the mayor has done so far. And so with that, I want to thank you uh, for the time and we're going to submit a more complete uh, testimony into the record. So thank you. Chris, I appreciate your testimony and I, I just want to let you know that I concur with your sentiments and that beautiful child that you were feeding a little while ago. I would not want that beautiful child living in fear. Thank you so much. I think that should be kids. beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I'd, li I'd now like to invite the next uh, witness up, who will be Madeline Borelli from Teachers Unite, followed by Alexandra Haridopoulos from Teachers Unite. Time starts now. Good evening. My name is Madeline Borelli. I'm a special education teacher in District 21 and a proud public school parent. I'm also a member of Teachers Unite. I'm here today, again, to testify in strong opposition to intro 2211, which will codify violent school policing into the DOE's already underfunded budget. Under intro 2211, the city is proposing to spend a considerable sum of money to retrain school police, despite there being little evidence that police reform works. The mayor marketed this move of the NYPD school policing unit to the DOE as part of a $1 billion police defundment, but that didn't happen. The city didn't defund the police back in June, but the city did defund public education by $700 million during a pandemic. Shuffling personnel from one agency to another does not undo the generations of harm. And we do not want to reorganize the school policing infrastructure. We want to dismantle it. We want police-free schools where our children are greeted by well-paid community members and restorative and healing physicians. Schools with robust mental health services and transformative practices. I represent one of many teachers who you will hear tonight who oppose intro 2211 and are demanding instead a budget that, is, that meaningfully funds school positions and supports students. During the last city council meeting, we were blindsided by the proposed hiring of 475 new school cops for the choice of $20 million. In the same year where teachers lost, our teachers choice funding, the little money that the city allocates us each year to spend on classroom supplies. Council members, budgets are moral documents. So if this hiring goes through, then the city is telling us, our students and their families that policing young people's bodies is more important than ensuring they have the academic supplies they need in order to be successful. We don't want cops in our schools, we want counselors, librarians, nurses, social workers, and restorative justice coordinators. Many schools lost funding for these positions due to the unjust budget cuts that some council members on this call voted yes on. And so to every council member who ran on a platform of educational equity or who claims to be a supporter of public education, just know that we are watching how you vote on this bill. If you support this bill and the funds it provides to further the school policing infrastructure and thus the school to prison pipeline, then please don't claim to be a supporter of equity in our schools. And if you truly cared about progress and the quality of New York City public schools, then you would reinvest the school policing budget back into the communities that need it the most. You will hire black and brown community members into restorative, well-paying roles that are not through surveillance and policing infrastructure. And you will stop voting yes on city budgets where the education is the first thing on the chopping block. Please vote no on intro 2211. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd now like to invite up Alexandra Haridopoulos from Teachers Unite, followed by Rodrigo Camarena, followed by Dulce Revolution. Time starts now. Hi everybody. Uh, thank you, Council, and uh, to all the community members who have spoken before. It's been a privilege to hear 
uh, your analysis tonight. I'm a teacher in District 10 in the Bronx, and I'm asking the council to divest from the NYPD budget, uh, specifically to not transfer over 400 cops to the Department of Education. Our students need healing right now. They have borne the brunt of this pandemic and we cannot keep uh, doing things the same and expecting a different result. Today, um, an organization I'm part of the Moore Caucus Movement for Rank and File Educators honored a day of rest as it's been a year since New York City schools shut down. Um, you know, we all, we all need a day of rest after this challenging, challenging year. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to read a couple of the demands from the Dignity in Schools campaign um, from the Urban Youth Collective Police Free Schools means funding for schools to build restorative, supportive, and safe schools. Supportive positions are created that are well paid and do not require bachelor's degrees. These roles do not require training in de-escalation and restorative justice. These are DOE positions, not external contracts. Positions include paraprofessionals, youth advocates, restorative justice coordinators, parent coordinators, community outreach coordinators, no policing, no policing roles by any name. Black and brown community members have access to well-paying jobs in our school system that are not through policing or security structure. Students and guests are greeted by community members, not law enforcement. No surveillance technology such as cameras, scanning, or metal detectors in schools, and no online surveillance of students. In addition to the supportive positions that do not require bachelor's degrees, positions are also created for counselors and social workers. School communities, students, teachers, principals, parents oversee the hiring of staff and increase positions for Black and Brown community members. There are pathways for former students to be employed at the school they attend in supportive, responsive positions. Counselors, social workers, caseload is manageable, one to 50 or one to 100. I would go as far as say one to 25 or 20. Smaller class sizes, one to 23, beautiful. With smaller class sizes, teachers will be able to build more meaningful relationships with their students. This contributes to a culture where safety is proactive rather than reactive and conflicts can be addressed before serious incidents occur. Additionally, when students are better supported academically, they are able to engage with class content and less likely to be involved in outside issues. These efforts need to be supported by culturally responsive education so students can see themselves reflected in the relevant curriculum that is meaningful to their interests and communities. This, help, this helps to create a space where students feel safe and included, which in turn keeps students engaged and in class. Restorative justice is not a program, but a meaningful culture shift this needs to be funding. This needs funding and time. This shift should not be a top-down directive, but instead should be led by students, parents, and educators who have this knowledge and experience. All school staff should be should receive their sort of justice training and police and culture in schools and punitive practices such as suspensions, detention, zero tolerance policies, and dress codes. Funding should be allocated directly to school communities leading the way. We do not want more money going to private contracts with nonprofits and have no relationship with those communities. And we want no more money going to police in our schools. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now call up Rodrigo Camarena, followed by Dulce Revolution, followed by Samantha Rubin. The time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Rodrigo Camarena. I'm a parent, uh, police and prison abolitionist, and I'm here in solidarity with the Teachers United Parents and the educators from Sunset Park, Red Hook, and South Brooklyn, who all dream of police-free schools and dismantling the school to prison pipeline. I'm here today to urge council members to reject intro bill 2211, a bill that would codify the transfer of the NYPD school division to the DOE. As a longtime activist and organizer in South Brooklyn who has watched our city increase its investment in police and prisons over the years, I fear for what the proposed transfer of 5,400 school police officers to the DOE will bring to the students, the teachers who have already suffered so much. I worry about their education, about their mental health, and the future of our young people. Students, teachers, parents, and community leaders from across New York City have come together to demand police-free schools. Policing in schools perpetuates a well-established school-to-prison pipeline that compromises access to education and opportunity. We all know too well that black and brown youth are disproportionately targeted by policing in schools and other punitive, punitive disciplinary measures. What we truly need are investments in supportive staff positions that our students demand. We're calling for funding to hire black and brown New Yorkers into jobs that support young people's social, emotional, and mental health. We want restorative justice coordinators, paraprofessionals, youth advocates, community outreach coordinators, parent coordinators, and more. Students have demanded investments that will help them learn, grow, and thrive, not more policing that will push them out of schools. 
That's why we're saying no to intro 2211, no to the hiring of 475 new school police officers, and yes to a budget that meaningfully funds school positions that support students. Thank you, I see my time. Thank you for your testimony. I now would like to invite Abdul Say Revolution to testify, followed by Samantha Rubin, followed by Caitlin Delphine. Time starts now. Good evening. Um, as far as not being redundant, I will not um, state on some points, but I will introduce myself. My name is Ayla Sabah Christian Dilone, and I'm a former city school teacher. English as a new language was my subject. And um, I have been working within the school system for 15 years and I'm a parent, a beautiful child. And um, I am appalled here as I sit here in opposition to 2211 at the, um, the policing of our schools, but yet the negating of the pertinent uh, tools that we need for our children to succeed that have nothing to do with the bodies of, uh, of law enforcement that would otherwise incriminate, criminalize, and um, further make our students feel as if they are indeed in a box, when in fact we know that they are limitless. I heard the children on this uh, thread and they, they spoke. I echo their sentiments. I heard teachers on this thread and I echo their sentiments. Um, I just want to reiterate as the climate that we're in at this very moment, which is crucial as we sit in a dire straits of racial divide, unfortunately, um, where a lot of truths are being told about uh, culture, cultural identity, um, curriculum itself needs to be looked at. So how are we first putting a stamp on policing rather than worrying about the curriculum that our very students will be receiving? And um, to that, the resources themselves. I'm from a district, I work in district, District 10, where uh, resources are not a plenty. There are no recreations to go with the students with what they need. And also my ENL community who come from other countries to have them be policed coming from a country where they are used to 60 in a classroom. It's further, uh, it's further denouncing them as students and further putting them in the field of they're not important, they're not special, they're not individual, individualized. How about we work on differentiation and that is making sure that every child gets to succeed, not only the children downtown, but the children inner city, urban America, they get a chance to succeed. And that would do so by making sure that they, especially after this pandemic, that they get the resources that they need, social, emotional learning tools, more teachers in classroom, smaller classroom settings, and overall love, overall love and understanding. And that does not come in the form of a badge, a gun, and things that we see around us that has been opposing and imposing themselves in our neighborhood and unfortunately taking our lives. In a sense of time, thank you. Thank you for that testimony. I'd now like to call on Samantha Rubin, followed by Caitlin Delphine, followed by Bonnie Massey from Teachers Unite. The time starts now. Hi, good evening. My name is Samantha Rubin. I'm a teacher at a high school in East Flatbush, Brooklyn, and I'm a member of Teachers Unite. I'm speaking today to urge council members to reject intro 2211, which would codify the transfer of the NYPD School Safety Division to the DOE. For the past 13 years, I have taught mostly black and brown students in heavily policed high schools. My students are disproportionately affected by punitive discipline policies because they ascend schools where instead of teachers and principals making the decisions about student discipline and safety, NYPD SSAs have the final say. This can look like students being suspended, issued summons, or handcuffed for infractions that could and would be handled differently in schools that aren't patrolled by SSAs. One common example that someone already mentioned this evening is the handcuffing of students in mental health crisis, who are then held in a small room with multiple SSAs, rather than allowed a quiet space with a counselor or social worker, a better environment for de-escalation that wouldn't further traumatize the students. Last year, more than 10% of my school student body lost a close family member to COVID-19. They weren't able to mourn with family, waited while their loved ones' bodies sat in overwhelmed funeral homes, and couldn't have the sense of normalcy that so many of us who dealt with loss in our youth found by attending school. When these students return to school in the fall, they don't need to be greeted by police. 
watched by police as they walk to class, or confronted by police if they act out when they feel overwhelmed. They need counselors, social workers, and parent coordinators to help them readjust. They need youth advocates and tutors from their own communities to meet them where they are and help them succeed. The $20 million of DOE funding that is being proposed as funding for two new academy classes of SSAs should be redirected to create and sustain positions in schools that support the students who are most affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Please reject intro 2211 and redirect the funding earmarked for new SSAs instead to invest in welcoming our students back into loving, positive school communities where they will be lifted up, not pushed out and policed. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we'll have Caitlin Delphine, followed by Bonnie Massey. Time starts now. Hi, thank you for having us tonight. Um, my name is Caitlin Delphine and I'm a special education teacher at a high school in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn and members, member of Teachers Unite. I'm here today to speak in opposition to intro number 2211. We need action to reduce policing in schools and to fund more teachers, counselors, and social workers, as well as restorative justice professionals, rather than spending more money retraining current SSAs, when we have seen so many times that retraining police does not work. I'm gonna to focus today on alternatives to policing in schools. Um, these alternatives exist and they are effective. I work in a restorative justice school. We've spent years developing culturally responsive classrooms and curriculum and ensuring that this is accessible to all of our students, including students with disabilities and English language learners. We focus on creating an actually safe environment for our students, not a facade of safety through uniformed officers in schools, scanning and constant surveillance. We are safe at our school because students are empowered to lead restorative justice initiatives, including relationship building, mediations and circles facilitation. And we've made an effort to train all staff in restorative justice practices. Through these efforts, we've seen a significant drop in suspensions and increase in physical safety. For example, it's been years since we've had a fight at the school. My students say things like, I tell my friends the school is so boring because there's never any fights. This is not an accident. We know that restorative justice practices work. We've done this all without funding for a restorative justice coordinator or other devoted restorative justice positions, as well as in direct contradiction to the SSAs and the culture of policing present in the DOE. The students, teachers, and staff at my school are not exceptional. Restorative justice can work anywhere, but it won't without funding and support. Imagine what could happen if we invested the millions that we currently do in school policing, instead in restorative justice, counselors, and teachers, creating schools that are actually safe and supportive for our students. When we do eventually return fully to in-person learning, the vast majority of my students will have been out of the building for well over a year. They will not be welcomed back by additional counselors or social workers to help them with the traumas of having to care for sick family members or feeling the weight of their family's finances on their shoulders as a teenager or social isolation. They will not be welcomed by more teachers to help refocus students who've had to be more involved in younger sibling schoolwork than their own or who still don't have access to adequate technology. Instead of choosing to fund education, the city has repeatedly chosen to fund policing. We are now funding a new class of school safety agents. We don't need 475 more school safety agents. We need more counselors, teachers, and restorative justice staff. We need better technology. Policing, scanning, and surveillance don't equal safety. They equal oppression and violence coming from the state. We know that restorative justice works. This is not uncharted territory. Other cities have begun the process of dismantling and defunding policing in schools. Until we here are talking about eliminating policing and fully funding education within our schools, we are not having the right conversation. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I would now like to turn to Bonnie Massey, followed by Camille Gosal. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bonnie Massey, and I am a school social worker who's been doing youth development, social work, and restorative justice work in New York City school settings for almost 20 years. Uh, most of my work has been in high schools, although for the past five years, I've been working primarily with middle school students. Um, I'm here today alongside my friends from Teachers Unite, and I'm here to urge council members to reject uh, intro 2211, um, which you guys now know is a bill that would codify the transfer of NYPD school safety division to the DOE. Uh, while I actually am glad to know that the city lawmakers are finally recognizing the need to undo the MOU that the Giuliani administration put in place, um, I want to be clear that just switching the city agency in charge of the police will not address the problems that are caused by an emphasis on policing in schools, nor will it do anything to address the problems that policing simply cannot. Uh, 
that it just it's not the solution. Um, our solution has to instead be investing in school communities. Our solution has to be holistic and includes issues of housing, healthcare, jobs. But when it comes and it's it's larger even right than education. But when it comes specifically to schools, we need to shift the culture of our schools from policing and high state testing and one size fits all uh, from segregated schools, from being punitive. We need to turn them into restorative communities where students with various identities, strengths and struggles are celebrated and built upon. Um, there's lots of scholars and educational academics who've been writing about this for a, a long time and talking about this for a long time. Uh, most recently, the, the new book that's in, in mold is written by Dr. Patina Love, Abolitionist Teaching. Y'all could check it out. But all of this is about the need that, to build. It's, it's not like some mumbo jumbo that people are making up, right? There's like people with PhDs writing books on this uh, that we need to be doing healing um, and loving, loving in our schools. I did say loving, yes. Um, and so I also want to speak in that same vein against de Blasio's plan to hire 475 new school police um, at the cost of $20 million. Um, that's $20 million of, the, of DOE funding that's not going to classrooms, not going to student supports, it's not going to create positions and opportunities in school focused on care and healing. Uh, while there's much hesitation and even outrage at the idea of defunding the police in schools and otherwise, we know that the DOE was actually defunded by $700 million last year. At this particular moment, um, and any moment, but I would say now, especially in this particular moment, which no one needs to say what our pandemic moment is, the city must prioritize growing school budgets and reducing the NYPD budget. Um, and we're talking about, I think a couple of other speakers said it, but we're talking about a change in culture and a shift in priorities, money talks. So if you're gonna say that we're a city that cares about student social emotional learning and well-being, we're concerned about students' academic growth, you can't spend more money on policing than counseling. If you're gonna say that we're a city where Black Lives Matter, you can't continually reinvest in the school to prison pipeline over investing in culturally responsive curriculum. We need sports, arts, youth development programming. Time has expired. Oh, I'm so sorry that my time expired because I, I did wanna tell you guys about my, um, my experience in schools doing this work and just how much it takes in order to do it. I understand that my time is up, so I, I, you guys have been here all day. But for anybody who has not worked in a school, like this, this work of creating a school community, the work of supporting SIFE students, the work of supporting L's, the work of, of getting students to trust you so that when there is a gang problem, they're gonna come to you. The work of getting students to sit in a circle and talk to somebody else who had a machete at them uh, a few weeks ago. Like this work takes a lot and it needs to be invested in. We, it's not just, one social worker, one restorative. I mean, like now, if we're, if a school has three social workers, they're like, whoa, that school has so many social workers, you know? And you can't imagine the the amount of work that we're being asked to do and what we're be and what we want to do. So I I have a lot more to say. I will stop. If at any other time, I can. I guess I'll, I'll submit some written testimony as well. Thank you for letting me go a few minutes over. I know it's been a long day. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. All right, next up, we'll go to Camille Gosell, uh, followed by Jennifer Finn from Teachers Unite. Time starts now. Whoops, thank you. There, um, there was an apparent, there was an apparent um, error in registration. I just became aware of this, you know, a little while ago. So what I'm choosing to do, I will testify at a future meeting um, simply because, you know, I'm not part of the organization and perhaps our views don't entirely mesh. Uh, however, I do wanna say that I do agree with everyone here and I do oppose intro 2211. And if possible, I don't know whether this is possible. If possible, I would like to donate the rest of my time to the previous speaker who may um, just need a little bit more time to elaborate our ideas. Okay, I think the previous speaker is off. We're gonna move on. No, I'm here, if that's allowed. Thank you. Uh, yeah, if if I'm allowed, I, I would take just one more minute if that was okay. Go right ahead, Ms. Massey. Oh, thank you guys so much. Um, so another thing that I, I did want to talk about was that um, 
as somebody who's worked in day, doing this work day in and day out for over two decades, um, or for nearly two decades, excuse me, that it's not just about like who owns this work, right? Because there's as many people with roles under the DOE that also undermine the work of restorative justice and undermine the work of community building. Um, there are educators, there's counselors, there's administrators, there's youth developers, there's parent there's people who don't get it, right? And who are not invested in it. And so it's not just about like, this goes back to the idea of this is a cultural change. We need structures in our school that are gonna enable us to do this work. And we need all hands on deck to be able to create this cultural shift so just putting it under the DOE doesn't, again, fix the problem. Um, our schools have done this, right? Where schools now use restorative justice as like a buzzword, right? And they hire one restorative justice coordinator or they send one cohort of staff over their spring break to do a circles training and they think that they're doing restorative justice. And as I was saying, as my time was running out before is that it takes a tremendous amount to do that work, a tremendous amount of work. Um, and, and so, I want to tell a quick story uh, when we talk about where does safety come from, right? I right now my role is to help students, well, a part of my role is to help students apply to high school. And so I talk to lots of families and students about what they're looking for, what do they want in a high school? And the number one thing that people want is safety. And so then we start to talk a little bit more about, well, what does safety mean? What does it safety look like for you? Like, do you want a metal detector? Do you not want to like what is it, what does it mean for you to know that a school is safe? Um, and time and time again, the idea of safety comes from community. That's what it is. Um, and I, I'm gonna tell a story about a young man in a previous school that I worked at who struggled with a lot of issues um, and he would have some breakdowns. And so there was a moment in the day where he had a breakdown um, and he was not for, originally from our country and his uh, primary language was a dialect that we didn't have any staff at the time who spoke that language. He also spoke English. Uh, at that time, but it was he was not totally comfortable. And he was, you know, jumping on top of things and he was in a mental break. He was jumping on top of things. He was throwing things. He was unsafe, right? And the thing that saved him, the only way that we were able to get him to calm down that day was because another student who spoke his language was able to come to him and hug him and hold him and speak to him in a way that was able to help bring him down. Um, so I say that to kind of emphasize the idea that it's community and it's relationship and it's like being responsive to individuals to talk about um, what they need. I work with that young man over- Time has expired. Thank you, thank you again for the extra time. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we will have Jennifer Finn from Teachers Unite followed by Alexa Aviles, excuse me, followed by Brandon West. Time starts now. Uh, good evening, my name is Jen Finn. I'm an elementary school teacher in the Lower East Side and a member of Teachers Unite. I'm speaking today to urge council members to reject intro 2211, which would codify the transfer of the NYPD school safety division to DOE. Policing in school perpetuates the well-established school to prison pipeline that compromises access and education to education and opportunity. Black and brown youth are disproportionately targeted by policing in schools and other punitive disciplinary practices. We oppose intro 2211 because it would transfer over 5,400 school police to DOE, creating new infrastructure to police and criminalize students. We also oppose the mayor's plan with NYPD to hire additional school police. We urge city council to block this proposed spending of $20 million to police young people when they return to school. For the past seven years, I've taught students in special ed. For half of my career, I've taught in a 12 to one self-contained special education setting. In the 12 to 1 classroom, students are disproportionately black and brown boys, many of whom have been labeled as defiant or emotionally disturbed, language that is already steeped in violence. These students are disproportionately impacted by punitive discipline and surveillance. However, over the past year, my kids have been fully remote, zooming into school from the safety of their own homes. And while it's been challenging at times, as all pandemic learning has been, They've been free of the heavy surveillance and punitive measures that are already so prevalent in school, including policing. We've laughed, shared stories, created art together, and all of this was possible without any police or discipline. When these kids return to school in the fall, they deserve to center joy and humanity. They don't need police. They need counselors, social workers, parent coordinators to help them heal. They need youth advocates and community members to help them thrive. The $20 million of DOE funding that's being proposed as funding for additional SSAs should be redirected to create and sustain supportive positions in schools that will support all kids. 
During remote learning, my kids have been surrounded by friends, friends and family at their homes who cultivated joy despite a global pandemic. Policing is antithetical to healing-centered schools that our students deserve. I urge you to reject intro 2211. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Unless there are questions from council members, I will move on to the next panelist. All right, seeing none, I'd like to call up Alexa Aviles, followed by Brandon West, followed by Jeff Straybone. Time starts now. Thank you so much, Chair Adams and members of the Safety Committee. My name is Alexa Aviles. I'm a Brooklynite, a parent of two public school students, a community leader, and a longtime District 38 resident. I am here to call on you to make real and deep cuts to the NYPD budget. Surveillance is not safety. Criminalization and militarized responses to poverty is not safety. Killing, hurting, and constant verbal dehumanization is not safety. If the NYPD wants to build trust, forget hollow words and plans. The NYPD can actually start by aggressively removing all those rotten apples within their ranks that they've so fervently protected over the decades. And they can also zealously organize in the same way that they fear mongered this morning against the gun industry that keeps firearms flowing across the country and New York City. For years, our community our communities of color like mines have suffered at the hands of the NYPD. And while they get more funding, neighborhoods like mine see cuts to services. I testify before you today to assert that in this unprecedented crisis, we cut the NYPD budget, not just by 1 billion, but by half, 3 billion. 1 billion is simply how much the NYPD budget increased over the last eight years. And in this so-called 1 billion in cuts, the last budget cycle, we know it was a farce. In addition, I urge you today to take the following steps to enact real budget justice, deduct settlement money directly from the NYPD operating budget. The city has footed the bill for over half a billion dollars in payouts to families victimized by the NYPD. These payouts have not changed the NYPD's racist behaviors or tactics, and those resources most certainly have not kept our community safe or made them better. What a waste. Enact a moratorium on all new NYPD recruitment classes. We must impose a hiring freeze on uniformed street police. The NYPD has added thousands of police since 2013, but our communities have not gotten safer as a result. Teachers who we desperately need are under a five year hiring freeze. Fund the essential programs and services that keep our community safe not police. The preliminary budget increases the NYPD budget by 1% while slashing health and hospital funding by 27%, slashing to the department, um, the department of Health by another 20% and reducing the Department of Education's budget by 1%. It should come of no surprise that we are in this moment of crisis New Yorkers are angry and we're left wondering why the mayor and the city council continue to increase funding to NYPD and policing while slashing services. It is shameful to divest from our public health and education systems to fund more policing during a global pandemic. Violence and poverty requires a public health approach that means investing in health and well being, investing in systems and approaches that will help us recover and help us thrive. Please listen. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we'll have Brandon West, followed by Jeff Straybone, followed by Ashley Prather. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to speak in front of this committee. My name is Brandon West. I'm an organizer, and I was one of the many who were that were behind the Occupy City Hall action last year, as well as an organizer with the New York City Workers for Justice. Uh, I'm here today to give a testimony, not solely from the background of a racial justice organizer, but as a former city budget analyst for, uh, at both the Mayor's Office of Management Budget and at City Council Finance. So from 2013 to 2017, I saw firsthand the tail end of the Bloomberg administration and the beginning of the de Blasio administration, of which we saw a decrease in crime and an increase in the capital and expense budget at NYPD, including the beginning of the payouts 
as a, a result of the unethical Muslim surveillance program that I remember at OMB. I had uh, previous comments, but I feel just from being here all day and at, in the morning, uh, I need to you know, directly address sort of what we've heard earlier today. Uh, the degree of disconnect from the rhetoric that we heard today from the first deputy mayor and the actual NYPD budget is incredibly stark and requires you know, specific attention. Dean Fulian presented in rhetoric a vast rethinking of policing through the form of recommendations to reduce over policing of communities of color and create creating alternatives. But where is this reflected in the budget? The first deputy mayor talks about reversing racialized policing, but policing at its core is racialized. Like this is not solvable by bias training or by recommendations when the core of the budget and the management structures of the NYPD are still intact. Exactly zero of the problems that we're discussing right now are new. Neighborhood policing is still policing and advocates, community members, and frankly, legislators know what exactly reduces violence in people's lives and we're not funding it. Policing doesn't make people safe. Harm reduction, mitigation, and social services do. Uh, this isn't a radical idea either. Uh, if so many 911 calls are results of mental health episodes, why has it taken so long to even begin to create an alternative response system that we have? If the pilot in Brownsville to move away from beat cops and towards community-led safety was a success, uh, where are more of these alternatives to policing and why are we not funding it? Any real agenda for public safety must replace police with empowered communities working to solve their own problems. I don't see empowered communities in the NYPD budget. Um, I see a cursory reform and a widening disconnect between funding priorities and the people. And I'm happy to see the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we'll call Jeff Straybong, followed by Ashley Prepu. Time starts now. Good evening, Chair Adams and members of the Committee on Public Safety. My name is Jeff Strabone. I'm a lifelong resident New Yorker and former vice chair of Community Board 6 in Brooklyn. I live in the 39th District. I thank the committee for its time and for listening. Subject of my testimony today is the budget for fiscal year 2022 as it concerns the NYPD. To get right to the point, I ask that you reduce the NYPD's budget by at least $2 billion. My request is based on the premise that the NYPD is currently tasked with responsibilities for which it is ill-suited, most especially mental health emergency responses and school safety. The city needs to create non-police alternatives and to fund those robustly. And there's your $2 billion. I ask that you substantially reduce the NYPD's budget not to punish the force, regardless of how much they may deserve it after nine months of sustained brutality and violence against peaceful protesters, which I have witnessed myself. No, I am making this request from a good faith belief that it, that it will actually make the NYPD a better police force if it's relieved of responsibilities for mental health and school safety. Police are not social workers. We should not task them with duties far beyond their training. Don't send a cop with a gun to someone's dark night of the soul. Send a social worker. The same applies to schools. The way to end the school to prison pipeline is to stop arresting school children. New Yorkers deserve a full spectrum of harm reduction and public safety tools, not just those provided by police. A government budget is a moral declaration. It tells the world what a given society deems important enough to spend money on. You have the opportunity to craft a new moral vision of how a city can keep its people safe. I encourage you to be brave, to have the moral vision, to imagine a city of love, of care, of gentleness. Make this year's budget a loud and proud declaration that New York City can take care of people in need without police, without guns. Take the NYPD entirely out of mental health and school safety. Use that $2 billion to fund new nonviolent agencies. Other cities are doing it. Why should we be stuck in the past? Finally, if you want to trim the fat within the NYPD, I suggest cutting back on helicopters and a strategic response group. There's no need to deploy them against peaceful protesters as routinely happens. Don't send the counterterrorism squad to a street protest. Black Lives Matter is not Al Qaeda, but the strategic response group can't tell the difference. 
cut the SRG. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd now like to invite up Ashley Prather to testify, followed by Aileen Vicencio, followed by Kay Gabriel. Time starts now. Good evening. My name is Ashley Prather and my pronouns are she or they. I'm a member of the Democratic Socialists of America. I'm a proud communist, feminist, anti-capitalist, abolitionist, queer person, Brooklynite, and survivor. However, these aspects of my identity are often used to discredit my perspective. So I speak today as someone who currently works in child welfare. My views do not reflect that of my employer, but my experience working in an organization that specializes in caring and supporting New York City's traumatized and vulnerable children and families has deeply impacted my beliefs about the police. I'm here today to call for the NYPD to be defunded and abolished, period. I believe defunding the police is necessary not only because they are a uniquely violent, militarized, systemically, historically racist organization, but because the vast resources the NYPD is allocated could be and should be diverted to programs that actually help New Yorkers. At my job and across New York City, we have families who are struggling to eat, struggling to stay in their homes, struggling to access healthcare that they desperately need. Many are newly saddled with the added burden of funeral costs for loved ones who have died to COVID-19. Families are being separated by ACS due to criminalization of poverty, while social service programs are being cut. Programs that support vulnerable New Yorkers are fighting right now to secure funding and to stay afloat, such as Fair Futures, which provides mentorship and guidance to foster youth. While programs like this struggle, the NYPD budget has continued to bloat like a rotting carcass. This funding disparity reveals a truly disgusting disregard for the actual health and safety of New Yorkers, such as the clients of my organization, but also as survivors like myself. I learned in an early age as a New York City public school student that the police were there to harass my friends of color and laugh off incidents of sexual harassment, stalking, and rape that I experience. In short, the police do not keep us safe. They only keep capital safe. If we want safe and healthy communities, we must defund the NYPD and invest in programs that improve the lives of New Yorkers, lift them out of poverty and provide real safety. We must invest in the people of this city. We must defund the NYPD. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we'll have Eileen Vicencio, followed by Kay Gabriel, followed by Emmy Hammond. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Aileen Vicencio. I'm a resident of District 26 in Queens and a member of New York City DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America, which has more than 7,000 members in New York City fighting to defund the NYPD, tax the rich, and build an, econo an econ economy for public good. I'm here to say that the preliminary budget falls seriously short of what the city needs and is a tremendous disappointment. In a time where millions are facing the pandemic's combustion of existing social issues like food, house, food housing and healthcare insecurity, the preliminary budget proposes to cut even more lifelines to residents that are going through indescribable pain and suffering in this very moment, while the NYPD gets more money to continue police poverty and brutalize communities in color and reform itself. Instead of adding cops to subways, we should be investing in mental health services that address the roots of this unfortunate violence. Instead of hiring more SSAs, we should be investing in our children's futures by getting them equitable access to technology so they can continue learning and developing. I have been listening to this hearing and hearing a lot about bringing justice and equity to the city. And I would like to clarify that justice for black lives means investing in black and brown communities, cutting school, hospital, housing, and social services budgets while billions are spent on the NYPD, even as we admit that all the evidence of reforming police departments is a complete waste of taxpayers' money is a pretty clear message on where the mayor and where the city council stands, even if the mayor paints the streets with the letters BLM. Clearly, he doesn't know what they need. 
When George Floyd was murdered, I knew why and I had to protest. And when I marched this summer alongside tens of thousands of my fellow New Yorkers, they beat and arrested us simply for exercising our First Amendment rights. Every single time it was the NYPD who escalated. Every time it was the NYPD who introduced violence. Police don't see us as people, police see us as threats. And at times of greatest need, they continue to put us in danger and kill us. I keep hearing the NYPD cry about their pressures over time, and I don't see why we should pay for that. When I'm biking around and see multiple officers, multiple officers sitting in their patrol cars doing absolutely nothing, I have to wonder, why am I paying for this? Why are we paying for this? I don't need a car blocking bypass or park entrances. I need trash bins on every corner of every street so our city is clean. I don't need police to corral houseless individuals to places where we can't see them. I want experienced professionals to, to address people's needs and provide them with the care they need to survive and live dignified lives. I don't need a blueprint plan to privatize NYCHA. I need the existing buildings to stop poisoning it poisoning its residents. We can give each other the safety that we need if we have the courage to see it and to fight for it. I am here in, solid in solidarity with all comrades, grassroots organizations, nonprofits, labor unions, tenant units, advocates, and community members that have been fighting before and since the George Floyd uprisings to create the world that we deserve and that we need. I ask that the city council fight for a budget that completely removes NYPD from mental health crisis response and homeless and houseless outreach. That takes, that takes cops out of schools that stops NYPD from policing protests and sex work by disbanding the SRG and by squad. I ask that the city council do everything in its power to defund the NYPD Time has expired. Dollars and redirect that money to fund the services and infrastructure that, that provide real safety and improve people's lives. That is good jobs, dignified housing, health care, child care, elder care, mental health care, education, transit, food security, and free time for culture and community. We have the money to do it. We know it is right. We ask that you stand with the people and use your power to open the doors to a better world for all of us. We keep us safe. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we'll go to Kay Gabriel, followed by Emmy Hammond, followed by Tracy Fu. Time oh. starts now. Uh, hello, my name is Kay Gabriel. I'm an adjunct university instructor and a New York City resident. And I'm also a member of the NYC chapter of the DSA, which has more than 7,000 members fighting to defund the NYPD, tax the rich and build a city for people over profit. We've been out in our neighborhoods, I live in Queens, talking to our neighbors about what they need to live well. I was talking to residents in the Queensbridge houses and they said that they have to wait months and sometimes years to get crucial repairs in their apartments to their broken stoves and leaking bathroom ceilings. NYCHA residents citywide are forced to live with broken elevators and black mold. Meanwhile, with 92,000 people in need of housing, houselessness in the city is at an all-time high, and the public housing that we do have is falling deep into disrepair or being sold to private equity firms like Blackstone, which now owns Stytown and is being sued for raising the rent on the tenants there. I'll say here that houselessness and infection from unlivable conditions are other slower ways by which black and brown people are robbed of their lives by a city that will not foot the bill to alter their conditions. 17% of children under 12 in the Bronx have asthma and that is directly tied to conditions in NYCHA housing. I look around here like many, many New Yorkers walking through these valleys of poverty and dispossession in one of the richest cities in human history. The city council says they can't pay for faster NYCHA repairs. They can't pay for housing vouchers for everyone who needs housing, but they can fund the NYPD to purchase robot dogs and Tesla cars and military grade weapons and helicopters and pay for 36,000 uniformed officers, which SVA president Ed Mullins described as the largest non-military army in the world. While other city agencies have been under an austerity hiring freeze, the NYPD inducted 900 new officers this past fall and will do the same this spring. What kind of city do we live in where we pay to maintain an army but can't put a roof over everybody's head or feed every hungry mouth? Where kids walk through metal detectors at school but never get to see a counselor? What kind of city do we live in where we can pay for police to gun down people like Sahid Vassell, who are experiencing mental health crises, but cannot actually provide them with mental health care? What kind of piecemeal reform can possibly close this yawning gap of racial and economic justice? 
The budget is an expression of public priorities of the things we really care about. The mayor's FY 2022 budget increases funds for policing while presenting an austerity budget elsewhere with cuts to schools, hospitals, parks, youth development and sanitation, all of which actually keep our communities safe. If we care about safety, let's use the immense wealth of this city to pay for the things that people need, not cops, but housing, healthcare, education, transit, infrastructure, food security. Defund the NYPD by at least $3 billion. Reinvest in my, our communities. I yield my time. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we will have Emmy Hammond, followed by Tracy Fu, followed by Elliot Colbert. Thank you. Time starts now. Good evening. My name is Emmy Hammond. I'm a resident of District 34 and also a member of the NYC chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America. And I would like to testify today as to why I believe in the strongest terms that we cannot achieve real public safety with reformed or reinvented policing, but only with less policing, coupled with real investment in our communities. That's why I am proud to be a part of the campaign to defund the NYPD, starting by cutting at least $3 billion in this city budget and freezing new NYPD hires. I am angry every day that I walk to the grocery store or the train because I pass in a five minute walk without fail, multiple neighbors sleeping and living unhoused in the streets every night. And then I walk into Myrtle Broadway station and I frequently see there two or three police officers standing there making sure that nobody is getting through those doors without paying their $2.75. I do not feel safer when I see those police. No one that I know does. This is just one familiar scene, just one example that encapsulates what policing is really about, which is not protecting people, but protecting property and profits. I was also one of the protesters last summer who ran faster than I have ever run or moved in my life because an NYPD car accelerated directly into me and my friends. I do not feel safer when I see police. Moreover, the majority of so-called crimes that NYPD respond to every day when they are not simply surveilling, harassing, and brutalizing people are acts of poverty and desperation, many of which, such as turnstile jumping, actually harm no one. And what we have to respond to that is not in any sense a justice system. It is a punishment an incarceration system, which keeps none of us safer and directly endangers people every day. It is systematically racist, classist, and violent, not as a bug that can be reformed away, but as a feature. What does keep us safe, what represents some real justice are secure and comfortable homes, including public housing, dignified jobs that pay a living wage, well-equipped hospitals and schools with enough teachers and counselors. The over $11 billion that the NYPD costs us every year between operating budget and centrally allocated expenses is $11 billion robbed, stolen from what we actually need for real public safety instead of criminalization and caging. So again, I ask the city council to cut at least $3 billion from the NYPD now and reallocate that money to our healthcare, housing and schools Thank you, council members, Chair Adams. I yield my time. Thank you for your testimony. Unless there are questions from council members, we will move on to the next panelist. All right, seeing none, we'll move on to Tracy Fu, followed by Elliot Colbert, followed by David Jenkins. All right, hi, hi. my Hello. name is Tracy. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, Hi, my name is Tracy Fu. I am a resident of District 6 in Manhattan and a member of New York City DSA, which has more than 7,000 members in the city fighting to defund the NYPD, tax the rich, and organize to build an economy that is focused on public good rather than for private profit. I'm here today to testify that this preliminary budget is woefully insufficient to meet the needs of my loved ones, the communities I'm a part of, and the city as a whole. A city's budget is a reflection of its priorities and choosing to increase the funding of NYPD while cutting the funding of virtually every actual public health and safety services agency in this country, or sorry, in the city, the city is prioritizing the NYPD over true public health and safety. The NYPD does not increase public safety, it perpetuates violence. Last year, like tens of thousands of other New Yorkers, I marched in the streets after George Ford is murdered and witnessed the NYPD consistently beating and arresting us for simply exercising our First Amendment rights. The NYPD is a violent institution that cannot be reformed because its very purpose has always been to enforce inequality and suppress dissent. 
Additionally, there has been an increase in violence against Asian New Yorkers like me, and that has been used as an excuse for more policing. A few weeks ago, the NYPD installed hundreds of surveillance cameras in response, and I know there's been talk earlier in this hearing of funding the Hate Crimes Task Force, but policing will not prevent or address the violence of displacement and poverty that have been making Asian communities vulnerable for years. Flushing residents are being priced out of their homes and are going hungry due to unfettered luxury development and cost of social services. This is also violence. Chinatown residents and workers are being displaced and losing their jobs due to real estate interests and lack of robust socioeconomic supports. This is also violence. In fact, on March 2nd, Chinatown's last vestige of organized labor at Jingfang that is being destroyed due to real estate pressure, workers protesting outside the restaurant, guess what the NYPD officers did? They blocked the, the workers from delivering their demands to the owners that to protect their jobs and to you know, support their survival. And you know, that's what police do. They protect capital and property, not people. Throwing more money into the NYPD will not solve any of the root causes of social problems, but investments into communities and community-based programs will. Let the comrades who testified before me, I'm asking the city council to defund the NYPD by at least $3 billion and put that money towards what would actually improve lives and prevent violence. Good jobs, dignified housing, education, mental health care, elder care, language access, food security. Investing in these is the right thing to do if our goal truly is to build a better, stronger New York City that works for all of us. And we need your help to do this. Thank you, Chair Adams, especially uh, for sticking it out and for hearing my testimony. I yield my time. Ms. Poo, I just want to say your passion is so appreciated at, the, at this nth hour. So you are you, you're strengthening me in, the, in, 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 in these hours as we continue to go. Thank you so much for your testimony. Appreciate it. Thank you. We will move on to the next panelist, who will be Elliot Colbert, followed by David Jenkins followed by Ali Fer Sebek. Time starts now. Thanks, Matt, and Chair Adams, the committee, and to Daniel and all the council staff who kept this hearing running today, all day. My name is Elliot Colbert. I'm a student at CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies and a proud member of the Queens branch of New York City DSA. Like my friend Kay, last month I watched a video of a $100,000 robotic surveillance dog marching down 227th Street in the Bronx, and I shook my head in anger. There are four public schools on that street alone. I wanna know when's the last time they got a hundred grand in new technology. But here we are deploying shiny robots from MIT to keep an eye on those students and their families in the name of public safety. I got caught in a four car pileup on top of the Verrazano last summer. It was a little dicey. We were blocking traffic with low visibility. And yet I had to think twice about calling 911 because I didn't know who was in those other cars and how their interactions with the police might play out. As a trans woman, I was hardly eager to engage with an armed officer myself, given the painful history of police harassment that my community has experienced. And later on, when I went to retrieve a copy of the accident report, I was met by a swarm of unmasked cops at the 104th precinct in Ridgewood. Police simply don't make us safer. Rather, they siphon resources away from the essential services our city must provide in order to guarantee the well being of its residents. For this reason, the 2022 budget must defund NYPD by at least $3 billion as a pathway to abolition. It's important to note that when we speak of police and prison abolition, we don't just mean the city council with the stroke of a pen simply disbanding the NYPD and closing the jails. What we mean is abolishing the desperate conditions under which policing and prisons became the solution to problems in the first place, as explained so eloquently by Ruth Wilson Gilmore. In short, that means abolish, abolishing poverty in our city. And it means redirecting the resources we now put toward beating and locking people up, instead toward making sure that everyone can lead a healthy and dignified life, that they can give their best to a community they love, that they call home, and that loves them back. So we need officers out of schools, spend that money on textbooks, teachers, counselors, and college prep. Don't send transit police into the subway to protect the homeless ensure that everyone has stable housing. Let DOT respond to traffic accidents. I didn't need someone with a Glock to help me off the road and eliminate the strategic response group that brutalizes everyone they meet. When I see a budget with 200 million in cuts at DOE and a 200 million increase for NYPD, I see that something's horribly wrong in our city. And alongside my community, I'll give everything I've got to make sure that you're the council that sets things right. Thank you, I yield my time. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we will have David Jenkins, 
followed by Ali Fersebeck, followed by Vanessa Pareda. Time starts now. Uh, hello, and thank you all for your time today, particularly the members of council and all your keen questions and advocacy so far. Uh, my name is David Jenkins. I'm a lifelong New Yorker living in District 40, and I'm also a member of the NYC chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America. Uh, I had originally planned to testify about the brutality I and others experienced at the hands of the police over the summer and the alternative models of public safety, which a number of people have already mentioned. Uh, but actually, just one week ago today, I had a police encounter that I think perfectly illustrates both some of the problems as well as some of the solutions. Uh, so I was collecting signatures for a city council candidate when a domestic dispute spilled out onto the sidewalk. The woman engaged me for help and her husband accosted me and then struck her before a crowd formed and he fled the scene. Much later, the police showed up across the street and when she first waved them over, they rolled their eyes and shrugged at her. She then told me that she wasn't safe with them and asked me to stay. And sure enough, when they finally came over, they were annoyed, uh, claiming no one had called them and questioning her account, despite her very visibly injured face and her distraught child. Um, and all they could offer her in the end was an arrest of her husband. So she shut it down. She knew how much worse that arrest would make matters for her family. See, she had told me while we were waiting how hard she'd been working from a shelter to get services and counseling for everyone in her family uh, after she'd lost her job with the city, I should add, and their housing in this pandemic. And I could see how those officers who looked like at this point they now really cared felt helpless as they left. So she and I kept talking for a little while and without any slogans or policy jargon, we reflected together on how cops don't do what we think they're supposed to do, you know, protect us from harm. And they simply can't give people the help they need after harm has occurred. So I hope you'll keep the many, many stories like mine, which I'll expound upon in my written testimony, uh, in your heart when considering what services should be the priority for the next city's budget. Significant and eventually entire reinvestments of the budget from the police to various community services and a just transition for displaced officers and workers starting now will change and save so many lives and make stories like mine a thing of the past. Uh, thank you very much for your time, your attention, your, all your attention today, and your service. Uh, I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we'll have Ali Fersebeck, followed by Vanessa Pereira, followed by Rob Katz. Time starts now. Good evening, committee members, and thank you so much, Chair Adams, for being here. I know it's been a long day for you, and I know you've been here since 10 a.m. My name is Alifer Sebek, and I'm an artist, educator, community organizer, and member of District 50. And I'm here to ask that committee members take a look at how they wield their power. In history books, would we write about how you helped low-income, marginalized communities people who may not look like you, but who you can believe when they say they've been hurt by killer cops, people in your city who need safety and resources to thrive. I ask how you're using the data being presented to you and readily accessible to you as majority wealthy government officials to help those in need. Are you turning the other cheek and washing yourselves of your responsibilities? Please hear me. The last thing we need in our communities is more cops. As an immigrant who is actively stopped by ICE and profiled by NYPD, who has been harassed by racist cops in New York for the past 10 years, I'd like to share a story of how I was mistreated by a group of cops during June of 2020. There was a group of protesters against a group of cops in lower Manhattan and one teenager towards the front of the crowd kept throwing himself at, at the cops. Instead of taking him aside and communicating with him, multiple officers then proceeded to take their guns out to intimidate him. Seeing this, I immediately stepped in front of this young boy. <sighs> when that encouraged more killer cops to take out more guns, 
I remember immediately I remember immediately feeling my shirt being wet as I was terrified to see so many guns in front of me. <laughs> Seeing multiple guns pointed at me as I tried to assist this child is still something that I have nightmares about. And the criminalization of this young black boy by the NYPD is not a reason to increase their budget. I'm here to ask that we please reject Bill 2211. Our teachers don't have enough money for basic supplies for their students, but we have enough money to hire more cops. We don't need 400 new school officers. We need to hire 400 more teachers. We need to hire 400 more community organizers. We need to hire 400 more caseworkers. We don't need more killer cops on the payroll. We need to end qualified immunity. We need to defund and abolish the NYPD. $20 million to new police officers is stealing from our youth, directly from our youth. We need a hiring freeze for all NYPD departments. We need to divest every dollar we can from the NYPD to community programs and schools, programs that feed our people and shelter our unhoused community. Have moral vision, make truly progressive decisions, even if it upsets your colleagues, be there for the people and we will have your back. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sebeck. I, I just wanna say your testimony is just so moving. Um, I'm so sorry that that happened to you and I appreciate your testimony tonight more than you know. Thank you so, so very much. Thank you, Alifer, and thank you, Chair. Next up, we'll have Vanessa Pareto, followed by Rob Katz, followed by Garen Scott. Time starts now. Good evening. Thank you, Chair Adams and all attendees for giving me the time to speak. My name is Vanessa Pereda. I am from District 43, but work and have deeply invested and loved Districts 34 and 37 in Brooklyn, Kings County, Lenape, Hoking, the unceded land of the Lene Lenape. I wanna thank and stand with our previous speaker. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. I am a Chicana theater artist, actor, playwright, and even more importantly, an educator and community director for an off-off Broadway theater company in Brooklyn. I'm here today because I wanna talk about defunding and the reallocation of funds from the NYPD in service of community care and public safety. Reallocating those funds and putting money to community-based programs that helps the kids and the families that I serve as a teaching artist and as an arts ed programmer is public safety in action. I've witnessed and experienced the impact of racist and violent police relations, not only in the communities that I work in, but also during peaceful Black Lives Matter gatherings and protests, which I am often a part of. I've also witnessed and experienced the impact of COVID-19 in community of communities of color, the lack of proper and affordable housing, the lack of access to good health care, mental health care, the lack of care for the houseless, which I was at different points in my childhood, and the lack of funding for arts and education, all of which equate to a lack of public safety. You are lacking. And in order to create a just world, we need to double down on taking care of our community, especially BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color communities. I'm here to ask you to defund the NYPD and reallocate those funds to community-based programs that house families and provide truly affordable housing, create access to affordable health care, including mental health services, and proper funding to schools and arts programs, including theaters, especially in black and brown communities and neighborhoods. These are the steps forwards to value, serve and protect the lives of so many New Yorkers in need, not padding and protecting the NYPD. Black lives matter, black women matter. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we'll have Rob Katz, followed by Garen Scott, followed by Adika Pimentel. Time starts now. 
Hi, my name is Rob. Thank you for having me. I'm a member of NYC DSA, an organization of more than 7,000 members in New York City, working to build a city that works for the public good rather than private profit. I'm also a member of the Ridgewood Tenants Union, an organization of tenants across Ridgewood and its surrounding neighborhoods, keeping each other safe and building community. Uh, I wanna thank Chair Adams for this hearing. This has been a very long day, especially for the people who have to keep the trains running. Um, last summer, the NYPD showed their hand. I understand they're on the defensive now because people are questioning what it's really for. Between the last half of 2015 and the first half of 2020, taxpayers paid out nearly $250 million to people in all, uh, to, to people in all five boroughs. Crime is at an all-time low, arrests have decreased over the last decade. And meanwhile, the budget balloons. Of course, we all know this. Some of us approve of it. Some of us understand it for what it is. Perhaps the old ways might actually be born out of, as Council Member Barron explained earlier today, a very vicious past that is going to continue to haunt us. I understand the NYPD is not interested in those conversations. And I hear that many politicians who are bankrolled by those who profit off the NYPD are only interested in pushing a false dichotomy where public safety and policing are somehow considered to, to, to uh, as if you can't have one without the other. And that's on the NYPD. And that's on their $150 million communications division and the successful lobbying they've done of some elected representatives who exploit that imagined divide sh to shore up their support and build hate. I was several feet away in, from Dunya Zayer, a 21 year old woman who was body slammed and called something I'm not gonna say on here in May, 2020 by officer Vincent D'Andrea, who talked about trauma. I don't know if it gets more traumatic than that. Uh, a, a, an officer, a, an agent of the state um, with a bruised ego insulting you and really just ruining your life. A friend of mine was arrested during a kettling near Cadman Plaza. We spent hours looking for her and concerned for her safety. It turns out that a male officer had leaned into her body, put her to the ground, and then with a few other officers leaning into her said, I think that I should just kill you. As he handcuffed her, he went and, and hours later, 3 a.m. we find her. Her partner was furious. I was furious, all of us were furious. Meanwhile, when we were kettled, we were not safe. We were trampled. We were chased and poached. Commissioner Shea, Shea called these strategic arrests. On top of the usage of the term strategic, uh, the strategic response group, I think that their definition of strategic has a lot less to do with us as the people and more to do with their interests. If they truly cared about public safety, they would come to the table and talk with us and we would come to the conclusion that $3 billion have to be divested from the NYPD immediately with this next budget so that we can invest that in resources, in housing, in NYCHA, in, 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 in a lot of things. And I just wanna go here and say, no more platitudes from the city council, no more tweaks, no more preserving your political dynasty or your career. Stand on the side of the people and divest $3 billion to go toward the people's needs, that's housing, that's education, that's healthcare, that's jobs, that's public sector jobs. Doing all of that will leave you in the arms of the people who will support you and they will not turn their backs on you, unlike the NYPD that traffics in blood, money, and threats to keep political dynasties and political careerists afloat. Don't join them. Stand with the people and divest from the NYPD. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we'll have Garen Scott, followed by Adika Pimentel, followed by Meryl Mosun. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Adams and the full Public Safety Committee for your time today. My name is Garen Scott, and I'm a resident of District 35 and a member, a member of NYC DSA. Um, I'd like to relate what happened when I was arrested protesting around Bowery and First the night of Saturday, May 30th when the police escalated suddenly charging the protesters I was with. Um, as we retreated, I saw a cop grab a black man who was just standing there watching. Um, with my hands above my head, I was asking the cops why he was being arrested when I was tackled from behind by two officers. On the transport van um, in handcuffs, I learned that that man wasn't even a protester. He lived in the building and had come outside in his flip-flops to see what was happening and they spear tackled him to the ground and arrested him anyway. Um, also in that van was a young black man with a severe head injury caused by the cops. 
Um, as we were parked outside of one police plaza, his symptoms began to dramatically worsen. I saw him lose consciousness and fall forward onto his lap. For 10 minutes, uh, myself and the rest of the arrested people in the van were begging for medical attention and completely ignored. Then that young man began seizing up. Another 10 minutes passed before he was finally extracted from the bus and laid out on the concrete for the ambulance to pick him up. I can't overstate how unconcerned the cops were, how slowly they moved, and how they seemed to resent our request for medical attention. If you call for a cop's attention, the rule seems to be that he must ignore you the first few times because to respond promptly would indicate that they were in service to us, whereas everything that they did was calculated to demonstrate the opposite and that even a seizure would be dealt with at their pace. So what do you think causes crime? Is it, do you think it's poverty? Is it a lack of opportunities? Is it a miseducation? Is it entertainment? Like whatever you think it is, the police can't solve it. They can only manage the results with violence. For decades, the city has expanded the NYPD's budget while defunding housing, healthcare, education, mental health support, homeless support, and all the other services that actually address the root causes of crime and actually keep people safe. It's a moral outrage that this budget cuts funding to every department but the NYPD and the Department of Corrections. To solve the enormous problems our city faces, we need to directly fund the root causes of these issues. And with an austerity budget, we can't do that without defunding the NYPD. Last June, the mayor claimed the NYPD budget was cut by a billion. Commissioner Shea said the same today. It's a blatant lie, and I can't imagine anyone who protested over the summer believing it. Rather than budgetary sleight of hand and fake caps on overtime, New York City DSA is calling for three billion of the NYPD's funds to be reinvested in communities most impacted by police violence. Time has expired. We didn't get special treatment. It's a moral outrage that teachers, EMTs, and other essential workers face layoffs, benefit cuts, and hiring freezes while the city is hiring new cops. Um, and last, I'm sorry to go over, but since Council Member Rosenthal asked about an alternative to the mayor's recently released plan, I will say also that New York City DSA has done just that, drawing from the work of Communities United for Police Reform and other community groups, and we're going to release that plan publicly in the next couple of weeks. So I would be more than happy to share that plan with any interested council members or advocates. And thank you again for hearing my testimony. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we'll have Adika Pimentel from Teens Take Charge, as well as Meryl, Meryl Mosun. Hey. Good evening. My name is Adolka, and I use she and they pronouns. I'm an organizer with Make Doro New York and the Urban Youth Collaborative, uh, not Teens Take Charge. 18 years ago, I was undocumented and starting my freshman year of high school. As a young person who was growing up watching my then undocumented mom work as a waitress and live paycheck to paycheck, I had many stressors that I carried with me to school, whether it was the fear of deportation or how we were going to continue to keep a roof over our heads. I carried it with me in my body and in interactions. I remember searching for true safety in school, in a place you know, where I spent the majority of my days and found it in my relationships with teachers I trusted in my school and in my community home then known as Make the Road by Walking. School safety agents in my school who start watching us first thing in the morning didn't make me feel safe. I dealt with verbal harassment and sexual harassment often on the metal detector line while we are pulling off our boots, belts, and jackets as demanded by agents. As a black woman who has experienced this and who knows other people who have similar experiences, it has been painful, but not surprising to see people in positions of power disregard and ignore stories. It's painful, but not surprising to see people make the same claims about any NYPD unit that complains and lived experiences are not valid. I am here today as someone who graduated from a New York City public school, as someone who supports and loves youth leaders who attend school currently and go through the same things I went through 18 years ago. And as an older sister who has a younger brother who had school police forcefully pull his hoodie off his head, who is now a father to my nephew who will turn one years old on Saturday and who will experience similar if we don't change things. I'm here to say that police have no role in our schools. We are spending way too much time as a city talking about what school safety agents need and not, ne not nearly enough time spending uh, providing students with what they need. People keep asking how will schools be safe, but no one's really listening. We are spending $450 million positions in schools 
that are not helping students with their social, emotional, and mental health needs. We need to reinvest those funds back into our communities and into our schools. How can we have $20 million to hire 475 more school safety agents returning from the worst health pandemic we have ever seen? Every dollar should go into the social and mental health needs of our young people. The message that you sent to New Yorkers when you are willing to spend all that money during a pandemic where people are struggling to buy food to eat, pay for rent and buy medicine is that you're not willing to prioritize the needs of our communities. That you would rather continue to fund the racist systemic pipeline of feeding youth to the unforgiving criminal system rather than listen to the directly impacted young people when they say we need to remove police from schools immediately, not transfer them to the Department of Education, not retrain them, but remove them entirely and immediately. Students need mental health support, especially now, and should have social workers and guidance counselors in right. schools. We have the funds to do this. We just need to reinvest and reimagine the way we look at safety as a whole. This includes how we view safety outside of our schools too. Last year, black and brown community members who historically have been brutalized by and who have lost loved ones at the hands of police demanded that the city divest $1 billion from the NYPD's $6 billion budget, and that didn't happen. Instead, a proposed budget for fiscal year 2022 calls for an increase in the NYPD's budget. This is definitely a step in the wrong direction. Our students and community members need to center uh, their experiences, voices, and demands. Minneapolis, Portland, Milwaukee, Los Angeles, Denver, and many places around the country have listened to young people and community members that understand safety starts by meeting our needs and ending approaches that are not policing young people. For the future of young people, it's time for New York City to do the same. And the last thing I'll say is I've been testifying every year for the last 15, 16 years about the same things. And it would just be monumental to have the council and the city listen to young people and finally, you know, remove police from schools and listen to their demands. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We will now have Meryl Mosum testify. Time starts now. My name is Meryl Mosum, a high school student and a member of Teens Take Charge and Dignity in Schools. As a young person, I reject the mayor's plan to add 475 more school police for intro 2211. The pandemic has brought pain, feelings of loneliness and mental health struggles, especially of the children of essential workers like myself. My mom works at a hospital. She comes home at 6, 6 p.m. My dad is a taxi driver and he comes home at 10 p.m. And I'm sure that this is a common feeling among adults as well. But why has the response to the pandemic been for, youth, for the youth to add more police to schools? more police officers during a time where it took months for my school provided tablets to come more police officers when there are already more police than guidance counselors and social workers in schools combined the price of this plan is to hire 475 more school police is 20 million that is 20 million not going into funding ethnic studies not funding restorative justice not funding our futures Instead, it only serves to uphold white supremacy, a cruel reality of policing black and brown youth. Women of color are only overrepresented in the most punitive position in a school building. That's because the city fails to fund programs to hire teachers that look like me. City Council, you can say that you care about youth. But I urge you to show that you care through your dollars. Fund our future. Fund a future, one with police-free schools led by healing and care instead of racism and hate. Thank you. Meryl, I just wanna thank you. I know that your parents must be very proud of you for being here and testifying in this forum. It is a powerful forum and what you have just said and what you have just done is very powerful. Just know also that the city council will continue to invest millions of dollars into youth, into programs, into summer jobs, and everything else that we're passionate about. I so appreciate your testimony. Keep fighting the good fight. 
Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your testimony, Merrill. At this time, I'd like to invite up Pat Keaton to testify. The time starts now. All right, Pat seems to have dropped off. Um, at this time, if your name has not been called and you still wish to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom uh, raise hand function. All right, seeing no hands, I will now turn it back to the Chair Adams for closing remarks. Matt, thank you very much. Um, this has been a very long day, but a very, very needed hearing. I don't regret a minute of it. I've enjoyed every minute of it, and I've listened to every minute of it from 9.30 this morning until 7.58 tonight. Um, all, of, all of the testimony was great and powerful today. Um, if there are no further uh, members um, of our community wishing to testify tonight. I just want to thank all of the members of the public, those of you that have hung out with us all day. Thank you for hanging out. Um, I want to thank my colleagues, members of the NYPD, members of the administration, CCRB. Oh, we do have one witness. Pat Keaton has arrived. Let's go back to Pat before my closing remarks. Pat? Can you hear me? Yes, your time starts now. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, I was, all right, I'm a resident of New York City who's lived here for 44 years. My children attended New York City schools and I have a grandson in public school. My testimony addresses the question of how do we keep students and schools safe? For the past 30 years, the idea has been pounded into our heads that schools are dangerous places for children and that to keep them safe. We need to have police officers and metal detectors in the schools. I'm here to argue the opposite, that the main effect of cops and metal detectors has been to criminalize youth, especially black and brown youth. What keeps students safe in their schools is not cops, metal detectors and surveillance, but having teachers, counselors, staff and parents surrounding them and building trust with them. Uh, what we need to keep our children and communities safe is to build a mass anti-racist multiracial movement that has the power to demand that the removal of police and metal detectors from our schools be carried out. Such pressure has led school districts in Minneapolis, Seattle, Portland, promised to remove officers and that other cities are also considering this. COVID has laid things bare here. It's given us all a collective global citywide course in equities. Funds need to go to schools and not to metal detectors to schools and not $21 million for testing for students to get in seven schools. Funds need to go to schools and not resource officers. Um, when we look at that data, there is no other side. Today, we have 700,000 students doing remote learning. Some don't have iPads a year into the pandemic. What has happened during COVID couldn't make it clear that the disproportionate impact of this and the inequality that exists in our school system. The New York school system and budget reflects the inequality that has existed in the United States since its founding. When young people are surrounded by people who have them as their key interests, they will be able to learn and flourish. That action and uniting with parents is necessary and essential for school safety and national safety. We don't, can't continue to criminalize kids and that's what our school safety officers and metal detectors do. This is a hearing on public safety. So the first step is to take hundreds of millions of dollars spent on school safety in the form of police, including ICE officers, and spend it on the needs of people. ICE should not be allowed to enter our public schools by any means. The city needs to end the policy of handcuffing and restraining and emotional stress, the escalation techniques used instead of EMS and police. 
school safety means that the removal of metal detectors, invasive security, and forms of surveillance. It means redirecting funds to truly trained, competent, trauma-trained mentally health support staff, health educators, social workers, psychiatrists, community outreach coordinators invested to get at the root cause. The city council members are tasked with creating and implementing a simple city budget. And I'm appalled that New York City spends 11 billion on policing more than any other city in the country, practically more than any other country in the world. All funds allocated toward cops or school safety officers and metal detectors should be cut and reallocated. The current system is not a justice system, but an injustice system. Um, Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your testimony. Unless there are questions from council members, I will turn it back over to the chair. Thank you very much, Matt, uh, Matt and uh, Pat. Thank you for your testimony. We're very glad that we got to hear it. Thank you so much. Okay, I guess this is going to be a wrap. So um, again, I just wanna thank members of the, my colleagues, members of the NYPD, members of the administration, CCRB, uh, Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, Legal Aid. Um, I'd also like to especially thank Committee Council, Daniel Addis, Matt Thompson, City Council staff, Kelly Taylor, Indiana Porter, Ebony Meeks, Finance staff, Regina Ryan, Isha Wright, Nevin Singh, Monty People. Uh, it is my honor to chair this great committee. This meeting is hereby adjourned. Right.